All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is a workshop, a budget workshop, of the Board of County Commissioners of Manatee County, and it is an absolutely beautiful day today in Manatee County. If you love cloud cover and humidity, today is your day. It is, June, it is Monday, June 12th, 2023. We have all of our constitutional officers here today, and uh, let's get started. We're going to begin by honoring God and by honoring this great nation. Reverend Nicholas Lee of Harvest United Methodist Church is here to deliver the invocation, after which Sheriff Rick Wells will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. If you're able at this time, please stand. Good morning. Uh, as I know the work you're about to do is so important, let's take a moment just to be silent to center ourselves and then I'll pray. God, creator, these uh, who have come today to do the work of the people have a task before them that is important to all who call uh, this county home. And so we pray this morning that you would be honored in the work done in this place, that you would remind us and center us on the reason why we're here, which is to take care of the people who have moved into Manatee County, who call this place home, who work and play and are raising children and families in this place. God, would you give our commissioners, those who are here to do this work, your grace, your insight for what needs to be done in order to help Manatee County be the best county it possibly can be. And we thank you that you've even given us the privilege to live in such a great country that we have the freedom, in fact, to do this work in public and open so that everyone can see what we do. We give you thanks and praise for the privilege to be in this room today to do the work of the people. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, all, man, the pledge I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you for all that you do for our community, the both of you. Okay, let's turn things over to our CFO, ma'am. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, uh, County Administrator, um, County Attorney. Um, today, our work session is about the presentation of the Constitutional Officers uh, Budgets Fiscal Year 24 and the Judicial Programs as well. Um, the judicial programs in combination with the constitutional officers represent uh, $226 million roughly of the total budget, uh, like around 10%. Um, with further ado, um, I'm going to present in the order that, um, that we had scheduled uh, the Supervisor of Elections, uh, Mr. Mike Bennett, if you can please come forward. Good morning. Well, things are looking about the same. We're not expecting anything. We uh, had met with Mr. Washington earlier. He kind of went over the budget. It appears we'll be about on the same burn rate as we were last year, about 260000 a month. So we really don't see any major changes. We're watching our budget as we continue to go along. And that's really where we're at. We've had some things this year that we could not control. Uh, this year we have a, or next year we have a third election because of the presidential preference primary. So again, you have to budget another three or 400,000 to run that election. Uh, we've got that, you've got the postage has gone up again. Uh, paper is still in demand. We're having a difficult time getting good prices on paper. Uh, we got to replace some iPads and a vehicle this year. And we have that in the budget. Uh, we feel fairly comfortable about that, but uh, that's where we're at. I'll take any questions. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we just spoke a minute ago. I noticed, uh, and I know everyone works on their budgets independently, but every other department we've seen, both within the county and within constitutional officers, had 5% salary 
increases just due to inflation and trial. So, you know, I, I would like to propose that just to keep everybody within the county on, on even keel and everyone getting the same benefits and relief from from inflation and so forth, that we increase that salary compensation of five percent, but it's your staff. So well I wouldn't they moved me ahead of the sheriff this morning. I didn't know I was gonna have this much flexibility because he's gonna spend all the money. But anyhow <laughs> sorry, Rick, I had to take that shot. But no, I really appreciate that. The four percent that we put in, we've basically based upon in the past because the county pretty much controls that raise across the board and then we match the county. And in the past, 4% seemed to be the original number. Uh, and then you guys adjusted as we go on. Believe me, my staff will fully appreciate the 5% number and we will change our budget to reflect that. All right, thank you. Yeah, I'd support a 5% I appreciate keep everyone that. level. All right, is there anyone else for the supervisor of elections? All right, well done, sir. You got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll go back to Sheila McLean, our CFO. For a point of, uh, of comment on the supervisor of elections, that 5% was offered to them, and he said he would bring forward the adjustment um, for us to amend. I just didn't feel it was significant enough to make the change right now, but I said I will amend it later with because it's such a significant, insignificant amount. Okay, thank you. Now we have the uh, Manatee County Sheriff's Office. Um, at his total budget uh, recommendation is $190 million. And with, without further ado, uh, Mr. Wells, can you come forward? Commissioner Cruz, if you just want to go ahead and make a motion right now to approve my entire budget, I'd like you like you helped out, Mike Bennett. This is a non-voting workshop. Oh, is sir. it really, Kyle? Okay. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say quickly that uh, I, uh, even though we may have some uh, different philosophies, uh, Sheila and I, uh, as far as my budget compared to what she is submitting, I want you to know that this has been. Uh, a, a, an incredible experience that we've had as we tried to work on these numbers, our county administrator. Um, it's, it's, this has not been a struggle. This has been strictly uh, me wanting to give you what I believe is needed for me to do the job that uh, I need to do in the county and, and them protecting the county and, and doing what she believes needs to be done as far as the budget goes. So I, I just want you to know that, that we have a great working relationship and I appreciate them and the staff. So in saying that, we have submitted a budget of uh, $199 million, which includes uh, a $4.1 million increase for FRS, which we have absolutely no control over, as you know, but that has been included uh, in this budget. The, uh, some of the discrepancies that we have is, really comes down to what I think is very important when it comes to starting pay. Starting pay... Um, for the Manatee County Sheriff's Office at this point is a little over $55,000. As you know, last year the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office was approved um, to increase their starting pay to just over $64,000 a year, uh, and the Sarasota Police Department uh, now is roughly right at $67,000 a year. This has had and will continue to have a significant increase in the amount of people that we lose uh, that will transfer over to these agencies because of the pay, especially the, the one to two to three to four year deputies that will go where the grass is greener. So this is why I believe it's critical, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, I increase my starting pay to $65,000 a year to, to maintain a competitive um, workforce and, and to be able to compete with these you know, back in the day, we, we tried to compete with Tampa PD, St. Pete, Pinellas County SO, Hillsborough County SO, and uh, it was all, always difficult to do so. They have more revenue, obviously. They could, they could raise those salaries. Uh, but really right now, I just need to compete with my, my two sister agencies, my partners that are just to the south of me. That's what we have to focus on. Um, it's easy for a deputy to say, today I work for you, Sheriff. 
next week I'm going to I'm going to work for uh, Double SO. I still take my car home. I don't lose anything. I gain about nine thousand. So that is that is the concerns that I have as I bring this budget forward. Um, one of the other um, points that uh, Sheila and I have discussed is I'm I'm asking for for ten law enforcement deputy positions. They want to reduce that to five. <clears throat> Let me be as clear as I can. I don't have to explain to any of you the, the, the issues we're having with population, the growth that we're having in this county. You know, it's really my belief that every time that a, a new development is, is brought before you, you should automatically assume that's going to be at least two deputies for, for every development. I mean, we are sitting at about 1.68 per 1,000. The average is about 2.68 deputies per 1,000. So we are already about 313 deputies short in this county, and, and that's because of population. And that is because of the increase that we continue to have in population. So we're just trying to maintain. We lose an average of 47 to 50 uh, law enforcement officers every year in Manatee County uh, through attrition, retirements, uh, terminations, resignations, you, know, you name it. So w- we have two academies every year that I sponsor, The most we could put in those academies is is 20 per class. It's about six months for the academy class to to graduate. So 40 40 brand new deputies every year um, is about the most I can handle, not counting anything that we bring in from the outside that may transfer transfer from one agency to another. So uh, that's a huge deal for us as we try to maintain what we have. So Going back to the salaries, because we know we're going to lose X amount of deputies every year, I need to maintain what I have. I need to take care of the loyal deputies that are here now, that have that been uh, with the Manti County Sheriff's Office, that want to stay here, want to raise a family in Manti County, and do a great job. Look, in spite of the population, we're 1.9. We've seen a 1.9 decrease in crime right now. We're 42% down in crime since I took over uh, seven years ago. So they're doing a great job. <clears throat> Uh, uh, the other um, difference, difference that uh, Sheila and I have is when it comes to civilian pay. Um, I, I'll tell you, we're, we're trying to keep up with y'all. I lost an IT uh, person just a couple of uh, months ago that came over here, higher pay. Uh, ECC dispatchers that sit right next to, you know, your 911 dispatcher sitting next to my dispatchers. They just got about an 8% raise. Uh, we believe that our civilian staff is is extremely important to the job that we do dealing and helping helping the public each and every day they want a five percent uh increase in pay i really wanted more than that i really wanted 10 we've compromised on eight but that's where i stand i'm just trying to get up to where some of your positions are here in the county i'm just trying to maintain uh, a a good quality of life for them so they don't uh, want to come over here and, and see you more regularly. I want them to see me. I want them to stay where they're at. It's important that they continue to to uh, to know that I care about what uh, the, the job that they're doing. <clears throat> we are see, we're, we're going to see a huge increase in uh, in food when it comes to the jail. Uh, rising food costs. We're going to see about an increase of uh, three hundred eleven thousand dollars just in jail food. We know that we're going to see a, a fee and uh, increase in the maintenance agreements that we have, about 493000 A lot of that has to do with radios and licenses and uh, our vehicles. You know, we're, our fleet gets old. We've got to maintain the fleet. We, and we're going to ask for about, you know, we know we have about 152 deputy vehicles that uh, have over 100,000 miles. So we have, to, we have to think about, you know, in, providing new vehicles each and every year. Um, I do want to say this, that our... Our homeless outreach, our resource uh, team that we want to put together, you'll see on there. I have two deputies for that, five, um, and I have four RAP case managers. I believe that we can use that money, that COVID relief money, to fund these positions. Now, I don't know how much you guys have received in the, uh, not the COVID, but the, uh, um, the opioid settlement. The opioid. I don't know how much y'all have received. I don't know how much we're going to get next year. I don't know what those numbers look like. So I think we're 4.1 this year, 4.1 next year, and then it dwindles way down to 
one million nine hundred thousand type numbers for, yeah. for the next eighteen years, I believe. Would you like to address it, sir? Uh, well, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, it's very difficult to predict long term what that revenue will produce because it's basically settlement proceeds. Some of them are structured, um, but you're really dependent on the court system and those settlements to work out for those revenues to arrive. So I. I do have to caution you that if you're going to look at long-term recurring expenses, that may not be your best source of revenue to rely upon to do so. I don't want to represent that it's going to be revenue that goes on five, ten years. I don't know. Yeah, well, we know it's not reoccurring, but we yeah. do know it could it could help us maybe this year, next year. And I, I have no objection, sir. I have no objection to that, sir. Yeah. I just need to caution my client to recognize the the nature of the revenue source. We know it's not going to be reoccurring. We 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 don't know how long it's going to last. I'm just trying to cover, you know, maybe. Uh, the budget this year, maybe next year. Sorry, sir. I, I was just, I had heard something different, so. Okay. But all that's right. all right. We'll sort it out and we'll get no, back to no, you. No problem. So I'll say that this meets the criteria for, for those funds, if there's any issues with that. No, no one has done more to combat the opioid issue, which is, which became the heroin problem, which now becomes the fentanyl problem, the Manti County Sheriff's Office. And we will continue to, uh, to try to, uh, you know, combat the, those problems that people, are, people of addiction are having. A lot of them are homeless, as you know. We're, we see a lot of homeless people with addiction, which, and we know that you uh, are very aware of what we're trying to do with the old D2 office, if that becomes available, and how we want to ho help the homeless. So we just believe that this would give us the the funding for at least two years to to move forward with the plans we all have together to try to help the homeless i'm going to open up any questions so i'm, I'm on the board uh and then commissioner bearden um how many total deputies do you have now sir law enforcement yes sir law enforcement we have approximately that work the road about 527 579. There Five, you go. 579. But you have to understand that we all that covers courthouse, right? Bailiffs as well. That covers sure. All of that, right? Okay. Not just patrol. And what is your target? Where do you want to be right now? Give me 300. An 300 additional 300. I mean, I'm just asking for 10 this year. Okay, 10. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to give me 300. All right. Hillsborough and Pinellas. We went over uh, um, Sarasota is at 65. What are Hillsborough and Pinellas starting pay? I think right they're in that now, same neighborhood, I without believe. Any, without any type of increase this year, Hillsborough County, their, their salary is 63017 Their salary net is 62582 That's And so Sarasota, their starting salary is, is 67764 Their salary net is 7661 And that's without any understanding of what their raise will be this year. Sure, sure, without a raise this year. Okay. And then my last comment is probably more for, well, for you and for Mr. Washington. Mr. Washington and I had briefly discussed how, with the mayor that the city of Bradenton and Manatee County at times are, we're in this cycle of competing, right, with like public works or utilities. We raise pay, they raise pay. We raise pay, they raise pay. And, it's, and we have a lot of different areas where we overlap. And there's a company called Evergreen that the city of Bradenton had hired to, uh, I believe it was Evergreen, to um, essentially set their pay scale. And so I talked to Mr. Washington that we should also look at Evergreen and have them work our pay skills together. We so did that, that last year. To get ourselves out of this cycle, right? And right. if we're going to do that with the city of Bradenton, if that's the direction that the administrator goes, I think the constitutional officers should be included in that as well for the same, for the same reason. I mean, it doesn't do us any good to be, as, don't get me wrong, I'm sure we got a good IT guy and I'm, I'm glad that we're a woman and I'm glad that we did. Um, but it doesn't net help the county for us to be stealing employees from each other, uh, nor does it help us to be stealing them from the city or vice versa. Um, so that's that's something I think we should consider is hiring Evergreen to sort of across the board constitutional cities, get us all on the same page. And yeah, Palmetto, the islands, yeah, the Palmetto, the island cities as well. So uh, Commissioner Bearden. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, Sheriff, I just, I just have a few questions. So you say we're losing. 47 to 50 deputies a year. Out of those deputies, how many of those are, would you say, are going to, let's just say, Sarasota, Pinellas County, one of the other 
uh, municipalities? Yeah, I would, I would say roughly 25% uh, of that is basically salary driven. Okay. So we're looking at about 12 <laughs> to 15 deputies that are going to other places based on salary. Yeah, and then the others leave to go to other agencies that may be um, out of state. Got because it. of salary. Got it. Um, that being said, how much is it costing us to, let's just say, train a new deputy um, from start to finish? It's about 148000 start to finish. So you'd say that we're losing probably around $2.2 million a year just on new deputies going and moving to, say, getting more pay. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, all right, let me see here. So 2.2 gets it down to about 6 million. All right. Um, so 100, you're saying it's costing us 100, 140, over 140,000. Yes, sir. All right. And let's just say we were able to fund this budget that you wanted to fund. Do you believe that, based on retention purposes, that we would be able to retain more deputies because of the salary increases? I, I, I do, and I, I do. We, we have seen these younger deputies waiting to see already what this budget's going to entail uh, before they make a decision on where. Uh, they want to go to, if they want to apply at Sarasota SO, Sarasota PD, or Tampa, Hillsborough County. So I believe this will give them um, at least more to think about, Commissioner. Okay. So 47 to 50 deputies we lose a year. And I, what is that? You know, a lot of that, you know, that's, that's termination. Correct. Those that resign for other reasons, maybe some that resign because, but in lieu of termination, uh, some that go into a different field, right, that don't want to be in law enforcement. So that's just the average. Got it. What would be your strategy to cut down, let's just say, to cut those numbers down? Do you have a strategy that maybe other than salary that, that we might be able to retain some more deputies, so we that work we're not on losing this every day. A lot of it, a lot of it comes, it comes down to uh, mental health, mm -hmm. helping these younger deputies through um, a very trying profession, mm -hmm. uh, making them understand and giving them the tools that they need to, to to really stick out and stick. Look, they they see the worst this community has to offer. Uh, and I, I think they see more than even I did 40 years ago daily when it comes to uh, overdoses, and natural deaths, you know, natural causes. So it's really been something that we have focused on here in the last few years is taking care of their, their mental health. I do believe that will help, uh, you know, get them through the rough times and, and keep them interested in continuing to do this job of law enforcement. The younger generation is just, you know, they haven't had the life experience that so many of us in this room have had. And, and sometimes it takes a little bit more to get them through um, the difficult times in, in this profession. Completely understand. And what made you come up with the number 10 and not 20 or 15? I mean, what was there some type of um, reason why you, you decided on 10 new deputies? Was it based off of the analytics that you were... Uh, extracting from whatever platform that you might it's, be it's having? It's that, and, and it's also it's, it's financially what, what the county can handle. As I, as I put this, you know, this budget together, I know I need to focus on the starting pay to retain what we have. You know, and it's, 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 it's not coming in here trying to ask for too much. It's trying to come in here and ask for a need. I know I can handle the 10. I can get them through the process. I can get them trained and get them on the road. Got it. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, was there anyone else on the board for the sheriff? Okay. Yeah, Thank, uh, Commissioner Baugh. Just a, a quick question to add to the conversation. Um, sheriff, I know that you, you've talked about mental health, and we understand that. I mean, you know, 
your department sees the worst of the worst every single day when they're on the road. Um, if anybody has ever ridden, any commissioner has ridden with the sheriff's office or EMS, you're aware of what does go on. So that is a good point as far as mental health, but you didn't mention affordable housing, and I was sitting here thinking about you know, the fact that we're trying to compete with other areas, and some of those other areas have uh, some decent affordable housing. I mean, I know our deputies, uh, and not just the deputies, but employees, civilian employees, are having a hard time finding housing. How Do you, by any chance, have any information on, on how that is being affected in, in keeping um, our deputies and civilian employees? It's been difficult, and I don't know what the numbers look like right now as far as some of the surrounding counties, but I could tell you just a couple of years ago that a lot of my deputies uh, bought homes or rented homes in Hillsborough County because yeah. it was cheaper, that's right? So, that, so they couldn't stay in Manatee County, uh, and we allowed them to, to drive their vehicles um, to Hillsborough County to save them that cost as well. But So, yeah, that has... That, that, that has a significant impact on on a, on a new LEO coming to this county and, and the affordable housing. But as long as we make the other counties available to them, uh, you know, it, it's worked. Yeah. Unfortunately, we've had to do that. And, and I'm looking at Hillsborough on the, on the chart that you sent us, and Hillsborough is starting out a little over 60. So I can see where, where you're coming from. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. And Commissioner Bearden had one more comment. Uh, another quick question, uh, Sheriff. Um, mm -hmm. Do you guys do any type of analysis based on how much crime is costing the county? Like if we have to lock somebody up or, you know, we have to go see, like, is there any type of analysis where we can draw off of that knowing that if we are able to give you, fund you the 10 to, and be able to drop our crime rate, would that be... Um, something that we might be able to save money. Yeah, we can definitely on. give you those numbers. Look, I mean, you know, X amount of dollars per per inmate. Anytime yeah. someone goes into the Manatee County Jail, we very we work very hard on trying to uh, take care of their needs inside the jail. Recovery has been huge for us. The recovery pods and trying to help those that are are addicted. So, and then working with the public defenders. So, you know, those that have minor crimes, we want we want them to. To be able to bond out to get out and but yeah there is a cost analysis there there is there's obviously a cost savings every time the um the number of inmates in the jail is lower uh than you know the capacity so we, we look at those daily okay yeah all right I'd, I'd like to possibly see some of those numbers to you know see what what it is costing us if, if let's just say we're able to lower crime five percent how much money are we saving based on those numbers Certainly. And maybe we can sit down and have a conversation about that. Thank you, Sheriff. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sheriff Wells. We appreciate you coming in. As always, we, we appreciate and respect everything you and, and your men and women are doing for this county. And we really appreciate your emphasis on the homeless situation as well. This this uh, board has sort of focused in on that as of recent as well. So all right. thank I mean, you all very thank much. Thank you, sir. Madam CFO, I believe we have the clerk next. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Following, we have the clerk of the circuit court uh, with a total recommended budget of $9.4 million, an increase of 4% uh, from last year. <laughs> and with you, Angel Coloniso, clerk of the court. Good morning, commissioners. Our base budget request is $9,077,730. <clears throat> and we are asking above the base $376,208. Those are two auditors, two accounts payable clerks, and frankly, um, I'd be willing to do one each, and I can explain briefly why that would be. That would result in a $188,000 increase. The population growth has been exponential, and the county budget has doubled in eight years, and even one position would help. We have um, just the, um, the, we deal with so many different transactions that happen in the county, 
and just the PCARD transactions alone have gone up approximately by $1 million each year. We're on track to meet or exceed $8 million this year, and that's just with that type of a transaction. We're topping nearly 100,000 invoices processed per year. Some invoices are 1,000 pages long, and we must go through them all line by line. The AP clerks make, make sure that the payables are supported by the proper documentation, and many transactions require follow-up, which is to be expected whenever you have such a high volume. So that's a little bit account, about accounts payable. We have 12, and we used to have 14 in that department. I believe when the downturn of the economy came, we never recovered two positions back. And audit positions as to the one, one of our constitutional duties is the audit function. And just to give you, many of you are new, and to give you an example of the audits, the internal control audits that are necessary for the evaluation of operations, and this is to help with management um, efficiencies and processes. These can be all found on uh, on our report page, but if you'd like to see them, I think it's helpful for new commissioners. If you want to flip to a particular department and read the scope and processes, fleet services, I'm just going to read off some of these audits because you might not be familiar with them. Fleet services, franchise agreements, sales tax, employee vendor match, regular audits of cash funds, civic center inventory, CVB accountability audit, code enforcement division audit, community services, including the prescription program, indigent burial program, we care program, conservation lands management division, county travel audit, duplicate vendor payments, EHB division, transit solid waste, waste year, wastewater division, landfill scale house operations audit, landfill cash audit, port authority, and all the items that come under that. These are just to name a few and these I pulled from the past to give you an idea of, of what all that, that the audit department does. We audit to Florida statutes, federal regulations, ordinances, resolutions, and contracts where applicable. We also then go back and do a follow-up audit according to the management action plan. And these are the things that we'd like to continue as we have in the past. But we've been hit the last few years with an unprecedented amount of what's classified as complaints, and it's actually just under 200. In the past, these were few and far between. Under the standards that we must follow, we have to follow up on every single one. Not everything rises to the level of, of anything. So we have to at least look and say, no, this doesn't go with us. It goes here. It goes there. This this goes to another state agency, um, as you can imagine. So they, they are required because we are peer-reviewed um, on that. So they are required to go through and assess each one of those before any action is taken, if any. And with the numerous reorgs and turnover in staff, it's necessary to look at internal controls to ensure the proper internal controls are in place in accordance with the laws um, that I stated previously. We're currently at 5.5 um, which is FTEs, uh, five full-time positions, one part-time. This is the same staffing level since 2009, and the county's net budget has increased by about 97% since that time. Hi higher volume of operations with a higher population to serve. This also provides, they provide consulting services for the end of year audit to assist with externals. In the last five years, our internal audit function has saved the county over a quarter of a million dollars. So that's briefly um, why I'm asking for those. Now I'll say one each, because I know that, that two each was not approved, but I'd, I'd ask for one each to help with that load, with the increases, the population and everything. Um, the same issues that the sheriff had just said, except you ha you're providing more services and more expenditures. So that requires the staff to process those, and it's not one and done. Like I said, some of those are about a 1,000 pages long um, and going through line items. But thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the clerk? I do. Commissioner Baugh. Angel, thank you for being with us this morning. I wanted to make sure that I understood. You gave us an awful lot of information. Yes. Then, okay. So when did you, did I understand you correctly? When did you say that your budget had actually increased and you increased positions? Did you give us any of that information? Did I say increase? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I must have misspoke, misspoken. Um, we have 12, in accounts payable, for example, we have 12, um, 12 positions. We had 14, I, and two, I believe, were lost during the downturn. 
of the economy as in audits. They lost an audit as well, but any at 2009, we're at the 2009 level of our five and a half audit members. That's what I, okay, that's yes. what I, I didn't catch all of that, I'm sorry. Okay. You, it was a lot right. of information. And these those audits I rattled off are also that management can be assured that the internal um, control process and everything is in Place. And if you wanted to see examples, they are there for if you wanted to look at them. Um, and, and my other question is that, you know, I think we've probably all heard that, um, you know, you're short staffed just like the county has been at times and so forth. How many people are you short right now in your in your staff? We are short. Actually, we just came up to where we could be in accounts payable was 12. At one point, we had four in accounts payable With when there was such a downturn and it was hard to get help um, because we, too, are competing with local constitutional officers. And it's. I think we're probably the lowest starting salary of anybody in this town. That so. was my next question. Mm-hmm. Can you give us some insight on that? Insight, I can tell you we're at $15 an hour starting, for example, the property appraiser and tax collector around 19. Um, Also with the county, the starting pay, the increases go um, at a faster pace than we we are able to give. Um, I I know that you had asked last year for, I think it was, as I recall, two inspector general positions. Correct. Did you ask for two account payable positions last year as well? Uh, we asked for a, a, comp, a um, contract, I want to say analyst. What, Kim, do you recall the name of that? Um, fiscal compliance officer, which we are putting into work now, but this is not someone who would actually sit down and go through the payment cues that come in. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, that that's good. Thank you, Angel. Thank and you. we appreciate that because the business analyst, we did ask for an, a business analyst last year too, an, an extra business analyst because the workload dictated that. So that we've implemented that and we appreciate that as well. Yeah, and I, I think it should be noted and I think it's safe to say that this <clears throat> board, you know, how many, out of curiosity, how many employees do you have total? Total with courts? Yeah. It's, a, it's a hovering around 240, 245. Okay. All right, so... Uh, you know, we need to make sure there's 245 employees over there that come under us as far as budget goes. And so... Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. The 245 don't completely come under the county budget. That's the court side of the house, and those are due process oh, costs, oh, so oh, that's all on the state that. side. Okay, forget that. No, yeah, just, just with you, the clerk's office, not the courts. How right. Many? How many positions? Oh, uh, just under 100. Okay. Well... Even so, it's 100 employees that, you know, we need to make sure that they're taken care of. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the clerk? Commissioner Satcher and then Commissioner Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So you mentioned um, complaints. You said it had gone up to, I think you said 200? Almost, just under. So what was the baseline for that? They were so few and far between. We maybe got a couple a year that they weren't tracked because there were one or two a year. But what that department has to do, they track and account for every hour. They have to account for every hour, and they account that. So that was so de minimis, it wasn't. But it got to be such a a cumbersome task that we've tracked them for the last few years. So it, it goes 70, I think there was, and I might get the order wrong, but it would be like 50, over 50, then 70. And I think right now, just this year alone, we're up to 73 or something. But again, they don't all, even though they don't all amount to um, further action on our part, it's still they have to sit down and show that they addressed it. It goes here, it goes there. So they have to still put in legwork on the front a little bit, intake, if you will. Okay. And then... And do you feel like you're, and, and this maybe this isn't a budgetary, it is a budgetary question because if people are wasting uh, your budget and your time, I mean, that affects all of us. Um, do you think we have the right, obviously you mentioned some of them, but I mean processes to sort through those quickly? Because if we went from a de minimis, as you said, almost zero to 200, I wonder if this is just, I mean, you know, when a, 
when a, somebody in the HOA gets carried away and just makes a million reports on, on you know, one little piece of brown grass that's barely over somebody's driveway kind of a thing, is there a way that we have to clear those um, minor complaints through or, or am I off Those are pretty that? easy to deal with because those are things that they can refer to the proper departments or something like that. If it's code, and for, for code enhancement related, um, they, you know, sometimes we get... <laughs> For example, here's an example of one that we might have had a, a complaint about an employee like anybody would get if they had a bad experience. Well, we don't do that. That's that's unless it's one of ours, um, obviously. But if it's a county employee, that's not the proper place for that type of a complaint. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. No other questions. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, I would just take a look. I know you have a very broad. Department. I mean, everything from museums to passports to inspector generals, uh, the $15 an hour. You know, if you start there, I mean, maybe there's people that, that should start there, but it, it sounds like you're pretty low. Uh, if you're filling up all your staff positions, then then fine. But if you're not, I mean, that's something we should definitely take a look at because, you know, at the end of the day, you have a very forward-facing constitutional officer position. Uh, a lot of people need you and a lot of the services you provide. So making sure we have the proper people who are well-trained, who are there long-term because they're getting compensated accordingly is a net benefit to the taxpayers themselves. It's not a lot of behind. I know when people think of clerk, the clerk of the court, they're thinking auditing the port, but they're not thinking about going to get their passport and going out and, you know, and, and seeing our minutes in a timely fashion and, and things that are important to the citizens that, that they get benefit from. So I would definitely take a look at that. Um, that's kind of outside the scope of this conversation because this is a very summary related, but, but I mean, I would be supportive of making sure we're paying everyone properly. Uh, as for these positions, I guess this is part to Sheila. I mean, what do we, where do we stand in terms of this discussion? I know it's not a voting meeting, but you know, it sounds like these were positions that were requested last year and denied last year. Is that correct? Or did you request them and receive them last year? I requested two for the auditor spots for the purpose of the auditor and did not receive those. I did get everything else though. You did get everything? Yes. All right. And your request is one of each, is what you're saying, is satisfactory. I would be willing to do one more. of each, yes, to $188,000. I'd, I'd be fine with one of each, especially if you got shut out last year for two positions. Uh, but again, this isn't a voting meeting, so that's just my personal right. thing, is we have to make sure all of our departments are stepped up. I mean, we, we've seen 25,000 people move here in the past two years. I mean, th there's a growth, and that's going to transcend everything from our IT department to our clerk of the court to our sheriff, and we have to account for that because I don't want to get behind the ball like we do on a lot of other things, and all of a sudden we have to have a budget with eight account payable positions all at once and eight new people all coming on because we've spent five years not giving any additional staffing. That's not good for anybody. So we need to be continuously increasing all of these positions to account for this growth. And sometimes I would add the audit, for example, um, in organizations when you're there long enough or short enough, sometimes a, a bad habit gets carried on. Well, management will say, hey, can you come in? Management on the county side will say, can you take a look at our processes and procedures? Because we did provide that consulting aspect of it. So then they can find that breakdown. They have the software and tools to look down and see, well, maybe this, this was happening and now it's not. So it's a, a broader in-depth view with the tools to quickly and easily um, assess and give a summary to management as well and the county administrator and management for operations. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd be fine with one of each. I mean, I'd be fine with two of the accounts payable, honestly, because you didn't get one last year. But, I mean, if you're saying one of each is satisfactory, then I'm okay with that personally. I think it will help. It will help for now. Commissioner Ball. Yeah, I'm sorry, Angel. Um, is this something, Sheila, where we need two commissioners in order to, you know, are we still doing that on the constitutionals as well, or can just what Commissioner Cruz said yes, bring in? Yes, so you, you are exactly right. Um, this is called the pull process. If Stupid, you want to pull anyway. an, act, an item, um, a commissioner wants to pull an item, such as uh, Commissioner Cruz, then a friend or an, a friend commissioner will have to second it, and then we'll just take it with us, find the funding, make it balance, and then on July 28th we'll come back to you and um, 
with the opportunity. All right, so Commissioner Ball, I'll, I'll chime in to help you get this accomplished. So Commissioner Cruz, are you wanting to pull and approve or, or move to approve one of each of those two positions as <laughs> requested? And yes, by the and clerk? while we're on the topic, I don't know if anyone actually technically seconded relative to uh, the supervisor 5%. elections five percent either. Yeah. Just to make sure okay, we let's have go a clean one record. at a time, though. No, understood. Yes, I just want to yeah. say it well. when we've completed the clerk, we'll go back to the supervisor. Um, so. He's looking for a second, and I got Commissioner, the second. Commissioner that's why Ball I brought it up. That. I knew the procedure, but that's why I thought we had to be doing it now too. Sure. So thank you for that, Madam CFO. You're you're good there. Yes, sir. Okay. Order taken. All right. I don't have anyone else on the board for the clerk. I have one more oh, question. Commissioner Ball has one more question. Clerk. Angel, when you brought this forward, or maybe this is really more Sheila. Is there some reason why we didn't approve any new positions? Because I know it seems like on every other department we've looked at, we have pretty much. I mean, is there some reason that we didn't this one? Or we just did. No, I'm talking about when the recommended budget was presented to us in the first place. Um, I'm just curious. Funding, I don't know. I guess funding, um, we didn't have enough to work it through and all that once we got to the sheriff then uh, general fund was really struggling to make it all. Okay. So what we said is that, okay, uh, based on the recommendation, we know that the assessed values are coming up. So the opportunity will be that we'll, we'll put some of the items in a list so that when we say how much more we get, uh, then we can just realign the budget again. And the reason I'm asking that question isn't, because of anything negative on my part. It's because I have that much faith in you and your department that I knew there had to be a reason. So that's why I was just curious as to where we were on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, Madam Clerk, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Let's go back to uh, uh, Mike elections. Bennett's Supervisor of Elections. Uh, Salary increases. Commissioner Cruz propose, proposes going from four to five percent. He's looking for someone to second that. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Ron. I don't hear anybody objecting, so there you have it, Madam CFO. And you can bring us into our next constitutional officer. Oh, wait, Commissioner Satcher. Thank you. Okay, so since we're establishing some procedure here, um, then I'd like to bring back up the sheriff if we're, if we're making these decisions now. I thought we were kind of hearing everybody out and then yeah, we'll so talk later about what we wanted. Um, but of all hills to die on, I don't think uh, $3,500 um, for the deputies that are already costing us uh, well over 100000 to bring online, I don't feel like that is uh, where we need to make our stand. Um, and he's coming in, if I understood the numbers right, I believe he's still coming in under uh, Sarasota, not by much, um, which, you know, he kind of made his intent clear. It's just to keep people from um, leaving the job to go there. So, and not trying to start a bidding war with Sarasota, um, but just trying to stay within stalking distance seems like a good strategy. Uh, so I'd make the same motion to uh, fund the increase that the sheriff is asking for on his budget. As well as the 10? The 10 deputies? Yeah, for sure on the 10, yeah. Okay. Your Go ahead. I turned it off, thought I was turning it on. Uh, so your motion is for <laughs> the salary, the requested salary increase, yep. as well as the requested 10 deputies, and that's seconded by Commissioner, as a motion by Commissioner Satcher, seconded by Commissioner Bearden. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Are there any objections to that? So then my next que my question would be... You can't do an objection. Uh, I'm just asking. <laughs> you can object. You have free speech. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't mean it counts for anything, but you can object. Um, so, as, as we do these, Madam CFO, um, so my question is: What kind of a cushion are we dealing with as we continue to? I mean, we're, we're just committed. The first two were kind of small amounts of money, right? Um, but we just committed a big, a large amount of money. Um, and so, my question is: What kind of a cushion are we dealing with? And I had been, I received this budget on Friday and, and I had been sort of in my mind kicking it around that 
I was probably going to have to make a decision between a tax cut and fully funding the requested budget for the sheriff's office. Uh, but tell me what kind of cushion we're dealing with. Is, is that where, I, where I'm at here? Yes. So the, um, the general fund right now has in stabilization with the estimate that we got $2.9 million of stabilization. So un unless we get a higher valuation of assessed values that increases that dollar amount, we are um, a little bit um, stretched. However... The property appraiser always um, goes it goes a little bit conservative on his assessment of the estimate. So, I mean, we are sure there'll be some slight increase. At the at the um, also, I've got to say that I kind of like when we talked that when the commission when the sheriff talked about the opioid money funding it for the next two years. Okay. So I um, <laughs> sort of kind of like make the opportunity. I said the opportunity could be that we can fund those five. Raptor positions out of the opioid, free up money for those two years, free up money from the general fund. That's um, approximately half a million dollars, which is what he needs to fund those other five deputies to make the full 10. So I kind of like can put out there that opportunity uh, okay. for and it. We leave, you know, getting into the weeds, we kind of leave that to you. Um, per <laughs> okay. Personally, public safety, I, I think, is the fundamental purpose of this board. And, and this government. So if, if we have to make cuts, if we have to make cuts in other places, I'm I'm prepared to do that, and I I accept that. Um, yes, sir. That's just me. It sounds like it's Commissioner Ball as well, because either that or she's in her own world winning a bingo game. Um, <laughs> but uh, so then we have Cruz and Ball, and I think Bearden. No, nope, Cruz and Ball on the board. Yeah, I'd be careful with the opioid thing that he mentioned because those are not going to be recurring funds, and once you have an employee, you have an employee. So. Uh, let's make sure that's coming out of our actual general fund taxes. I mean, there's a lot of things we can do with yes, those sir. opioids. I mean, it's just like ARP. We we, we kind of yeah. think about like 500 times more than the actual money we're receiving. It's like, you know, there's, there's way more options for those opioid funds than we've got dollars to spend. Mm -hmm. um, but but I'm with the, the chair on this. I mean, the difference in the, in the salary, and I'm 100% okay with it. You're looking at seven, almost $8 million. I mean, that's basically... 0.1 mil right there, uh, just in the increase alone. So there, so this conversation isn't just about budgets. It's it's a future conversation about where our millage goes here because I'm okay fully funding it. I mean, I think I, I never want to be the, the lowest cost alternative as a county uh, and just drag us down to having no sheriff's department, no anything, no parks, no whatever, just because we can quote unquote have slightly lower taxes. So I'm perfectly okay with the request to do it, but people just need to be cognizant that dollars are dollars. They're, they're finite. So that's all. If I may, um, that deficient, that, um, difference of the $8.5 million of the shares that we couldn't fund, um, of course it's comprised of the um, increase to the 65 base salary of deputies, that's four and a half. Then we got the other five deputies, that's 521,000. But then the other one that he mentioned was bringing the civilian salaries from 5% to 8, which his original request was up to 18%. So you, are you wishing to um, uh, flag those three items? Commissioner Satcher, this is your, your item. Well, not really your item, but kind of. You brought it up. Uh, for now, my, my emphasis was on the deputies, so that's what I was zoning in on. I'll take a look at the other as well, but for now, I was looking on flagging deputies that are out there. Yeah, I understood lives. pay and, I mean, and the number I appreciate the ten, the civilians, too. I understand it's all a, a tough job, um, but that's who I was zoning. Base pay and the deputies. And the number the 10 additional deputies, that was what I understood Understood. And it sounds like what you've just reemphasized. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so we have Bearden and Baugh on the board. Uh, I apologize. I had it in the wrong order. Commissioner Baugh, don't kill me. It's Baugh and Bearden. Well, I think Commissioner Cruz hit it right on the money. You know, this isn't monopoly. This is real money, as we all uh, are educated enough to know. Um, so obviously, the board will not make a full decision on the budget and vote on the budget until September. Yes. And, you know, or July 1st, we will have the property appraiser coming in. And almost always, I think that our CFO is correct. Um, the property appraiser is always very conservative 
in the monies that he's showing. So in generally, there is more that we end up with. So I, I think that it's one of these things where we're getting into the guts of the budget now, and some decisions will have to be made. There are going to be some things that we feel we need to increase, and then there might be other things that we don't feel that we need to to cover and, and to do this year. Maybe we can wait until next year. And these are all things that we need to look at and make intelligent, educated decisions on. So I think it's right at this point. I was looking at the chart on the sheriff's office especially. And the one thing that we have to make sure that we do here in Manatee County is keep our citizens safe, right. as safe as we can. I mean, that is the most important uh, issue. The second is infrastructure at this point. And by the way, when I say safety, I'm talking about homelessness as well. So um, I think we're on the right track. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Commissioner Bearden. No, I just agree with Commissioner Ball. I mean, we are growing 12,000 people a year. And uh, as we grow, crime begins to increase. So being able to cut that down, you know, I, I think is important, which and and at the end of the day, um, ends up costing us less money. What are so, you, what are you I think he meant that he agrees with you. Did you mean to say you disagree? Did you mean to say disagree? That's what I thought. Okay. I said I agree. For the record, I said I agree. It, it came out as disagree, and we're all looking at each other like, wait, he's agreeing with everything. Okay. I mean, she was she was putting her gloves on over there. Um, okay, so anything further with the sheriff's budget before we move on? All right, ma'am. Chairman, can I please just to confirm, uh, sure. Commissioner Satcher was the uh, the the first commissioner to pull the Correct. sheriffs, and then the second followed by second by Bearden. Bearden. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, so we got uh, moving forward. We got the property appraiser and the tax collector will not be present today. So with that, we conclude with the constitutional officers, and then we move on to the judicial programs. Uh, with us today, we have um, now a court administration following. They have a total budget of <clears throat> their requested budget was one point six million dollars. And the recommendation was $1.6 million. And I have with, I have with us the um, Kimberly Miller and um, uh, Jacqueline Sotomayor to present the budget. Um, they have a small um, slide presentation as well. Oh, and sorry, I have also the uh, chief judge, Mr. Um, Charles Roberts. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Kim Miller, and I'm the trial court administrator here in the 12th Circuit. Uh, Chief Judge Charles Roberts is with me. Our circuit has 32 full-time judges. 14 of them are based here in Manatee. In addition to the 14 judges, we have approximately 60 court staff here as well. I think most of you know this, but our circuit encompasses three counties. DeSoto and Sarasota, as well as Manatee, and we hold court in five different locations. As Sheila indicated, uh, with our budget, uh, the recommendation was that you fund everything that we had requested. We only have eight county funded employees. They're in five different account keys. Um, our only additional funding requests this year were approved. The first was to fully fund drug court, and we can't thank you enough for that. The second, um, invite, uh, the second large item involves courtroom upgrades, and these were non-recurring costs. I'm going to go through each account key very quickly just to give you some updates and tell you some of the good things that we're doing over at the courts. The court admin account uh, funds our, guardian, our guardianship monitor. The guardianship monitor was funded back in 2019. This person makes home visits to wards in our guardianship cases. She's a master's level employee. She has a tremendous impact on the wards. The judge relies heavily on her recommendations. 
The next account key is Citizen Dispute. We have one person that runs this program. She handles a large volume of all of our county court cases, small claims, county court, even citizen disputes. These are lawsuits that, sorry, these are disputes before lawsuits are even filed. She schedules all of these for mediations. She's a certified mediator. She uses other volunteer mediators and even some court employees who are mediators to resolve these cases. And I've got the numbers up on the screen so you can see the number of cases that get resolved. Next is court technology. We only have two IT staff. We support approximately 75 judges and court staff in the Judicial Center. There's some stats up on the screen about the projects that we've done. We're in the process of updating the audio and visual in all of our courtrooms. Doing this, we learned that we need to update switches. We need to update fiber runs. Everything there is analog, and it needs to be converted to digital. The cost went up from $60,000 a year to $210,000. This is a five-year project, and we'll be using non-recurring funds to do that. And lastly is drug court and drug court counseling. Last month, you recognized National Drug Court Month. We had a proclamation. You heard from some of our drug court clients. You know that this program changes lives. Drug court has relied on grants for so long, the county had historic, historically put funds in reserve. To cover any grant shortfalls, this year you agreed to fully fund it, which allowed the Public Safety Coordinating Council to allocate those grant funds to other public safety projects, so thank you. We've been asking this for so many years now, I'm going to have to come up with something new to ask for. Judge Roberts, uh, our chief judge, currently presides over drug court, and he's just going to say a few words to you just about the success of the program from his perspective. But on behalf of everybody across the street, thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, echoing what uh, Ms. Miller just said, uh, thank you so much for funding the drug court as you've done. Uh, it has made a huge difference uh, to the lives of so many people in need. Um, in addition to being the chief judge, I also preside over drug court. Uh, I'm up here once a week to handle the drug court uh, docket. Uh, we have one day a week, one day a month uh, dedicated to the veterans court program associated with the drug court program, and it has made a huge difference. Uh, I found uh, participating in the diversionary court programs, especially the drug court program, uh, to have been a very fulfilling part of my career, and um, I, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for everything you've done to the program. Um, one um, uh, final note, uh, after approximately 42 years in the court system, I'm, I'm going to be retiring at the end of the month. Um, the uh, new chief judge is going to be uh, Judge Diana Moreland. Uh, judge Lon Aaron is going to be taking over the drug court program. He was my predecessor in drug court, uh, did an excellent job, so all the clients in that uh, court will be in very good hands with him. Uh, but, but again, I want to uh, thank all of you for everything you've done for not only drug court, but for the uh, judiciary in Manatee County. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Ballard is on the board, ma'am. So I'm really glad to see that the that these requests uh, were recommended for, for full funding. Um, the, We've all spoken at length about drug court, and I'm, I'm really, really glad that uh, we're recommending funding it fully. But the other thing that I want to mention is mediation. Um, so when I was in practice, I participated in dozens and dozens of successful mediations um, through, through the Manatee County program. And uh, I will say that it takes such a burden off the court system when these mediations work out, when they're successful. So... Um, that, that salary increase is, is very, very well deserved. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Baugh. Judge, kind of hate to see you retire, but congratulations. <clears throat> and I'm not sure if I have the right department. I think I do. But there was a position that was only a few years old where it was a, a senior citizen advocate, and uh, we only had the, we financed or funded, I think, one position, if, if I recall. That's the guardianship monitor that I talked about <coughs> with, the, with the wards, that visits the wards at homes, yes. Okay, so that is still in place. And yes, ma'am. Moving forward and thriving, I hope. Yes, that yes. That was dear she's, to my she's heart. Got 100, I think the number said 148 cases, 148 uh, wards that she has personally visited, yeah. It, uh came about because of my brother. So thank you very much for yes, that. I remember. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. Anyone else? All right. 
Thank you very much, ma'am. Sir, thank you for your service, and congratulations on your retirement. Sheila. Um, going back, moving forward, we have the state attorney. Um, their request for for uh, funding on this 24 budget was $772,000, and their recommendation was uh, $772,000. And with that, I leave you with Mr. Ed Broski uh, and Jennifer Strong, state attorney. Well, good morning, commissioners. Uh, Ed Brodsky, state attorney, and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, I guess as we have worked to develop this uh, budget this year through the county, I can't thank enough uh, the, the county administrator, Mr. Washington, and uh, our CFO, Ms. McLean, for their work. As, as all of you see, I think the, the, uh, the budget that we requested has been recommended. Um, I guess the first thing I would say to all of you is, you know, I appreciate the sentiment that public safety is important here in Manatee County. I think that here on the sixth floor and a portion of the fifth floor, uh, our team of prosecutors and our staff here are very devoted to Manatee County and ensuring the public safety of our residents here in this community. And, and uh, we have very strong collaborative relationships with all of our law enforcement agencies and with all of our uh, county stakeholders here uh, in the work that we do. So we appreciate your support. We appreciate the space that we're in. We appreciate everything that you do to support us. Um, so we are, uh, our budget's been approved as requested, or at least it's been, you know, um, recommended. So with that, I would open it up to any questions if there are any. Commissioner Ballard. Right now, or with the 5% increase, what is your starting salary for your prosecutors? Well, that, that has been um, a, a consistent battle throughout the state. I know I heard the, sh the presentation of the sheriff and the battle that he's having to, to retain and recruit uh, deputies uh, into the region, and I think that that's been a, a persistent problem throughout the region. And so I appreciate the efforts of, the, of this board to support the sheriff in those regards. Um, but we, too, are in the same boat. And, and I know Mr. Eager's here you know, with the Public Defender's Office, and, um, you know, around the state, we have about, we're, you know, we're supposed to be around 2,000 prosecutors uh, around the state, but we're short in the hundreds around the state. Um, you know, I'm short, you know, 10 to 15 positions here in, in my office. So um, it's a consistent problem, and it's something that we've been very, working really hard to lobby with the legislature to address um, starting salaries. And... We have significantly moved starting salaries, and it's something that we're working very hard to address. And I think that it's, a, it's something that we're going to continue to have to work towards. My goal is to get our starting salaries for our assistant state attorneys here at $75,000. Um, we're currently offering them $70,000, and, and truthfully, we're still short in that regard. Um, you know, and we're still struggling. And I will say that was, that's a significant increase from even 10 years ago. Yeah, it, it really is. It's, it's significantly increased. I mean, uh, not, you know, just a few years ago, we were at $50,000. So, but we're realizing that, that we have to make this conscious decision, uh, you know, as Commissioner Bearden and all of you talked about, you know, turnover has a significant impact. And the folks that we're putting in the courtroom across the street to prosecute those serious cases we need seasoned, veteran, experienced prosecutors over there handling the very serious cases that we have. And um, so it's, it's a very important issue for us and something that we work on every day. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, I don't want to throw Larry under the bus here, but why Let's is, throw him under the bus. He, say, he said he's all for it. Why is, I mean, it, it could be a matter of headcount. It could be a matter of the type of people you hire. Why is his salary realignment number so dramatically higher than your salary realignment number if you're both hiring the same attorneys? Uh, that's, I, I honestly would have to defer to, to Mr. Eager about that question. I, 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 I'm just saying, I mean, we, you know. So, 
I'm, no, no, that's not what I'm. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm perfectly fine with his. I'm just. I, I'm, I'm asking. You just said your salaries are, are too low, and so. Pe- it must have to do with the number. That, that, of people, that's what so. I'm asking. That, yeah. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Like I said, we we've been consistently from from one number from one thing to the other, making sure that everybody within this county is properly 5%. compensated for. I want to make sure people aren't deferring to lower compensation because again, we lose people, and training is super expensive. And hiring is very expensive and very difficult right now. And I, I would much rather retain people than try to skim a couple of thousand dollars off of anybody's salary and have them leave for, I mean, not going to leave for Sarasota, it's the same district, but leaving for Pinellas or Hillsborough or another district. So I just want to make sure in this year, especially if our focus is catching everybody up as opposed to millage, that we're getting on the right page because eventually this is going to have to get caught up. And it's one thing to get someone caught up Three to five thousand. It's another thing if we kick this down the road for a few years. Now all of a sudden, someone comes back and says, "I need to increase everyone's salary by twenty grand each to 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 be competitive." I just want to make sure that this is a realistic budget that's going to retain the people we need to retain. Sure, thank you, sir. So, Commissioner Ballard is recognized for dialogue. So, historically, the public defender salary has been even significantly lower than the state attorney salary. My guess, my hope, is that the public defender is trying to jump up and kind of get the, those salaries more level because typically they, those salaries have been $5,000 or, or even or even more lower than a than the state attorney salaries. Okay. And like I said, that's, I, just, I'm that's a, my I'm guess. A, I'm not knocking that budget. I wasn't even going to bring it up in that budget. It's just it's a glaring difference. Yeah. So I, I was bringing it up more relative to this one being too low rather than that one being too high. Commissioner Cruz, if I may. Yes, ma'am, Madam CFO. Um, the differential in the public defender is because the public defender is, has um, some information that there is a bill that it's it's out there pending legislation approver, approval on increase on attorneys. So he's trying to anticipate that in his budget. Um, if it passes, that's why it was not um, recommended for appro- for funding. If this legislature passes then he will come back and say, I want the difference because it is a mandate of the state. Okay. Thank you, commissioners. Is there a, Commissioner Statcher is next on the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I just wanted, in general, for uh, people that may be following, um, you know, the nation and then what we have going on here in Manatee County because... You know, obviously, you're asking relatively modest, but still um, for an increase in your budget. Uh, And we see these headlines of just municipalities, of cities, especially some large cities, where they're, you know, putting together uh, policies that are, it seems to me, perpetuating crime. You've got the cashless bail. You've got where, you know, you can be stealing thousands of dollars worth of goods out of stores and just walk right out and no one responds. Um, things like that. Can If someone were watching this and concerned, wait, what is it we're backing here? Can, can you put everyone's mind at ease? I'm assuming that that is not the way we do business here in Manatee County and in Florida. Is that correct? Uh, Commissioner Satcher, I appreciate the question. And, and uh, to that question, yes, 100%. We are not uh, any of those communities where they're doing, uh, in implementing programs or progressive policies, you know, the cashless bail or the, the, you know, catch and release policies. You know, those are, we have strong law enforcement policies here, and I can tell you through the sheriff, through this board, who, who support the very strong policies that we have in place here, to the state attorney's office, uh, we work very strongly to make sure that we maintain law and order here in Manatee County. And so you're not going to see... For example, we see some of the, the proliferation of shoplifting that's occurring throughout the community, you know, stores that are locking up all of their merchandise. Uh, you're not going to see any tolerance here from any of the law enforcement agencies here to our office uh, to doing anything to coddle or to uh, um, condone any of that type of behavior here. So we take a very strong and uh, proactive approach to doing everything that we can to make sure that this is, there's a reason that Manatee County is, is a gem and that everybody wants to live here. It's because we have strong conservative values here in Manatee County. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else for the state attorney? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you all very much. 
Madam CFO, who is our next contestant? Our next contestant is the public defender with a request for budget of $827,000 and a recommendation of $720,000. And with that, I leave you with Mr. Larry Eager, public defender, and Marianne Conling, as the fis fiscal director. All right. Larry Eager, always popular at the microphone, public defender. He, he's a fan favorite. Get ready. <laughs> as much as I might prepare, I'm never prepared for you people. Um, and so, Commissioner Ballard, I want to thank you very much for bringing up an interesting topic. And the, the reality is, and when I hear it, the starting salary for a public defender is $60,000. Now, again, what Commissioner Ballard and what uh, Ed Brodsky brought up and what our CFO has brought up, we're trying to jibe with the state legislature and the governor's budget. And, and this is in reference to the um, drug court attorney. The legislature has approved a 5.3% pay increase across the board, so that's part of what we're requesting. There's another pool of money that the legislature has set aside, which has not yet been distributed, and we don't know where it's going to come or when it's going to come, but we're looking at anywhere from five to $10,000 per attorney. This goes to what we were talking about earlier. And again, Commissioner Bob brings up the fact that housing, the number of people I have interviewed for my office, now, again, starting salary at $60,000. And I have people who desperately want to come to work for my office. And I used to get a stack of resumes. But once I tell them, I'd love to hire you, you need to check the lay of the land. And they will contact me within a week saying, I have to respectfully decline because I can't find a place to live. So this is something that you hear repeatedly, so I don't have to bring it up again. But this is the reason why we're requesting that we're trying to stay on parity with the, we're well, not even near parity with the public uh, sector, because that is but one of our primary adversaries, and that they come in, we train them, they poach them. Why train your attorneys when we can do it for them for free and they can come and get, I, I kind of like to refer to a year in the public defender's office as a dog's year, seven years in the private sector, because they get that much experience. When you look at the drug court attorney, and we're talking only one attorney that we're asking for the salary increase. We cover the 12th Judicial Circuit. We have two attorneys, one in Manatee and one in Sarasota that covers drug court. As of June 2nd, their caseload was 648 cases. Understand, and I, I guess I'm again looking to uh, Commissioner Ballard, who is a an attorney, where that is in reality, and what what the state what the ABA standards are as far as representation, and and we do this tirelessly. And the people who do drug court, the two attorneys I have, are so committed to the work that they do. It's not a forty hour a week. Sometimes it's not even eighty hours a week. I can tell you, and this is in reference to my violation of my early case resolution attorney in Sarasota. She literally drove her client to a drug program in Gainesville, came back for court at 8.30 in front of Judge Roberts in drug court. So this is the dedication. And so I thank you for the support that you've given everyone. But I want you to understand what we have and the dedication for the attorneys in my office. So again, looking at economy and trying to be as efficient as possible, Instead of have, hiring an additional attorney, we're asking that the support staff for the drug court goes from 20% to 50% person. So we have a legal assistant that's basically covering approximately, getting back to the numbers, over 300 cases. And she's 20%. So I don't mean to be, my wife keeps telling me that I get to be, I'm overly self-righteous when I get four years, but I'm, I'm really imploring, I, on bent knees asking so that we can afford to keep them. Because I don't want to hire a second attorney, because that, which is justified. And again, 
Commissioner Cruz is saying, are we going to come, keep building it up and then come back two years from now saying, I need $150,000 to cover everything. I'm trying to accommodate. The flexibility and the cost that we're requesting is because, as has been noted, we still haven't gotten the budget from the state. And the attorney who does my drug court that you pay for, I want to be on parity with the rest of the attorneys in my staff. So that is the justification. And that's my request for the, uh, the increased in the salary as well as the personnel percentage. I'm asking for an increase of 30% of a person, not even a full-time staffer. Moving to technology, which is something that I'm always afraid to address because I don't understand technology. But we keep introducing new technologies to our office. And one of the things that is a marvelous piece of technology is evidence.com. But the amount of work that goes into utilizing this, for instance, the body cams that we have to go through to ferret through to determine whether or not it's information that is relevant to the case that doesn't violate Marcy's law, that will be used or not used, will need to be redacted, whatever. Take one officer on, a, on an arrest that, let's just say, three hours. But you've got three backups, so now you've got three body cams. And then you've got the cam in the car. That's the fourth cam. The, the hours of review that it requires. So we're asking for an IT person who will assist in the review of those documentations so that the attorney doesn't spend that time. Because again, looking at it from a circuit-wide basis, Sarasota, Manatee, and DeSoto counties, we were appointed to just south of 20,000 cases. So do the math when we've got less than 45 attorneys to cover 20,000 cases. Everyone here, the sheriff, plays an incredibly important role. The state plays an incredibly important role. The judiciary plays an incredibly important role. But I don't want to diminish the importance of my office because you take one leg away from that table and it falls. It's that simple. I think I've been self-righteous enough so I can, because I didn't expect to be, but y'all brought up all these things. No, you, you did uh, well. You were, you were passionate. I wouldn't say self-righteous. Uh, so, Commissioners Cruz and Bearden are on the board for comment. Sir? I have two questions. First one on the technology side, because this is the easier one. The salary increase you had, you requested 24 and are recommended as four. That, that seems like math. That doesn't, like 5% of an existing salary base should just spit out a number. So maybe this is a question as much for Sheila. How did we get $20,000 lower on the salary compensation increase for that line item? If you advocate for me, I'll be very happy. Because I don't <laughs> know Were you, the 20% that you're referring to is that the, from the requested to the recommended. It went from 50 to 30. But that is... Wait, what? None of those numbers that is something I said. Oh, I uh, under court technology, the third line, increased salaries, 5% salary compensation. The request is 24314. The recommended is 4,526. Wouldn't that just be 5% times the current salary base? I mean, how are we getting such a deviation in numbers here? Well, she calculated that inclusive of the new person that's asking. And then also... A new person we made do up $20,000? No, 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 no. So he's increasing one f from 25% to 50% to funding. That's more. That's, that's in his 24000 We calculated only 5% of all his staff in the core technology, which is only two. And we did not um, recommend the increase of the $13,000, which is what he's asking that additional person plus that other, but it, it's all combined in there. So I might have to simplify it. I, I do need you at the microphone, sir. Okay. To maybe complicate or simplify it, mm -hmm. we don't ask for a full person. We're asking for a 20% person. 
and that's where the salary increase. We're not asking for a 20% increase to pay one person. We're asking for an additional person who's going to be wearing multiple hats. 20%. I, I see what you're saying. So this isn't just a raise. This is a, no, this, no, is no, no. a this is base compensation for a currently non-existent FT position. And understood. So, so understood. All right. Well, I, yeah. I, stop I, if you understand. I, again, I mean, I think we're kind of going with a trend of making sure we're set up. I for that, I I have no problem with their request as for the the increase the 97,000 I'm a little confused because I uh, there's thousands of bills what bill are we referring is this 97,000 something that's going to be dictated by the state that that we have to fund or is that some is those funding sources that are going to come down from the state so they don't come out of our budget which one is that the the bulk of my my attorneys are my attorneys, and I get the funding through the state. Drug court is a specialty court funded by the county. So this is exclusively under the purview of the county as to payment for salaries. I'm just trying to keep my drug court attorney at the same salary rate as the rest of my attorneys. Okay, because I think Sheila mentioned something about that 97,000 that was requested being removed until a bill comes down. For, uh, and, and we're waiting to hear from that. Did I misunderstand what you were referring to? Maybe. I mean, I'm sure I did. Um, I gave you a handout where it shows individually all each one of those the staff that is in his um, yeah, is funded with the increase individually of what he's asking. That makes up the 97 plus whatever it's in court technology, all of it. I'm so you can see as a I'm talking about the 97,000 on the recurring Yes, part but it's a combination of attorneys and old. So the $97,000 is the increase of one attorney by 64,746 um, an attorney's assistant by that's the t from 25 to 50 26,857 and then an attorney funded at 100 percent, they are asking for an increase beyond of 15,000. But but all this is for drug court. Yes, sir. Which and we these just three spent are hundreds of thousands court. of dollars to fund in its entirety for the, the first time in a long time. But we're not going to provide the attorney to handle the drug court. No, sir. What what I'm trying to say is that once the legislature passes the mandate, then. We can and we get the anticipated cost, the final assessed values of the property appraiser. Then we can relook and see, okay, this is now really what legislature has approved. Maybe more, it may be less. So I'm just trying to make it comparable to what the actual bill is going to pass and at what mandate is going to be. She's saying in good conscience she can't recommend you approve it until the bill passes and she yes, knows sir. it's required. So if the bill doesn't pass, you're saying we're just not going to fund that and provide. Right. That, so that doesn't make sense. If the concern is we need this person or people, whether the bill passes or not, we're, we're basically waiting for the state to tell us we need attorneys for our drug court. And if the state says, no, you don't 100% need it, we're just going to not have attorneys for our drug court over $97,000 after we just spent million, like hundreds of thousands of dollars on a drug court. That doesn't make sense. I'd rather put, and plus, I'd rather be conservative on this stage of the budget and have the 97000 on the recommended and then we could always pull it back and have a couple extra bucks in reserve somewhere, then have it as zero, and then all of a sudden we find out it's mandated. Now we're scrambling finding 97000 that's already been approved. I fundamentally disagree with both sides of that. I think it needs to be funded whether the state tells us to or not. And two, we need to have it under-recommended first and have excess money not be short ninety seven grand down the road. So ultimately, that's a decision for the board to make. That's the staff. decision I'm recommending. Sure, and that, that's and you have every right to recommend that. But just to, you know, stand up for the CFO. That's it's not really her prerogative yeah. to spend that money. It's the board's. I 100 percent get. I, I get it. I, I see where she's going from. I'm just saying, from a poll standpoint, that's my opinion. Is we need to move the ninety seven thousand over to recommended. Do we have a second for that? Second. Commissioner Bob beat you to it. So okay. the poll, the the poll is uh, by Cruz. And then there's been a, a sympathy reconciliation. Ballard will get the uh, the second on that. Yes. Would you like to also pull the the um, the IT specialist as well for the evidence? It, yeah, yeah, it's oh. twenty thousand okay. dollars to to make sure we have so proper Cruz, staffing. Cruz will pull that one as well, and Ballard will also second that. Okay. Yes, All right. So the board has lit up. We have Bearden Baugh. Anyone with a B? Bearden, Bob, Ballard, and then Satcher. 
Bearden is off. Baugh is off. Commissioner Ballard. If we were not to fund these attorneys that are our county funded attorneys that that perform the action that that work on our drug court cases how much would they be getting paid if we didn't do these increases the salary that you presently give them which is oh jesus i, can't. I don't have the i, I think you said 60 at the outset. because depending we just lost our one drug court attorney and we we moved. I moved a division chief because you want Understood. probably the one your your most experienced people doing these cases. Sure. And I wasn't expecting that question. Okay. But I can tell you, you know, it's. I'm not. I don't want to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. And I really appreciate everyone here. The irony of it is, you're making it so that now you're making drug court a more desirable position. So I'm going to have all my attorneys wanting, well, I want that job now too, because they're paying more than the line attorneys are getting. But I appreciate and understand what your, the objective is, because it's the frustration that we have. We, it's going to be fascinating to see what we finally get. But as you can see, with a starting salary of $60,000, we're hoping to achieve after the various incentive raises that will be coming to the state attorney's office as well as the public defender's office, that we will be able to achieve parity with what the state is now getting, but of course they're going to be getting more money, so we're constantly chasing after that elusive, uh, I guess, parity, as I've said. Unless there are more questions, I'm going to run away and hide. I, I do have Commissioner uh, Satcher on the damn. boards. You're not running anywhere yet. Commissioner Thatcher. Yeah. Um, I think what I'm going to do is just ask for an offline uh, briefing on these numbers and where, uh, you know, how we got there um, so quickly. Because I'm not, I mean, when I look at the offices that we're being asked to fund here, um, some of them with as low as a 0.4% increase, uh, ranging up to the highest being at 19, but then you're at 30, um, and we're coming up with reasons. But to me, I mean, this could snatch defeat from the jaws of victory with me. It could go the other way because here we've been asked to fund drug court. If all of a sudden funding drug court is setting the whole, you know, upsetting the whole apple cart and changing everyone's uh, funding and salaries across the board, then we don't have to do that. So I would, you know, I want to have some uh, peace in mind that we're doing the best thing with the, the resources that we have. And also, I mean, Bottom line is, I appreciate you. I understand that, um, uh, you know, it's just important constitutionally that we're able to defend people. And, and I mean, that's a great thing. Um, but, boy, I, I just don't get excited about writing a check to you more than my prosecutors. Um, and if we don't normally do that, I don't want to be the first board to vote for that. So I, I'm sure I'm missing something. You mentioned technology, et cetera. I just didn't kind of... Um, so I, I would like just a briefing offline to see how we get to these numbers, because um, I'm going to need uh, some. When you say briefing offline, I'll be more than happy to discuss this afterwards and uh, in any details. The important thing to remember is the county funding drug court, fully funding drug court, is completely independent from the staffing of the state's attorney's office and the public defender's office in their functioning. The monies that you have provided are monies that have gone. <laughs> I've been part of the criminal, I, I never remember if it's the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council or the Criminal Justice Commission, because I have two of them, one in Manatee and one in Sarasota, serving the same function, but with different names. So, Commissioner Ballard, which one do I, is? I, I think it's Coordinating Council. Okay, Coordinating Council. I've been on it since 2008. And since 2008, Sarasota County has fully funded their yeah. component. Uh, let, 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 me, let me fully finish the question. You're free so to, that, but I don't know so, that I would advise it at this point, so, but you can. But we have worked very hard so that we use the grant money that we've been getting, we can dedicate to new initiatives. And the commission has graciously provided funding for drug court, fully funding drug court now. If... I'm not provided with the funding for salary increases. I'm still going to be in drug court. That, that, again, that's completely independent from that. But for the rest of it, um, as I said, we can go off uh, and I, we can kind of brainstorm together because I'm always looking for solutions. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Ballard. So I, I just... 
there are a couple things that I that I want to say. The public defender is an essential constitutional function. People who are accused of crimes, it is their constitutional right to be represented. It is essential to our court system that they have representation. If you are accused, you get representation. We are quibbling over $97,000 for public defenders who make $60,000 a year when we're paying our, and, and these are people who are highly educated, who are performing an essential constitutional function for pennies. I mean, compared to what they could be doing and the money that they could be making in the private sector. Um, we're paying, we're spending $199 million on the sheriff's office, but we can't spend $97,000 to make sure that we are able to retain attorneys to make our court system run. That's, that's ridiculous. I mean, I, I agree. It is a, it is a three-legged stool. We need the public defender. We need the prosecutor. We need the sheriff. We need all of them. This ask is not, it's not, it's not outrageous at all. Commissioner Satch, would you like to dialogue? Sure, since we're out in the open. So ignoring the substance of our disagreement, um, or I guess I should say the opposite, ignoring the details of our disagreement. Um, so you mentioned the sheriff. So looking at these numbers that the public defender is asking for, and then the sheriff, I mean, are you at this point where you're a yes for um, what I proposed earlier with the sheriff funding the deputies if we end up at a yes on the public defender? That is an order of magnitude difference. That's a huge, huge difference. I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to horse trade and commit to that. That's, a, that's an absolutely, that's a, that's a huge order of magnitude. That's one mil in, in, in tax relief for our citizens versus $97,000. No. That's a, that's a complete straw man. That's ridiculous. No. I'm not saying that I won't end up there, but I'm not doing it today over, over $97,000. That's ridiculous. <laughs> well, I don't have a, a, you know, I don't have a way to ask these questions outside of these meetings. So just seeing where we're at. Um, my whole point is if we're asking for a 50% and looking at a recommended 30%, um, that we would, it seems to me, I mean, that seems more than uh, piddling, and it seems like we're owed a little bit. If I asked for a better explanation, I didn't say I was a yes or a no, but I said I'd like a better explanation offline. That seems pretty reasonable um, to me. And also, just philosophically, I don't like paying my public defender's office more than I'm paying my state's attorney's office. Um, I mean, it's a, it is a, constitutionally mandated thing and it's uh, worthwhile. We know in the United States of America, everybody deserves a defense, a good defense. Um, but I don't like paying them an extra 50 or whatever uh, more than I'm paying the state's attorney's office. So maybe that's just philosophical and maybe there's something different to the way they run the two sides of things. I'm willing to hear them out, um, like I said, offline, but I'm not necessarily backing down from that position as far as I'm not, I'm not embarrassed that I don't want to pay attorneys more money. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Ball, you're last on the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. These types of conversations are not ones that I like to hear or get involved in, but this is America. <laughs> and so we have to, I think, look at the state attorney's office and the public defender's office. They both have a big service and need to our country. Uh, the accused has the right to a fair trial. How are you going to get it if you don't have a decent attorney? It is what it is. It's, it's, it's part of what America is built on. But when you talk about drug court, I've been here a long time, and I can tell you that drug court has made a difference in so many people's lives. And it couldn't do that if they didn't have 
a decent attorney and a court administration that spent the time and the effort to follow through and take care of the people that's in drug court. So I, Commissioner Satcher, I normally almost always agree with you on, on things that you say. We're, we're kind of in the same realm. But on this one, this is America, and everybody's entitled to a fair trial. And, and I can tell you when I first started on this board, you can ask our public defender. I wasn't real friendly to him because I felt that it wasn't really needed. But then I learned a lot, and I realized to make this country what it is supposed to be that we seem to be having trouble with today, the public defender plays a big role in that, and it's very important, and it's only fair um, that the attorneys be paid a decent salary so that they can do their job just like the state attorney's office can, who, by the way, I'll say it, I don't always agree with our state attorney. Uh, you know, I, I think I've, I've seen some things that have taken place that, you know, I felt weren't really above board, but it's not my job. It's not my job. Um, I, I don't like it when I feel that people are being picked on or, or whatever, Um but, but that being said, I think the public defender's request is minimal. It's easy for us to do this. It's not an awful lot of money. And, and I do uh, ask, Mr. Eager, if you would please get with Commissioner Satcher, because I know he's a fair man and wants to be fair. And I think that maybe there's some things that, you know, I feel kind of like I went through the same thing. So maybe he might be able to. I bet y'all could become best friends. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And and actually, I, I'll have uh, my aide set it up, but I think I would like to uh, come over and have a tour of your office and a, and a sit down and discussion. I recently was able to familiarize myself with the workings of the state attorney's office uh, and the probation office, actually. Uh, but I've not, I did not familiarize myself with your office as I, <laughs> I paid my own way. Um, but uh, but I would seriously I would like to come over and, and have a tour and and learn about you, Commissioner Ron and then Commissioner Satcher are on the board. Commissioner Ron, thank you, Public Defender. A uh, couple quick questions. Um, what is the average caseload right now of your public defenders in your office? Funny you should mention that, but you have to go. You have to understand the types of cases. Yeah. Yes, my mic is on. Sorry, I, I should get closer to the mic. Um, because we, we break it down uh, in generals. Uh, we have the misdemeanor division. We have the felony division. We have the capital division. We have the violations of probation. And so when I look at the, um, in Manatee County, uh, for instance, there's three divisions. And even within those three divisions, the caseload is diverse. So that the, um, the average in... Judge White's division is 82 cases. The average in Judge Mercurio's is 134 cases per attorney. And the average in Judge uh, Aaron's is 116. So you can see, and I don't, this is neither the time nor the place, but we can get into how cases are assigned, and that's another, uh, to be fought another day. In the misdemeanor division, you have the average caseload for a misdemeanor attorney in Judge Doyle's is 189 cases. And again, these are our youngest, right fresh out of law school uh, attorneys that are, there used to be a, a philosophy that because of budget restraints and payments, we had, we have four misdemeanor attorneys. For a while there, we had four misdemeanor divisions. Each county court judge had half of it was criminal and half of it was uh, circ, uh, civil. So that meant our brand new attorney was given a hundred and some odd cases and said, here, sink or swim. Because you didn't, now I've hired an additional attorney and it's the first time since being elected in 2008 that I have an attorney that doesn't have a caseload. Her sole responsibility is supervising our newly hired attorneys. Part of that is because we have so many new attorneys, because we lost so many during the pandemic and going into private practice and retirement. Um, our capital division, or as I said, drug court, uh, I, we've, unfortunately I've lumped that between Sarasota and Manatee County, and that's up to 684 cases for two attorneys. Um, 
and then the, the uh, homicide capital sexual battery cases. I have two attorneys, and they're averaging uh, 20 cases each. An ABA standard is four. So that gives you a ballpark estimate of what they do. I don't know what we would do if we had fewer cases. I'm so used to handling so many cases, I think that if I had a, what was this recommended by the Bar Association, I'd be bored to death. But we've learned how to manage and we deal uh, in this. I'd love to sit down with all of you, individually or in a group, and just give you, you know, a presentation of what it is to be a public defender. Because it is really fascinating, and I love being a public defender, and I love the office. It is the purest form of the practice of law there is. We only practice law. We only practice criminal law. Every attorney, regardless of their level of experience, is probably the best attorney in the state in the field of criminal law because that's all. We don't have to solicit. We're not looking at billable hours. We're not looking at trying to get the client in the door and signing a contract. Believe me, when a client threatens to hire a private attorney, it's Okay. So, but it, um, so that gives you, I know that was more than you asked for, but. One other question. What is the average You haven't average asked a single question. Now I, I'm the one who gets all the questions. Okay. Well, you make the big bucks. Um, <laughs> apparently, apparently. Um, what, what would you say that is the average years of experience for your attorneys across the board? I know you have some that are coming right out of your recruiting right out of law school but you have some that have been in there longer? Uh, you know, I have that information, but not at my fingertips, and it is a constantly moving target. I've, um, I've lost, for instance, in the state of Florida, you have to be what's referred to as death qualified in order to do a first degree murder case in which the state is seeking the death penalty. All of my death qualified attorneys have retired. So I have had to go on, I'm, I don't want to have to go into due process funds and hire outside counsel. So I have actually had one attorney go to the East Coast to second chair so that she can become death qualified. And it's sort of a mixed blessing. The fact that we haven't had a death penalty case in so long because of COVID and, and whatnot, the costs uh, that are incurred, but we've lost our most experienced attorneys to retirement. Um, so my chief assistants, they range from 10 to 15 years of experience. Um, I believe the, since the last pay increase, which occurred last year, the legislature was generous. Um, prior to that, I didn't have a single attorney making over $100,000. I now have, I believe, three attorneys that have just broken that ceiling. And they have anywhere from 10 I mean, 15 to 20 years of experience doing cases that a single case would probably, a single capital sexual battery case in the private sector would bring in anywhere from 50 to $100,000 for one case. And they'll have four or five uh, going simultaneously. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And yeah, you should just reach out to each of us, I think, because I've written down like five more questions. I'm not going to do that to you, uh, but I've written down like five more questions. So I, I think it'd be a good idea for you to reach out to all of us, and some will come and some won't, and, you know, we'll, um, we'll that's, see. I'd love to, um, since you're right, right across the street, since I was just retrained in sunshine, I'm always afraid to reach out. Well, you would come individually, yeah, and, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, so Jorge, Arana will, issues, Jorge Arana sir. will reach out to you, and then he'll help set you up with all of the uh, commissioner aides, and then you can just... Or your terrific. office can set up I the, would love the visits. It. It'll be individual, though. Commissioner Satcher is the last one on the board, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to clear up. I had one of my uh, facts wrong. I was looking at the wrong column. Um, so what we have recommended, we've got the public defender at 720 um, and the state attorney at 772. So that whole concern of mine of paying my defender more than my state's attorney is um, not uh, appropriate or does not apply to this budget. So that's great news. And then I just want to say that for one meeting, um, I was in, on the uh, Public Safety Council, and we spoke about drug court and uh, talked about strategies to get it funded, and so I'm glad that that came up today and that we did get it um, taken care of. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Larry, I think you should run for the hills at this point. Uh, it's, it's 1047. We've, we've gone over uh, beyond our 1030 standard recess time. 
Guardian ad litem is left. Well, we still have property appraiser, which is a big one, and we have uh, tax collector, which is still a big one. Uh, so let's recess for 10 minutes, and when we come back, we'll hit those three. We're in recess.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. We're moving right along through our constitutional officers' budget day, and next is guardian ad litem, Madam CFO. Yes, um, uh, we have here Tony Latour two to represent the guardian ad litem. Their budget request was two hundred and ninety-three thousand dollars, and their recommendation for twenty-four is two hundred and ninety-three thousand. Good morning, commissioners. Um, we agree with our budget, <laughs> and so this could have been an easy one before break, but um, no, um, we'd just like to say thank you because we um, had some increase last year that really um, helped us, so we appreciate that. And I think the only thing that I'll mention is um, with the increases and um, for our staff, because we now have four full-time employees through Manatee County, um, we've outgrown our space. So my employees like where they are. They already said, do not move us. They would all quit. Um, so we're over in the courthouse. So we are working with um, facilities to um, revamp the space that we're in. So I know that'll have to come out of our budget somewhere. So that's the only thing that um, we'd like for you to consider when it, they come over and they'll need to do some construction in there. Okay, last year, I think we... You added a an attorney position, is that correct? Yes. And then the year before that, you added two caseworkers. Is that yes. right? Yes. Yes. Okay. And so you feel now you're in a you're in a good place. Yes. Yes, we okay. are. Okay. Very good. Do, do do any of your folks work from home at all? Um, we do. We allow them up to two days to work from a okay. remote location. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great. Commissioner Satcher. And just to follow up on uh, what the chair said about some of those increases. One of those, if I recall, was more than what you had asked for. Like maybe you asked for one more position and we did two, something along those yes. lines. So, you know, we, we definitely hope that you consider us a friend and, uh, and a partner in, in protecting our children. So. Yes, we appreciate that. We, we, really, we really do. We really like the partnership that we have with Manatee County. Thank All you. Right. All right. Commissioners, any, Commissioner Ballard. There we go. A couple questions. Um, are you having any issues with staff retention, number one? Um, yes, we have. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, your child advocate managers, what is the salary uh, that, that you're paying them? Um, and then your attorneys, how, how much are they making? So currently our child advocate managers are in my... Um, Budget liaison is back there, Mika. So I'm going to say, and she can shake her head yes or no, about 37000 I believe, for our child advocate managers. And our attorneys, um, our program attorneys, which are entry attorneys, uh, make about 48000 and our senior attorneys, 55. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, no, no. Are, They're full -time. are those full time positions? I, they are full time, yes. I can tell you they're full time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are we going to do with that? I just knew the information, wanted it to be out there. So I think we might be in a position also, what Mr. Eager was saying, is that we're waiting for the state for um, the bills to pass and be signed, and we're hoping to see some increases there with our salaries. Um, are your salaries set by the state and then funded by this county? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but I do know um, once we've had a, uh, the state did give us an increase, when we work with our county, we had no problem moving our um, county employees up to the same as the state. And most times they're already there or past them. So, Commissioner Cruz. All, all I would say is that's something we should like put in the back burner at the very least for next year when it comes to our state legislative priorities is to have the state look at the salaries that are being paid so that they can get bumped up from a state level. I agree, and and Tony, that will come around sooner than, so the state has early sessions and then yes. late sessions, it goes back. So we just did a late session, the next one's an early session. And so in just a couple months, they'll be reporting mm -hmm. for, uh, for committees, uh, for committee weeks. Um, so please stay in contact with Mr. Washington on that, because that's something that we want to see on our legislative priority list. Commissioner Ballard. And just a question, I mean, I, I know that the minimum is set by the state, but as a county, we have the ability to to increase increase those salaries above above that rate. So we were cautioned by Senate President Wilson Simpson at one point when he came to doing that because his concern was is that 
Right. If counties, it, it is the responsibility of the state, I, you know, by definition. Um, and so if counties were to start to do that, the state would immediately, right, pull back and say, well, you know, Pasco and Hillsboro, what's the problem? You know, Manatee is funding on their own. That's what you need to do. It's, that's, it's the trend. Um, and it would backfire, re, re, you know, un, unintended consequences. I agree they need to pay decent salaries. We'll take that message to Tallahassee next Thank year. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for all you do, your, your entire office. We appreciate you. Next up is the property appraiser, Madam CFO. The property appraiser will not be here present today, but their budget is pretty straightforward. Um, they got a late, late submission to their budget, but their increase is actually based on what the state gives them, and it's uh, by Florida statute we have to increase them because they get a, a portion in collections of our ad valorems. The more ad valorem grows, the more is their budget. This year, and you don't see it reflected in this sheet because it was a late submission. They asked for uh, $300,000, approximately more than what last year was. And then the tax collector, another one that it's, we have no choice but to fund them because they all they get is based on an increase on ad valorem from our side. So their total funded right now is um, $13.4 million. That's what we calculated based on the uh, increase on the estimated values of um, property taxes. And with that, um, finally, I just wanted to say that we all know that we also have the support costs that we fund for the uh, clerk of the court, the sheriff, the property appraiser, and the tax collector. Um, and they, it totals $6.6 .6 million of additional funding that we um, to support them. And this is inclusive of, you know, maintaining their facilities, wherever they are, and so forth, um, utility services, and so forth. We also fund their um, FRS and, and all that, so that also goes as part of the changes to the retiree and FRS in that support cost. And with that, um, that concludes our presentation for this morning with the constitutionals and the judicial programs. Uh, Commission, do you have any questions? Any questions? Okay. If the uh, public defender hadn't taken up so much time, we really <laughs> would have cruised along. So was our intention to do constitutionals in the morning and then... Yes, sir. Okay, so we have still, you know, 50 minutes. Is there another portion of this that you want to take up now? Um, well, the, the thing departments is we don't really are have not here, here to defend their budgets, and so they will True. be here. Now, okay. is it the, is it the um, desire of the board to come back at 1 or at one thirty? Because the agenda said 1 o'clock. Well, if the agenda said 1, then we have to come back at 1. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. then we will... Gives us a little extra time. We'll, we'll move the tables and commence the square dancing. We'll return at 1 o'clock. We're in recess. Thank you.
everyone and, and welcome. It's Monday, May 22nd, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. The MPOB meeting is now called to order. Mrs. Eubanks, do we have a quorum? Yes, we do. All right, thank you. Um, confirms the quorum and thank you. Next. Okay, at this time, I'll ask Commissioner Ball from Manatee County if she'll provide the invocation. Yes, and the Pledge of Allegiance. Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a beautiful day to be here to have this meeting. Father, please give us the wisdom, the knowledge, and the camaraderie to be able to make wise decisions for our area, for Sarasota, Manatee, Help us to make sure that we're moving the right projects forward and that we're getting them done as quickly as we possibly can. Father, we thank you for every day that you walk beside us and give us guidance. In your son's name, Jesus, amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> all right, thank you. We'll go to public comment. Thank you. Um, I believe there are, I, will, I would um, mention that there are four ways for people to provide public comment um, uh, to the board. All comments received before, during, and after the meeting will be shared with uh, the board members and made part of the public record. Our meeting is being live streamed and will be available on METV, the uh, MPO Facebook page, and publicinput.com, and I believe YouTube as well. Um, and we, I believe we do have some public comments. Ms. Eubanks? In person, yes. In person, very good, thank you. Yes, we do. At this time, we'll call, is it Lewis? Kazabita? Close, close. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, good morning, my name is Louis Kasiba. I'm the president of the Friends of the Legacy Trail. Thank you for this opportunity to speak before you. I'm here to support the staff's recommendation. Um, um, uh, I can't read my writing. I'm here to, to support the staff's recommendation uh, approving item 6E of your agenda, more specifically, the Sun Trail preferred alignment from the Legacy Trail east to Lorraine Road in Lakewood Ranch. Friends of the Legacy Trail's mission is to support, promote, enhance, and protect the Legacy Trail and its connectors. Our vision is for trail users to con uh, connect to points of interest, such as Bobby Jones Golf Club, Nathan Benderson Park, and the future Moat Science Education Aquarium. Our vision is also for communities throughout the area to have safe passages which connected the trail as it flows from downtown Sarasota to Venice and Northport. The recommendation you will consider will improve bicycle and pedestrian safety, safety to and from these key destinations. For that reason, I encourage you to fully support the proposal before you. Finally, I wish to thank your staff and consultants for their dedication and hard work to bring the alignment study forward. More specifically, the Friends of the Legacy Trail would like to thank Nina Ventor, Ryan Brown, and Franco Saracino for their vision, for their, com um, for their community, and their vision and professionalism in developing the recommendation. It was a pleasure to work with them. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see we have any other public comment, so we'll close that portion. Moving on, next we have the agenda item number four. For reports, Mayor Shirley Groover Bryant, City of Palmetto, will give the Public Transportation Task Force report. Mayor Bryant. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Um, I just want to uh, briefly cover what we discussed this morning at the Public Transportation Task Force meeting. Um, we had a lot of information that was provided to us. Generally, um, there's a great success in the the different uh, with the different 
uh, entities working together, uh, trying some new processes and um, offering some free ser more free services. Um, they're really cutting edge. There's a lot of statistics, a lot of information that was included this morning. What I would suggest is that each and every one of you, if, you're, if you did not attend this morning, you really should um, access the information online. There was a great deal of information that was shared and I think it will be very beneficial for everybody. Um, the other thing we did this morning, um, I ha I'll have to say this with congratulations, to uh, Mitzi Fiedler from Venice, and she's our incoming chair, and also Vice Mayor Jane Coker is the vice chair of the upcoming upcoming year. So congratulations to both of you, and I, I'm sure you'll do a fine job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mayor Bryant? Hearing none, moving on, the uh, next will be Interim Secretary John Kubler will give the Florida Department of Transportation report. Welcome, sir. Yeah, I'll, I'll defer that to Wayne Gaither. He's coming to the podium to provide that report. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um, my participation for the FDOT report is going to be relatively easy. Um, I'd like to introduce Pam Barr, who is our new liaison for the Sarasota Manatee MPO. Uh, and with that, I will just pass the microphone straight off to Pam Barr. Um, she does come to the, to the Florida Department of Transportation with quite a bit of prior experience. This is her second time around with department in a new uh, position. And she is doing so far a fantastic job uh, working with your staff. Uh, and your staff has been fantastic and uh, extremely helpful in working with her as she gets acclimated to uh, this area. Good morning. Um, the report this morning is um, we're going to be developing your, the new work program for fiscal year 25 to 29, and we're working on vetting your priorities, projects, and applications for the next um, new cycle, which will begin in July. So we're, we are working on that. Um, and so you will be hearing more about that as we move into the next year and vetting those. Um, in early fall, our project engineer will be coming um, and we'll be giving an update on the operational improvements program on project 444807 um, for the city of Bradenton, the traffic improvements project. And other than that, that's what I have this morning. Hopefully, I will have more information next time. Okay, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving forward, we'll go to our executive director, David Hutchinson, give the MPO report. Thank you. I will also uh, try to be brief this morning. Um, I would note that on June 23rd, the Suncoast Transportation Planning Alliance, which uh, most of you will also recall, used to be known as the um, West Central Florida uh, MPO's Chairs Coordinating Committee, will be meeting at the Florida DOT District 7 facility up in Tampa. Um, and um, I believe um, Chair Kutzinger is planning to be at that meeting. And that's the, t they meet twice a year as a governing board. And, um, it, but you're all invited in case you feel like going up to Tampa that day. Um, also, we did receive some information after your agenda went out from central office regarding a complete streets opt out provision that is offered in conjunction with the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, Section 1126B, which requires states and MPOs to expend no less than 2.5% of certain types of funds, state planning and research, or SPR, um, that would be the state's money, and in metropolitan planning, or PL funds, that's what MPOs are funded with, on complete streets activities. And we believe that we do do that. Um, um, as part of the federal allocations, apparently $25,291 is, is the actual allocation um, set aside for complete streets activities in the bill. So the idea 
that they are proposing is that we will um, um, join with other MPOs from around the state and and with the state and opt out of individually reporting on what we spent 2.5% of our funds on. And um, um, we will be bringing back to you probably in September a resolution um, um, to do so because uh, what, what we received wasn't, we, we did not receive it in time to um, go through it. And I think there were some questions unless the district has further information on that particular opt-out provision and encourages um, an adoption um, today out without much notice, we will bring that back in September. Does, do you know much about that or is that gonna work? I think that'll be fine. I'm not aware of any constraints with that. Thank you very much. So heads up on that. Um, another heads up uh, that we will be working on between now and September. Um, every 10 years after the census is conducted, MPOs get new uh, population numbers and sometimes boundary modifications. And we are now within the period of time where we will be undertaking a review of the MPO's apportionment plan we do not anticipate any significant changes or actually any changes to the apportionment plan that's currently adopted because our population uh, proportions haven't, have not changed in any significant way. So our current structure should um, work going forward for another 10 years. Um, and then that has to go to the state for review. And I believe the governor would give his stamp of approval on continuing the apportionment plan as it currently stands. But that's another heads up. We'll bring that back to you in September. Um, and last but not least is, uh, well, not last, but not least is a uh, budget report, kind of an overview in front of you. We're on track. Um, we our budget went up this year because of the federal funding, and we are um, you know working with your jurisdictions and our technical advisory committee, and we have studies underway that you're going to hear about today and that you've been hearing about. So we by the end of our uh, two-year UPWP or Unified Planning Work Program budget period, um, which will would. Um, continue through July of 2024, we would anticipate that uh, right around 80% of the overall um, PL budget will be spent and the special studies funds will should all be spent by the end of our budget period. So we're on track. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time on budgets at these meetings, but anytime any of you want to dig into detail, we are happy to come and and spend, uh, you know, we can go through all the spreadsheets and uh, either your office or ours. So, uh, no, I mean, it is a serious thing and the fiduciary responsibility of the board is important. Um, and so I, it's not something we take lightly, um, but we, we try to make it painless for you. Um, we get lots of oversight due to our administrative relationship with Manatee County and um, through the review of all of the documentation that's submitted quarterly to the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, and occasionally we get involvement from Federal Highway or the uh, Federal Transit Administration. Um, so we've had a couple of staff anniversaries. Um, so we would, you know, we're, we try to recognize that uh, David Machado has completed his first year with us. Brian Brown is now six years with the MPO um, as our plan now as our planning manager. So we've had uh, Nina Venter is well over a year now. And Nanette, I, f I forget how many, <laughs> 22, is it? This year. Yeah. Well, congratulations. So, um, that's all I have. Thank all right. you. Well, congratulations to all the staff, especially for sticking in for 22 years. And hopefully the one years will be saying that not too quick, though. <laughs> goes by fast. Um, any questions? Just that we have not a question, but we have the best, the best staff in the state. Just. Thank you. All right, moving on to, uh, as I'm filling in for the chair, um, Mr. Hutchinson, I know you and I met, but was there something big that I needed to talk about? I don't remember really other than just going through the meeting. I think that's it. That's it. So, all right. So 
we'll just appreciate you uh, yeah. being our vice chair. No, no, no problem filling in. So, all right, moving forward, um, we'll move to Commissioner Vanessa Ball. We'll present the MPOAC report. Uh, the MPOAC, we had a great meeting last month. A um, lot of changes being made right now to um, how we handle our meetings and so forth, and we're looking at bylaws, changing those as well. At our last meeting, we did have Secretary Jared Perdue and our interim uh, director as well, and we just had a great time, a good meeting, good information, and thank you for being there. Absolutely. Uh, it was a really good meeting. Um, also, I wanted to say that the executive director, Mike, uh, Mark Reinhardt, we are changing kind of what he does and so forth. And one of the things that he's going to be spending more time on is working with all the different MPOs. So I'm sure that uh, before long we'll have him at an MPO meeting so that everyone can meet Mark. And he's been uh, with us now a little over a year. And uh, he's doing a great job. Uh, other than that, we did have our training institute. And uh, I think we did have a couple of people that were there. Anyone like to make comments? We'll go to Commissioner. Well, look at me. Uh, yep. Yes, I, I did attain, uh, attend uh, the training program, and, and I found it extremely useful and productive, and um, looking forward to, to future meetings. Thank you. All right. Vice Mayor? Vice Mayor, anything? Yes, I attended and uh, would recommend it to everybody. Uh, felt like it was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Could probably do it all again. <laughs> but um, highly recommend it, and I think it can help us to bring things back to our community more. Thank you. And, and I would only add that um, if you have any suggestions on how to improve, please let us know. We're always looking uh, for different things that we can, can change and make it better. I would recommend a dictionary for all the anacronyms. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I would agree with that one. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I thought it was great as well. Yeah, I was there too. So, um, what I, I thought was very well is the facilitators did a great job and they had a lot of knowledge. And I think I'd gone to one a couple years ago, a little bit different, and it was more book work. So, you didn't really, you know, if you really, it was tough, I thought at that time. And it was interesting, but I think I got more out of this one because of the facilitators. And they really drilled down into, you know, we had people from all over the state. So you were able to see how people were doing it differently. And, and again, what all the different uh, MPO, TPO, and everything was interesting. And plus, the people were good and really just got to know some different people around the state. So that was definitely worth it. And I almost wish that one would have been another day because we could have got drilled down in more information. So good. it was very good. So. Well, I appreciate all of you that were there and any that are new to the MPO that's not gone, you really should try to go next year because a lot of it is about the different funds that are available and how to go about qualifying. So it's good, good information. And uh, Mr. Executive Director, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. All right. Thank you very much and great report. Uh, we'll now move on to item five, consent agenda. Mr. Hutchinson will read the title of each for the record. Yes. And... Um, there's change to one item. The consent agenda um, consists of um, approval of the minutes from the Charlotte County Punta Gorda and Sarasota Manatee MPOs joint meeting from January and the most recent Sarasota Manatee Re MPO regular board meeting minutes of March 27, 2023. Under appointments, committee appointments, and reappointments for the Citizens Advisory Committee, the only appointment that remains because of a procedural matter I, I will explain is um, the um, Island Transportation Planning Organization's representative to the Citizens Advisory Committee um, um, and the other CAC representatives, some of which covered um, Bradenton and Manatee County and um, City of Palmetto and City of Sarasota, we we actually did those have to go to those jurisdictions before they come to you for for your appointments, um, and somehow that didn't happen for those we we did not or we didn't hear back, um, so we're we're proceeding we'll we'll reprocess those 
and um, bring them back to you in September after the jurisdictions have taken act your action. Um, so Sarah Calhoun is the only CAC appointment, and the the other appointments are all fine. Um, you have, we have uh, transportation disadvantaged coordinating boards and bicycle pedestrian trail advisory committee meeting or com committees appointments. The um, transportation disadvantaged trust fund grant um, process involves new paperwork for the upcoming federal fiscal year as part of the consent agenda. There's an amendment to the Florida DOT Sarasota Manatee MPO agreement um, due to um, a uh, rec um, rectifying the actual amount of funding received, which was slightly different than the current agreement, so that agreement gets amended. And the same thing with the Unified Planning Work Program. Um, the agreement um, adds about 200 and seven thousand one hundred twenty-five dollars um, net, and also there's a procurement document related to eco interact eco interactive software, which is uh, a software that is going to be used for the prioritization process update and the mapping of the transportation improvement program. And there's documentation on that in the packet. And that consists of the consent agenda if the board um, opts to approve it. Okay. Um, do we hear a motion to approve as stated by Mr. Hutchinson? So moved. Second. All right. So we have a motion by Commissioner Ball and a second by Mayor Bryant. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, uh, all signify in favor by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, carries unanimously. All right, next we'll move on to item 6A. It's a statewide transportation improvement program. Um, and that's gonna, and, and the transportation improvement program. So STIP and TIP, and it's gonna be presented by Victoria Peters from FDOT or Ryan Brown. That will be me. Uh, Victoria, like you said, Pam is now <laughs> filling in uh, as, our, as our permanent liaison. Uh, so Victoria is back into her role as a supervisor and, and we really appreciate all of her help over the past few months, uh, keeping us on track. Uh, so for you today, we've got two STIP TIP amendments. Um, both uh, region-wide projects, if you will, added by uh, DOT here quite recently, one in Manatee County, one in Sarasota County, and it's for the statewide uh, transportation roadway system uh, for rumble strips. So you'll see in there there's approximately $5,000 in each county to address uh, center line and lane departure on roads with speeds higher than 50 miles an hour on the state roadway system. Um, so those projects are being moved into the work program in the current year. And with that, I will take any questions or comments related to that. Uh, and we're looking for a vote of approval of those amendments. Okay, any questions? Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve? I'll make the motion. Okay, and is there a second? Second. All right, we have a motion by Mayor Bryant, second by Commissioner Ball, and this does require a show of hands. So any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Passes unanimously, thank you. All right, moving forward is 6B, performance measure targets for infrastructure condition PM2 and system performance PM3, and now here is Ryan Brown. Yes, yes sir. Uh, so for you all today, uh, we also have our uh, performance measures two and three as related to infrastructure condition and system performance. Um, as mandated by Federal Highway, Federal Transit Agency, and, and DOT. Uh, DOT set their targets um, a few months back, and we're required to either create our own targets for these two performance measures or support the state. Uh, given that these uh, performance measures mainly only relate to the state road facilities, we elected to um, support the state's targets uh, as provided in the um, presentation uh, that DOT provided to us as well as the memo that we will be providing uh, following your vote um, for those performance measures. Um, I will state they are fairly conservative. However, these are statewide targets. Um, we are performing much better than what is being anticipated here as a target in 23 and 25. Um, however, we do uh, 
tend to support our, our partners at FDOT, and we look forward to supporting them with these performance measures as well. Um, like I said, this is a mandated um, federal highway mandate for MPOs across the state as well as DOT. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Um, this helps keep us kind of on track and making sure that we're meeting our system performance targets across the board. Okay, thank you. Question, Commissioner Rowe. Yeah, thank you for that. What is our percentage here? In there? Uh, if you look um, at some of these targets, so the statewide targets are, are if you look down 23 and 25 uh, in terms of good, um, poor, and um, some of those things are our, our good conditions around 90%. Um, the state's targets around 60. So I would say we're performing much higher, much higher than that. Similarly, with uh, level of transportation reliability, uh, that's their targets 75 and 70. Ours is hovering around 85. And I would anticipate probably carrying that through. So we're, we're performing better than, than the state average. And then uh, we prioritize some of those uh, bridges as well. I think Correct. Kuhn Key is one of them, should be. Correct. Okay. Yep, the bridges as well. Um, there's in that presentation provided. They just also do tra transit asset management. We also do safety on an annual basis. These are done in two year and four year um, um, target selection. So they all kind of follow their own their own separate timelines. Um, but yes, we do we do transit asset management um, and as well as bridge performance as well um, under that. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. And, and um, do I have a motion for MPO board endorsement of the performance measure targets for PM2 bridge pavement and PM3 system performance? So moved. Second. All right, thank you. By Commissioner Rojo and seconded by Mayor Bryant. Any further discussion? Um, and this one does not require a show of hands, so it's all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, moving forward. Next is item 6C, fiscal year 2023-24 through 27-28 transportation improvement program, TIP, and this will also be presented by Ryan Brown. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're back again every, every May. Uh, we bring back to you our transportation improvement program um, for, the, for the next five-year cycle. Um, during this update process, MPO staff uh, reevaluates the criteria such as the project priorities, the system performance that you just saw, um, and updates the document. Um, basically, if you, if you look at this, it, it, it provides the background information and describes how these projects are then programmed into the statewide TIP, um, as well as our TIP. So these, these projects are, like I said, for the next five years from 23-24 to through 27-28 and are representative of the priorities in the process that, that we carry out um, that's based on federal mandate. Um, of course, we've set that out for a 30-day public comment period, as well as receive comments um, from, from local, um, from your staff as well, and, and provided direction on, on how we like to program projects and, and, and if there's any specific pro project questions or, or things that should have been programmed that need to be addressed. Um, the process that we went through just a bit earlier, the STIP TIP amendment process will continue throughout this um, next year after this, this TIP document um, is, is approved. There will also be a roll forward document in, in September that helps cover the crossing of state and federal um, fiscal years to make sure that no projects that are not programmed or not fully funded are not left in the previous um, transportation improvement program. Um, so with that, I will take any questions about the document itself or any of the projects that are that are included within. Any questions? Seeing none, um, do I have a motion to adopt the FY 23, 24, 27, 28 Transportation Improvement Program, the TIP, T-I-P? I'll so, make the motion. Sorry. All right. All right. And a second. second. All right. Thank you. We have a motion by Mayor Bryant and seconded by Commissioner Neuter. Um, is there any other discussion? Hearing none, um, this is a show of hands, so please raise your hand. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, carries unanimously. All right, next, moving on to item 6D, <clears throat> Joint Transportation Regional Incentive Program, TRIP, T-R-I-P, Project Priority List. Presenting this item again, Ryan Brown. Thank you again. Um, so this list is kind of another another project list that, that funds a specific fund code, Transportation Regional Incentive Program. 
Um, we have two agreements with, with local MPOs, both with Charlotte County and Polk TPL. Um, currently, uh, we, we have two separate agreements, one with Charlotte being that um, we rotate and the project that stays at the top of the list stays there until it is funded. Um, with Polk TPO, it's a little different. Uh, those projects rotate um, on an annual basis um, until one of those projects gets funded. If they do get funded, then they remain in that position until it is fully funded. Um, this is kind of how it's been done in the past. Um, however, we'd be happy to open agreements or discussions with uh, either TPO or MPO to determine a better way to address how we fund these projects. I, I will say that this is roughly about $8 million district-wide, so over you know, numerous MPOs in District 1, not a lot of funding dedicated to TRIP at this time. However, I do understand that we want to make sure we are evenly and accurately represented across the board and making sure that we're getting our fair share of these funds. Um, so with that, um, the list is presented by direction from your staff um, as well. So if you've got any questions about these lists, we'd be, we'd be happy to, to address those. Commissioner Ball. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, my, my question, Ryan, is, uh, you know, we only, Manatee County only has one item on the list on trip. Um, Moccasin Wallow Road, and I know that, um, you know, when we look at it, it is the number one priority between us uh, with Manatee, Sarasota, and Charlotte County, but I'm a little concerned about Polk because, you know, if it alternates with Polk, does that affect us? Just in case any trip money should come available, how is that going to affect Manatee County, considering that Moccasin Wallow has been on there now for a yep. while? I mean, we're, we're still waiting, hopefully... Mr. Interim, for some money for this project. So, um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Do we need to look at that? Sure. And, and I, change how that's done with Polk? I, I, I think so. Dave and I have talked about it a little bit, and I think we have requested, and we've a meeting with Parag, the director of Polk TPO, and, and also to kind of look at a, a report from, from DOT on a fair share analysis over the last 10 years or so yeah. um, in terms of, of trip funding. That's kind of our first steps in, in, in addressing this to make sure that, like I said, we're, we're you know, meeting either the same amount or, or you know, we're at least on an equitable basis with, with Polk to make sure that we're not losing out on any funds. So those are our kind of first steps to make sure that that's the case. Yeah, I, I'm a little surprised. I mean, not to take anything away from Polk County. It's a great county. <clears throat> uh, love them and support them. However, um, you know, I... I don't know that we're in the right environment here with Polk on this, but uh, yeah, if you could let us know, and is there anything that this board could possibly do to expedite it ourselves? Mr. Hutchinson? I, th I think the overall equitable aspect of rotating uh, the first place back and forth is, has been um, fair over time with Polk. Um, it's yeah, certainly been uncomplicated. The amounts of money that have been <clears throat> available through the TRIP program over the last 10 years has been not a lot. And um, I, I would ask uh, our interim secretary to, to comment on how the district determines which projects get funding. I know one of the projects a few years ago was River Road, and I don't think it actually ended up using the TRIP funds. Um, but that what benefited from would have benefited from the trip program had it no, remained no. a county project. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, is trip still? I guess it's still alive, right? We're still getting some funding through trip. <laughs> yeah, trip is still alive, but like you mentioned, and compared to a lot of our programs, it's not a large program, and we do our best to rotate that funding from county to county to try to be fair and equitable in the distribution. I'm not aware of any inequities, but we can certainly review that. Also, um, Wayne Gaither is at the podium. He may be able to offer some additional thoughts. Mr. Gaither. Uh, Wayne Gaither, Ford Department of Transportation. Um, I wish I could have said it that well, <laughs> so I'm glad that you took over on that one. Um, no, the, there's not a lot of money uh, in the TRIP program, uh, as uh, Ryan uh, had made mention, uh, and it is utilized in uh, basically across the entire district. So we've got... If we're lucky right now, we have around a $9 million uh, bucket to use from. Uh, over the past couple of years, I think we were uh, somewhere between seven and nine trying to find projects. So that gets tough because a lot of the projects that come our way are looking for significantly more funds than that 
uh, and it's uh, spread between both the uh, the more fluent um, uh, counties as far as population and funds go, as, as well as some of the uh, smaller counties that we have that have got smaller projects, but also smaller budgets to work with. So, thank you. Any other comments? I don't feel any better. <laughs> we'll do some more follow-up and report back at the next meeting on on the history and uh, the you know advisability of trying to open up the process with Polk TPO. The Charlotte is is probably time to update that agreement as well. Although that agreement is based on um, ultimately trying to achieve a one third, one third, one third funding for each of the three counties involved, which is very generous to Charlotte, but um, a lot of their projects um, presumably, you know, have some benefit to Sarasota County and to our part of the region as well. Um, you know, they're about one fifth or less of the of the population of Sarasota Manatee and Charlotte counties combined. I think I was I was on this board um, with Charlotte County when we talked about River Road and how important it was. So, um, you know, I think Manatee Sarasota we've we've certainly we're good partners with Charlotte, absolutely, and we try to always support them and however they need. But this thing with Polk, I was just surprised to see that we were put down in that list, so. Well, when they started the TRIP program, in order to be eligible for the funding, you you had to have an interlocal agreement with another MPO. And that gave us one more bite at the apple, so to speak. Um, and, and it could benefit projects in both Sarasota or Manatee counties. But, um, you know, it, it, it really was a, a chance to leverage the relationship with Polk and the chairs coordinating committee, uh, most of the other, all of the other MPOs in that um, Suncoast Transportation Alliance are in District 7. So it gave us another chance, at least every other year, of having a number one uh, trip ranked project um, for District 1's consideration. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments? So we need a motion for the MPO board approval of the 2023 joint trip project priorities list with conversation noted. Like that. So do I hear a motion? Second. All right. We have a motion by Commissioner Ball, second by Chairman Van Ostenbridge. Any further discussion? Hearing none, um, we'll just take a yes vote. If you're all in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Carries unanimously. Thank you. Now, Ryan's done, so thank you, Ryan. Um, the last action item is 6E, which is the Sun Trail Preferred Alignments. Here to present is Franco Saracino. Good Welcome. Morning. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Franco Saracino with the um, with Kittleson Associates, uh, and we uh, were lucky enough to help uh, the MPO staff with um, these two trail alignment studies. Um, so um, I've got a little bit of background to share with you today, and then I'm going to walk you through um, the process that we went through to identify alternatives, evaluate alternatives with our recommended uh, two alternatives for the two respective studies. So starting with some background, um, the shared use non-motorized trail program uh, of course, is an FDOT funding program. Uh, historically, they've allocated about $25 million per year statewide uh, to fill gaps in the statewide system. Uh, the good news is that number has increased uh, via some legislative action uh, uh, this year. Um, so that's good news. Uh, to get some of that money, though, we need to identify um, a location for paved multi-use path that is a local priority that has a local commitment to maintenance of the facility once it's built. And of course, it has to be uh, added to this map, which is, which is sort of the official Greenways and Trails map uh, managed by the Office of Greenways and Trails. So to identify the best location for these two important segments, one somewhere in the vicinity of Manatee Avenue, the other in the vicinity of Fruit Mill Road, uh, we define these broad study areas in order to look at a variety of, of potential options um, our methodology began with the identification of study objectives uh, that would guide the entire process. 
Uh, we did extensive existing conditions analysis, looking at safety data, accessibility data, existing activity data, and, and many other data sources that would inform both the identification and the evaluation of alternatives. We had a robust stakeholder and public involvement process, uh, did two online surveys for each study, uh, as well as a public workshop for each. Uh, the technical evaluation is where it all sort of came together, uh, of course, to evaluate alternatives and pick the best ones. And then, of course, we did two field reviews uh, because there are issues and opportunities not born in the data, so it's always important to go out in the field and, and take a look at what's out there. So the study objectives, um, and they're the same for both studies, uh, we identified six objectives. Uh, the first, of course, is to increase safety for bike ped. Uh, the second, improve accessibility. And what I mean by accessibility um, is access to opportunities. Let's make these trails part of the broader transportation system. Uh, the third objective uh, in the same vein, improve access to public transit. Again, making it part of an integrated system. Um, of course, we have an equity objective uh, to increase transportation options for our disadvantaged communities. Uh, the fifth is cost efficiency. Uh, so finding where the available right-of-way is to minimize the need to acquire right-of-way. We all know how expensive that is. We want to try to avoid it. And then finally, accommodate all potential users. Uh, we've learned from the Legacy Trail and other trails uh, that there's a wide variety of user groups. So let's find the place where we can build the, 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 the widest possible trail um, in the future in case we need to widen it. Uh, so those are our study objectives. Um, as I mentioned, we did two surveys, um, uh, one for two surveys for each study. Uh, the first survey, and this is combined for both Fruitville and Manatee, uh, the reason is that the results were very similar. Um, we reached about 500 people in total with this survey, um, and, and really it was designed to really understand people's biking and walking habits, so we understand what our travel market is, who we're serving uh, with these trails. Clearly from the distance and frequency uh, results, we're talking to the more avid among us of, of bikers and, and, and walkers. Uh, but a couple of things I wanted to point out, uh, one of the things that we asked in the survey um, is purpose. Why do you bike and walk? What, what do you do when you're biking and walking? 93% um, of respondents said exercise and or recreation, with only 7% saying they, they bike and walk to get to places uh, rather than drive their cars or take transit. But we also asked people why they don't walk and bike more. 27% um, of people cited safety as the reason they don't bike and walk more. Another 50% said there's not enough infrastructure. But then 17% specifically said the infrastructure is not there for me to get to where I need to go. So clearly there's some latent demand out there to use biking and walking modes of transportation to get to places. Um, and the hope is that, and that's why we have that accessibility objective, and the hope is that we improve that through these and other projects. Um, so I've got a few slides on each of the studies, very brief and high level, um, starting with Manatee, just to kind of show you what the alternatives were that we identified and how we evaluated them. So we identified five alternatives for the Manatee Avenue study. Uh, the first in the upper left uh, is primarily aligned along 18th and 17th avenues, pretty far to the south of Manatee. Uh, alternative two is basically a straight shot down Manatee Avenue. Alternative three on the west side of the study area is aligned along First Avenue primarily, then it crosses Manatee and heads the rest of the way along Ninth Avenue. Alternative four um, is primarily aligned along uh, 11th um, Avenue to the south and then crosses Manatee and goes up to the river and follows Riverview Boulevard. And finally, alternative five is aligned along 11th and Ninth Avenues uh, to the south of Manatee. So when we evaluated those alternatives, we looked at them through a variety of lenses using a variety of data. The gray part of this bar chart represents uh, nine measures of effectiveness tied very closely to the study objectives. Um, and against those, alternatives one and two uh, scored the high, highest for, for different reasons. Alternative one, because of the available right-of-way. Alternative two, because of the accessibility benefits of putting the trail on Manatee. Uh, but then we looked at a variety of other things. So the purple portion of this bar chart represents 
the existing bike pet activity. It's labeled streetlight because that's the, the where we purchased the data to, to do the analysis uh, to do this analysis. So for for existing bike pet activity within a quarter mile, alternatives three and five are the highest performing. Uh, the red portion is public preference, uh, and the public clearly preferred alternative four, uh, with one and five uh, coming in second. And then we looked at total distance to represent cost efficiency uh, and directness um, as a measure of usability, right, in terms of wayfinding. And there's also safety benefits of the straightest possible path. Uh, so all told, uh, alternative two does score the highest. Again, that was the Manatee Avenue alternative. Alternative five comes in second in terms of the overall score. Uh, and we are recommending alternative five as the preferred alternative. Um, Alternative two is problematic. Not everything is in the data, but as you can, as I'm sure you can imagine, um, the available right of way along Manatee Avenue is a big issue. There are also safety concerns. Uh, so for those reasons, we are recommending alternative five. Again, that's the alternative uh, that goes down to 11th Avenue um, and then jogs up uh, to 9th Avenue and is, and is a pretty straight path that, uh, that is pretty close to Manatee Avenue. So you still get some of those accessibility benefits. So switching to the Fruitville study, again, a even bigger study area for Fruitville, we looked at a variety of alternatives, initially developed six alternatives, um, and through our advisory group, we, knit, we whittled it down to four that we took through the rest of the process. So alternative one in the upper left um, is primarily along DeSoto Road and University Parkway, connecting to Payne Park uh, via Bradenton Road and Shade Avenue. Alternative two in the lower left uh, finds its way to Bobby Jones via 8th Street and 12th Street, kind of meandering its way to Bobby Jones, then traverses Bobby Jones Golf Course, 7th Street, 17th Street Regional Park, finding its way to, to Nathan Benderson, uh, and then along Lakewood Ranch Boulevard and Blue Lake Road the rest of the way to Lorraine. Alternatives three and four are variations on alternative two, uh, with the key difference being that they start at the Legacy Trail and follow uh, city and county easements up to Bobby Jones um, instead of going all the way to Payne Park. And then the key difference between alternatives three and four um, is that three traverses Bobby Jones and 17th Street Regional, whereas alternative four sort of skirts the boundary using the Circus Trail and Circus Trail Extension. So those are the four alternatives that we, that we took through the process. Um, as you can see, alternative one overall scores highest. Uh, but as you can also tell, that purple part of the bar chart is really uh, skewing the scoring. Um, and again, that is the existing bike pet activity within a quarter mile of the trail. And a caveat on that is that it doesn't pick up potential demand for the trail once it's built, right? So this is just existing activity. Uh, but if you look at alternatives three and four, they have much more balanced scoring uh, across all of the criteria that we used um, and clearly are preferred, uh, our preferred alternatives uh, um, in, in terms of public preference and so forth. So we are recommending alternative three um, as the preferred alternative uh, for this corridor. Um, and again, that is the alternative that starts at the Legacy Trail. Um, follows city and county easements up to Fruitville, traverses Bobby Jones Golf Course and 17th Street Regional, uh, then follows 17th um, and Honore up to um, the Florida Power and Light easement, making its way across that to Nathan Benderson and then all the way out to uh, Lorraine Road via Lakewood Ranch and Blue Lake Road. Um, so those are our two recommendations for your consideration. Um, and that's all I have for you. Uh, today, happy to right. answer any questions. questions. Anything, Dave? Yes, I, I would. I'd make a comment that the, this study does definitely, um, you know, it, it lays the groundwork for the next round of studies to then get move into design and construction um, using state and federal funds. It does not mean that many of the alternatives that were included shouldn't also have, um, you know, locally produced bicycle and pedestrian facilities on them. And uh, so, and and in in some cases, there are studies underway or studies that have been done recently 
that will lead to those types of projects. Um, these are studies that have to, you have to have the support of the local jurisdiction. That's really important. So we've worked closely with your staffs to develop these alternatives to then move us towards the next step. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mr. Chair. Yes. I'll, I'll make some comments. Thank you. Thank you. I, I know you've put a lot of time and effort into this. And, and I am a biker. I don't know if any other anybody on this board, aside from, from me, is, uh, has gone through that, that trail. Um, and the fact of the matter is that until we expand Fruitville Road, I mean, I probably once every two months I get a flat tire because of just the number, of the, the amount of debris that is in there. And it's also really not safe. Uh, but um, uh, whereas that the, the proposed alternative three, which I support, I, I encourage everyone to support, um, has less traffic. And I do go through there. I don't get to go through Bobby Jones, but I go to 17th. And that's a beautiful trail down 17th. Even right now, just as is, um, you go down by, by Honoré and 17th, you go all the way down there. And there are some... Um, I don't know how you plan on on uh, on cutting through to uh, Nathan Benderson Park, but there are some roads already used by people that if you use Google Maps, it'll show you which way, and, and it's it's kind of primed for uh, having a bike trail there. It's already used by bike trails and, and cars, kind of just uh, informally. Um, but uh, anyway, great job. I think it's going to be a great plan, and I'm looking forward to biking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor Coker? Yeah. Um, with regard to the Bradenton, a lot of that is going through some residential old neighborhoods. How are you going to identify those the bike lanes going through some of those residential areas? Well, technically, it won't be a bike lane. It'll be a separated paved path, separated from the roadway. Um, and my understanding, working with Ken Clayback and others with the city, um, is that a lot of the residents in that area have been asking for sidewalks, they've been asking for multimodal infrastructure improvements. Um, and so there will likely be on the 11th Avenue portion, uh, some roadway reconstruction that will need to happen uh, to get a trail in there. But um, yeah, there will be a separated path. And you have a bridge too, sure. don't you? Yeah, over the creek? Mm, yep. Up a yep. Okay. Mm. All right, any other comments? So we're at the point where we'd want to, if uh, we have a motion for the adoption of the real uh, recommended alignments, and obviously the TAC and the CAC recommended it, and uh, so recommended action is approval. So is there a motion? So moved. All right. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. All right, we have a motion by Commissioner Orohu and a second by Commissioner Smith. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries unanimously. Thank you. Moving forward, next is a presentation. We will start with the MPO report, 7AI Long Range Transportation Plan, LRTP. Resilience, resiliency Study Phase 2, Ryan Brown is back. Yes, thank you all. Um, so as you know, we've been, we've been working quite diligently on quite a few studies. We've got three underway, and now Franco's helped wrap up one of those. Um, and we anticipate starting three more here um, as the fiscal year kind of shifts here in June going into July. Um, with, with that, one of these studies will be a, a phase two of the resiliency study that you all helped adopt back in January. And we had some great discussion regarding some of your concerns and things that you'd like to see included uh, further as resiliency becomes more of a, more of a topic with, with some of these storm events and things like that. So we've gone ahead and, and started the process. I want to just inform you a little bit about what we've done in terms of beginning the scoping process. Um, we do anticipate getting funding for this effort um, early in July uh, with the help of DOT and getting that, those, those funds programmed for this purpose. Um, so just a little bit of a, you know, a, a, you know, a background. We, we did go through the process, rate facilities based off of criticality and vulnerability, and created a long tiered list of viable segments uh, throughout, the, throughout the region. However, we know that this is extremely expensive, and we do need to take some more time and, and look a bit further into 
you know, maybe a top 10 or 20 of these types of facilities that we can really dedicate our state and federal funds directly to, uh, to make it a little bit more reasonable and kind of have a, a measures of effectiveness, if, if you will, on these types of projects. So, you know, one of the first uh, concepts in this phase two will be a, a refinement of the project list, um, as well as um, looking at, you know, potentially a top 10. We are in the process of updating our um, priority project prioritization process right now and including some new resiliency measures in that as well. Uh, so that's kind of the first part is, is further refinement so that we can dictate where our funds need to go. We currently have a $3 million boxed fund for resiliency projects in the long range transportation plan. Um, and we will look at, you know, further discussion on that as we um, somehow already are coming up on the, the the 2050 LRTP, which will be kicking off later this year. Um, so that'll be a two-year process, and these each of these studies will will likely be a foundational element in in the 2050 LRTP. So mentioning that, um, the CFP will have, of course, a cost feasible element in it as well. So this will help feed the the cost feasible element of the 2050 LRTP and kind of help define some of those a bit better. There will also be a lot of ongoing coordination with the SCTPA, other MPOs, as well as some regional resilience coordination. Um, we've had you know, the, the privilege of attending several um, Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council summits, uh, as, as well as um, other statewide events regarding resilience um, and looking at ways that we can help work together to prepare data, understand it a bit better. Um, as well as some direction from the state and even federal level, looking at some some tool suites and things to better evaluate the cost benefit analysis of some of these projects. So really, that's that's all I have. I wanted to give you an, an update and a back, some background on that. Of course, if you've got any comments, we'll um, be happy to hear them, take them into consideration as we start building out this scope. We will be sending that out uh, once we have a draft of that available. So with that, I'll, I'll take any questions. Commissioner Ball. Ryan, it's not really a question. I just wanted to say thank you. I serve as chair on the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, and Dave was actually there on a panel, and I know you were there, and I just wanted to thank both of you for your attendance. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize the word resiliency really means how fast can we recuperate from a disaster. It's not just about climate change or sea level rise or any of those issues. It's, it's really how do we feed our citizens after a major disaster, et cetera? How do we keep our roads open? How do we get gas, et cetera? So thank you for uh, you both being there, taking the time to go, and being a part. It was much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to under the MPO report is the Destination Zero Safety Update with Nina Venter, MPO. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm here to deliver a Destination Zero safety update. Um, I will present some of the most recent crash data that we have available. We'll look at the past five years and the most recent data for 2023, and then also give a quick update on um, some of the Destination Zero action plan activities that the MPO has been um, engaged in. Thank you. Um, so as you all know, the MPO, um, MPOs are required to adopt safety targets annually. In January of this year, this board adopted safety targets of zero for each one of our performance measures. The number of fatalities, fatality rate, number of serious injuries, serious injury rate, and then also the non-motorized non -motorized fatalities and serious injuries. Um, targets of zero are consistent with the statewide safety targets set by FDOT um, and also demonstrates a very clear commitment to eliminating deadly and serious injury crashes in our two county area. Um, nevertheless, the MPO continues to monitor um, crash data to see how close and how far away are we from our goal of zero. So the data that I have on this slide um, represents crashes from 2018 to 2022, and I'm going to ask you to focus on the five-year average. Um, so on the five-year average for that time period, total crashes on all roadways um, were about 21,113. Of that total, 125 were fatalities, and 1,107 people were seriously injured. Um, based on that data, 0.6% uh, of all crashes resulted in one or more fatality, and 5.3% of all crashes resulted in one or more serious injury. 
Based on um, recent changes on how crash data is made available, um, crash reports are publicized only um, six months after they have been available. So the most recent data that we have is up into March. And so the data that I present here are for January and February. The data in the chart are comparing those two months across the time from 2018 to 2023. Um, So, so far we are seeing the greatest number of total crashes for the two month period in 2023. There were an estimated 4,092 total crashes of which 16 people died and 130 people were seriously injured. And then for non-motorized deaths and serious injuries in January and February, this is also the highest for the two month period. Um, 183 um, non-motorized users were involved in a crash. Of that, eight people died and 33 people were seriously injured. Um, and if you'll forgive me, I'm gonna go back to my previous slide because I forgot to talk about the non-motorized users. So for the five year period in 2018 to 2022, there were on average 738 uh, non-motorized users involved in crashes with vehicles. Um, 40 people um, were killed and 137 people were seriously injured. Um, based on that data, 5.4% of all crashes um, involving a cyclist or a pedestrian resulted in a fatality. And 18.6% of all crashes that involved a cyclist or a bicyclist resulted in one or more serious injury. So we continue to present these updates um, to keep the MPO sensitized to the issue of safety as a top priority and to ensure that we incorporate the issue of safety in the work that we do so that we can in the long run get to uh, zero serious injuries and fatalities in our two county area. Last year, the MPO board adopted the Destination Zero Action Plan and Policy. This is our safety initiative to get to the zero uh, fatalities and serious injuries. Um, and it's organized around a set of six strategies. And this includes engineering, emergency response, enforcement, equity and engagement, and education. In March of this year, the MPO kicked off a safety education um, campaign plan. Um, so over the course of the next year, we'll be working on developing an education campaign that we can roll out year after year and update year after year as focus areas change and as our um, safety issues change. So this safety education um, plan involves um, prioritizing education focused actions and focus areas. So we're reviewing existing safety education campaigns in the country to evaluate what will work for our MPO area, um, what can we adopt and incorporate into our education plan. We'll also update our crash statistics and trends, update our high injury network, and also work on a crash um, platform or dashboard that is public facing that will not only be useful for the MPO and our local partners, but that will also make crash data readily available to the public um, in a way that allows us to dive more deeply into the gr crash data on a granular, granular level. Um, we'll be producing the public education campaign that we can roll out across various platforms um, and then also doing a survey, engaging with our stakeholders. Um, we'll, we're developing a standard presentation that we will present to any audience that is willing to listen to us um, on the issue of safety. Um, and then we will be hosting a safety event at the end of the year that is open to the public. So as we are at the beginning stages of developing this education campaign, we posed this question to um, the committees leading up to this MPO board. Um, we wanted to know based on their observations and experiences, what specific safety issues should be integrated into the safety education plan. We went to the BPTAC, we got a phone call from an interested citizen, we went to the TAC, the CAC, the Destination Zero Advisory Group, and both the Manatee and Sarasota County local coordinating boards. Um, some of what we heard was that road safety is a shared responsibility of all road users, including drivers and non-motorized users. Um, 
Some of the major issues that came up were issues of reckless driving, speeding, and distracted driving, but on the mo non-motorized side, also using the existing infrastructure appropriately and understanding perhaps why it's not being used appropriately. Um, and that included issues of directionality, um, driving, uh, riding your bicycle on the wrong side of the road, and also um, mid-class mid-block crossings um, or not using the sidewalk when there is a sidewalk available. Um, we also heard from the committees and the advisory groups that a targeted education um, outreach was important. So looking a little bit more closely at the crash data at the granular level, exactly who is involved in crashes, where are these crashes happening, and how can we cater um, outreach to particular communities or areas. Um, we also heard about needing to do more outreach about um, safety infrastructure improvements, that if a roundabout were to go into an area, if a um, pedestrian crossing are to go into an area, to do more outreach into how exactly to use those infrastructures, and also to explain how they work and why they work. Um, and another major theme that we heard is the issue of education, um, and this is um, from K through 12. Um, the issue of including um, driver's ed courses in high school as a mandatory component was discussed by virtually every single one of these committees and groups, um, but also targeting roadway safety education to um, students before they even get to high school. So um, talking to folks in elementary school and in middle school as well. Um, and um, the last piece was to open up lines of communication to our visitors and tourists and also to um, new residents in the area to explain the existing infrastructure that we have and how to use them. Um, or for folks who are um, visiting the area to um, know exactly what our pedestrian safety laws are and um, how to be a safer member of the roadway. Um, so these are the activities that we, that we are um, working on now out of the Destination Zero Safety Action Plan. Um, so at this point, I am happy to open this question up to you all if you would like to discuss, um, but I'm also happy to take any questions that you might have on the crash data or on the safety education plan. Questions? Um, I'll start out. Um, you talked about, obviously, um, the bicycle, pedestrian safety and, and education. Um, obviously, FDOT a few years back came onto our Cortez Road, which is one of the the most dangerous roads, and put cr mid cross blocks um, from 26th Street to 41, and put six of them. And virtually, I don't think there's 50 yards in between any of them. And any of us in Manti County that drive that see more people not using them than using them. And, and I know we've had um, a couple of bicycle fatalities there recently that were not in the, the walk area. So, you know, it's kind of frustrating to our consumers out there that are saying, hey, put all these in and it's really not working, but it's, it's almost like you're in New York City in a short area and if the safety was working, you'd say, wow but it doesn't seem to be. So what are options and education? Because it, we, it didn't make it easier for most people riding their bikes there, you know, and unfortunately they pay the ultimate consequence. Absolutely. So two parts to that. I think on the one hand, um, part of this campaign also is to look at safety data um, post installation of these projects. So once those projects go in, um, how is it comparing to before those projects were installed? Um, so is there a safety benefit to those? Um, but those um, decisions are also also made with it with data. Um, but this is also part of the question, is understanding why, when the infrastructure exists, do folks continue not to use them? Um, and so doing this kind of outreach to explain why they were installed and exactly how they do improve safety and why they should use them and how they should use them will hopefully, in the long run, um, promote increased use of them. Um, so doing a targeted outreach to those types of locations, I think, will help um, residents in, in perhaps using them more. All right, thank you. Any other questions? All right, oh, okay, Commissioner Ball. I got one. Uh, just out of curiosity, I, I think what our chairman talked about is very important. Um, and you know, being on, on the board as long as I have, you realize that you can put things out there, but you, what's the old saying about 
Lead a horse to water. Lead a horse to water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kevin. You know, the bottom line is it's true. And so, you know, again, I think it goes back to education. And we get a lot of tourists in this town, um, you know, for, for a long time, and they're not educated. So I'm not sure what the answer is on that. But uh, I agree, one death or one serious injury is too many. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's, that's a tough job. So um, are, is DOT looking at anything to maybe further educate in some way or get the message out there, maybe some TV commercials that, you know, we could air or something like that? Because people just aren't getting the message. And we're getting more and more people moving here, of course, too you know, every month. So it's tough. It's a tough situation. Certainly. Um, and I can't speak for FDOT, but I, I do know that FDOT is engaging in some very interesting research. Um, and that research is transforming into sort of social marketing based advertisements and, and education campaigns. Um, we'll be uh, meeting with the FDOT safety office for District 1 in the summer um, to see how we can coordinate with them on getting some of that existing messaging out also. I yes, had a sir. feeling Wayne might get up to the podium. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have a lot of specifics to go into, but um, uh, we do have our safety coordinator who is getting uh, more engaged with the activities. He's, he's done a tour to meet with all the MPOs. Um, that's Keith Robbins, and he's working on uh, also with our central office folks on how we can better utilize the design portion of what's out there on our projects to make projects safer with a to pair them with an education component uh, we're finding that um, things such as roundabouts are extremely effective uh, but we still have uh, folks out there who are timid in getting into um, a roundabout uh, and what you know the design is is to remove the severity of the accident types that occur but um, it's it's the drivers that really have to to carry uh, the the weight of acting properly uh, along these roadways. Um, so there have been some PSAs that have been uh, put out, um, not through District 1, obviously, but through the state's central office. We are working on uh, a lot of pedestrian uh, notifications using crosswalks, how to use crosswalks. And um, it's my understanding, and I look for a thumbs up from John, that those efforts are continuing for the pedestrian side and the, the bicycling side mm -hmm. as we move forward on those. Um, I, I'll see if we can gather some more information on that and get that to your uh, staff, and then they can provide that to you as well, the specifics. Yeah. And, and I do want to mention uh, for Sarasota and Manatee, I'm sure, that Keith Robbins really has been going around and talking to everybody, and I think he's doing a great job. And, you know, it's, it's a tough subject. I mean, it really is. So that's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hutchinson? Um, the department recently... Um, held a speed management workshop, and all of you were invited. Some of you did um, attend, and we anticipate that they will be presenting more of those, and we'll keep you posted. Um, if you can't attend for a full day, I believe they they've set it up so that the first, you know, hour and a half is geared to elected officials, and they get more technical in the afternoon. Um, but it's um, it's like the MPOAC Institute um, training for MPOs. That that for safety is a very good tool. You know, we don't use speed bumps in Florida, especially on the state highway system. When we first saw the safety targets, um, you know, set or the um, the not the safety targets, but the pavement targets set a little bit lower than what we're used to. We thought, well, maybe they're gonna let the roads get, um, you know, bumpy and slow the cars down that way, but we don't really want them to do that. But in areas where there are lots of pedestrian activities, then um, we've got to, you know, try, try to manage speed somewhat. And I think that's what they're working on. Right, no, and I attended that and was there all day. And sometimes you look at an all day event but it again it flowed well it had great presenters and also the staff that was there from all the different areas really showed that you know how they can then bring back to the boards and and, and the commissioners and show it so that would that was a good thing so if you get a chance in the future and try to get to there for that and, and that's you know the, we're not going to get to zero with one solution it's going to take a lot of different um 
um, solutions working together uh, that'll make a dent in yeah. these crashes. No, so that was good. Any other questions? Wayne, did you have something else? Uh, yes, sir, if I could. Um, I did want to uh, make mention uh, to Dave and say thank you for the speed management uh, reference. That was fantastic. And that was a, we had that in multiple locations throughout the district. Oh, uh, and then one of the items that uh, Ryan actually talked about earlier, uh, where we are establishing the use of rumble strips to bring attention mm -hmm. to folks uh, in, in areas along the roadways. And that's to let them know about speed or or. Uh, their their uh, movement off lane. So in essence, we really are making the roads a little bumpier to make uh, people more aware of their actions on the roadways. Yes, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Just just comments um, because I think I saw this presentation last week, and you certainly have updated it in a very short period of time. Uh, incorporating the two subject matters, I just want to touch on uh, education for our young children driving out there on the roads. Uh, an education for our snowbird friends that come down every year that use our interstate and road systems. Um, I would also be interested in seeing if there's data in, in those crash numbers that incorporate individuals that are not full-time residents here of the state of Florida in our area, but are in fact from out of state. And with all due respect to them, it's okay. What I'm saying is how do we reach out to those individuals to provide them, how do you go into a two-lane roundabout? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, how, how do you how do you manage these things in a, in a safe and effective manner for the rest of us uh, that do live here year round? And we have the benefit of, of practicing. So I'd be interested in seeing what action plan um, would be somewhat deliverable down the road for our northern friends that come down and visit. And then also, again, for our kids. Right. And, and kids, of course, as they start 16, 17, they're just driving and they need to practice. But what tools do we have? What education delivery systems do we have to help them manage the stress that comes along with driving on an interstate road system, major road system, especially in season? So I, I would just be curious if there's some more granular data that, that might be available to myself because, um, you know, destination zero is certainly a very lofty goal. Um, but um, if we can educate people perhaps just a little bit more, I'd, I'd certainly be in favor of that. But thank you for your presentation again and updating it with all of our ideas. Wonderful. Thank of you. Of course, absolutely. Um, and absolutely, hopefully um, by the end of the summer, we will have more data to present to you out of this study. Um, at the conclusion of this implementation plan, I hope to have a point for every single one of these. Um, and yes, I think uh, an education-focused campaign is going to show change over, over the long run, but it's an important piece of the puzzle um, to support a culture of safety on the roadways. Remember. Thank you. Yes. Oh, I just wanted to comment. We, uh, of course, we're getting another roundabout in Palmetto, and so a question arose. And uh, I recall in the past that there is a link on the website, on the FDOT, our MPO website, and it links to some instructions on how to drive around the roundabout. So maybe we can, uh, we can link that and get it out to at least the adults and maybe, maybe through uh, the school systems in some fashion because it is very beneficial. I, as I shared it, I got a lot of feedback and uh, they were really, they thought it was really helpful. So um, that's the intent of it. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, just more from a, a, a general, we get so focused in different areas, but from a macro, I don't know, has anything been looked at that the incur it seems like there's so much emphasis put on getting everybody out of their cars and walkability and the wisdom of putting car pedestrians and bicycles so close to some of the major um, arteries. Like I'm glad that to see that you moved away from the Manatee Avenue for that trail. Um, so I just don't know, if, you know, from a big picture, how much consideration is given to maybe separating a little bit more from those major car arter arteries with the mm -hmm. alternate modes of transportation. Good point. Good point. Sure. Absolutely. Sorry, uh, Dave. That's a great point. And I think there has been a, a shift in transportation and engineering over the last 10 years where, um, and even among bicycling, you know, bicycle enthusiasts who fought hard to get a bike lane, um, there, there is a, a new willingness to consider separated facilities. There's a new commitment towards separated facilities from the state and from, from local jurisdictions as well. So, um, 
again, it's like speed management. The if you can change a few things that reduce the severity of of a crash, and separation is a big one, speed is a big one, then that's how we're going to make the difference. Good, thank you. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, listening to um, Commissioner Nunder uh, in education, uh, I'm wondering if there isn't a way to partner with the accommodation folks in the hotels. Um, uh, having gone recently to Orlando and stayed there um, and um, you know on the TVs in the hotel rooms um, right. they have a great deal of information and it wouldn't be a bad idea if, if we had a how do you drive a roundabout uh, mm. tutorial uh, for the folks that are visiting um, and, um, and, and just make them play it <laughs> But uh, I, I think it would be a, a real good idea. Thank you. Commissioner Moran. Thank you, Chair. I, I do want to take a, just a quick minute on this because um, I'm sitting in here, but I have a long time vested interest in this. As a matter of fact, um, Commissioner Hines is in the audience. And we sat in the um, Bike and Pedestrian Committee, I don't know, it had been 15, 18 years ago. But as far as education, I just recently went out of the country and where they drive on the other side of the road. Uh -huh. And I rented a car, and you could have put me through a master's degree. It wouldn't have helped going into that roundabout. <laughs> um, for real. Yeah, Talk about way. practicing. It was borderline horrifying. But, but to the point is, I hope we didn't lose sight of this. The original goal from this all the way back was to re reduce severity. Um, that's the goal. And so as far as information coming to this board, again, I'm sitting as a substitute today, but is, is it working? Is it truly working? The goal way back was severity. And so in some of that statistics that you bring about, making sure that we're truly measuring where this all started and where this all came from. Mm -hmm. But again, I get it. Education's important. I'm, I'm not um, slighting it. I'm just telling you, boy, it wouldn't have helped me a couple weeks ago for sure. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Chair. Now. Um, yeah, there's not enough alcohol in the world to get you through that for sure. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was absolutely horrifying. Like, maybe, maybe no, that, I will not be doing it again ever. Maybe that was your trouble, though. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Any other productive comments? Mr. Chair. <laughs> Mr. Chair. <laughs> Mr. Chair. <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, I would just, uh, while we're on the subject of safety and Destination Zero, um, at a future meeting, if we could have uh, sort of a comprehensive update on where we are on sidewalks on US 41 south of Cortez Road. Mm -hmm. um, it's obviously needed. Uh, it's probably the, the busiest arterial outside of an interstate in Manatee County. Mm -hmm. Certainly has to be one of the most dangerous roads and lacks sidewalks on yeah. both sides. So if we could have an update on that. I mean, the updates today were great, but you know, that's a pressing matter in Manatee County. Right. Well, well, I have one. I've got. Uh, there is a project I can. Wayne and I can provide it after the meeting as well. We we've been working with your lap folks uh, as well, local agency program, uh, and DOT. Uh, the MPO has kept one of those projects whole um, in terms of moving forward um, on US 41 from Bay to Cortez. Um, that is quite a substantial project at this point, requires substantial amounts of right-of-way, some utilities work, as well as uh, some of our SU funding to make that happen. It's about two and a half miles of sidewalk uh, that is currently underway. I can provide mile markers and, and, and dates, but that project, as far as we know, is, is fully funded at this point and is moving forward for construction. So there is at least a piece uh, at this point that is being moved forward for, for construction in that segment, which is, we, as we know, one of the most dangerous and, and most active um, pedestrian segments um, in Manatee County. So just one brief update. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on. Um, we do not have an FDOT report right now. So before we get into member comments, I'm going to ask Commissioner Ball to give kind of a, a little tribute and celebration of somebody that was great for us. All on this board, we all know that we lost a dear friend, co-worker, past senator, past representative, lastly a commissioner with Nancy Dietert. She, I had known Nancy before I ever got involved in politics. Uh, most of us, I think, probably that sit up here on this board knew Nancy. Um, and although we might not have always agreed, agreed politically, 
she was still always a dear friend. She didn't let politics get in the way of her friendships and her loyalty to others. So I would like at this time for all of us to stand in a moment of silence, please. Thank you. She'll be missed. Thank you, Commissioner Ball. And, and, and you made a, a, a perfect statement. Although you never always may agree 100% with somebody politically, you do uh, respect that they're willing to put themselves out there and, and be involved and, and take those shots at times. But when we're doing it for the good of the whole and our communities, that's what the most important is. Um, and I'm going to go first, if that's OK, since chairing it. Um, Dave, how long have you been with the MPO? Since 2011, so. Right, so I mean. 12 you, years? You, you celebrated all your staff, so we want to celebrate you, obviously, what you've done, and, and that's not too long after I came on the board, and, and uh, he came right in and have done a great job for us, so we appreciate that, and keep up the good work, and, and obviously, the staff is, is working together and getting a lot of things done for both our communities, so thank you. Any other board comments? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I was looking at him and... Does he want to go ahead? I've been called worse. Yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Van Austinbridge. I, I offered for you to go first. <laughs> Ladies first. <laughs> okay. Mayor Bryant. Thank you. Um, I want to I mention something um, because there are several uh, county commissioners here from uh, Manti County as, as, as well as ever, everybody else, but um, I want to mention about the DeSoto Bridge PD&E study. Uh, tomorrow, at 5 to 7, at the Bradenton Area Convention Center in Palmetto. And the reason I want to really bring it up specifically, there is a, a looming issue that I've probably talked about it for 12 years now. In fact, it has been 12 years about the um, entrance up onto the merging, up onto the highway, onto the highway to access the DeSoto Bridge. It's at the intersection of 10th Street and 41. So that being said, I, it is a tremendous problem going back to our last chief, our current chief. They're, they're very concerned about it. Our staff is very concerned about it, about merging up onto that area. And uh, because it, it bends back up around, and I'm not sure if there is an easy fix to it, but it's very dysfunctional now. And very shortly, we're going to be turning on the 7th Street Light at the convention center. So that being said, it's going to jam... It's going to jam right into that, and we're very concerned when we talk about safety and improving safety that we're setting ourselves up to fail right there. So I, I would really appreciate it to have a lot, a lot of uh, review of that by all the members to see where we could go and where we could go the quickest, because that's going to be a major issue in Palmetto and traversing that area. So I would really appreciate that, and it's on your... Um, it's on the signage that we've gotten, and the meeting is at 5 to 7, and it's both in person and virtually. And also, um, I think we have these, and it shows you a, a little bit better, but not quite as good a map, I'm sure. But I would really appreciate uh, some consideration uh, as we're looking at that pd and &E study. That would be tremendous. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Van Ostenbridge? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to piggyback off of the mayor's statements and, and sort of and add to them. Uh, I guess my comments are, are directed to the, the interim secretary. Um, the first time the DeSoto Bridge replacement came around, there was a lot of pushback on FDOT. It was from the community and from elected officials. There have been two elections since then, and FDOT now has a tremendous amount of support from the mayor of Bradenton, the mayor of Palmetto, the council in Bradenton, all seven commissioners of the county commission. We made some specific requests to Secretary Purdue, to Secretary Tebow, and to our district secretary regarding the process, how this would come forward. We, request, we discussed how it's a regional project and how there should be regional meetings. And unless I'm misreading the flyer, it says kickoff meeting, but there is only a virtual meeting mentioned other than the initial meeting. 
we implored upon FDOT to have meetings in Parrish and to have meetings in West Bradenton and Lakewood Ranch and in South County to include the Chamber of Commerce because you're dealing with a bedroom community in Parrish that's commuting south to jobs. So the Chamber of Commerce, in our opinion, has a say. We have a very active chamber, right? The Lakewood Ranch Business Alliance as well. And all of these folks who live up in Parrish, who are the ones who are on this road, who are making this commute, this is, this is we have a lot of projects going on in Manatee County. This is far and away the most crucial project in the county. And all of the local elected officials have, I didn't say all of us are supportive, but we've all reached out and the majority of us, the vast majority of us are supportive. We want to work with FDOT. We want to be partners with you on this. Um, but it seems that all of these attempts to work together have fallen on deaf ears when the first thing that comes out, we're told to, to, to stand back. It was the last direction we got from FDOT. And then what happens is a kickoff meeting is rolled out with zero communication with local officials. And it is completely contradictory to what the way we were asking for this to be rolled out. So I guess my question to you, sir, is, is you know, is this the only meeting? What's next? Um, you know, are we just to stand on the sidelines and is FDOT just going to do as they're going to do? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that we go to quite great efforts to coordinate, as you mentioned earlier, you had the Secretary of the Department of Transportation down here communicating, as well as the previous Secretary Tebow and District Secretary Nandum. There possibly could be some confusion because there's actually two separate PD&Es. There's one associated with the replacement of the Hernando de Soto Bridge itself. That existing four-lane bridge is scheduled to be replaced with another four-lane bridge in fiscal year 27. That has to have its own standalone PD&E, and that project will be delivered as a design build. There's a separate study going on, which is the Bradenton Palmetto Connector Study, which analyzes multiple different possible crossings of the Bradenton River to add capacity. One of many of those crossings, there's like nine or 11 different crossings being evaluated. One of those nine is also the same alignment of the Hernando de Soto Bridge. So whether that's ultimately chosen as a route or that in combination with another at-grade solution, maybe another two-lane bridge someplace else, or a completely different location has yet to be determined. Once that alignment is selected, then there will be another study to determine do you go down left, right, or center, and they'll evaluate impacts to businesses, community, and that type of thing. But the... Hernando de Soto Bridge will be replaced in fiscal year 27. The bridge is way past its uh, theoretical 50-year service life. It's something like 65 years old now. It's in a very aggressive saltwater environment, and we've spent more money on Band-Aids trying to extend the life, and after a while, you spend more and more money, and you get less and less return on the investment. There's a time the bridge just has to be replaced. So that study is ongoing. There will be a design phase going concurrently with that so that we can be sure we have a set of plans ready to let in fiscal year 27. If the Bradenton Palmetto Connector Study should happen to choose an alignment that is the same as the Hernando de Soto bridge replacement, that bridge will be designed in such a manner that it will not conflict or impede or have to be redone in order to accommodate the additional capacity. The bridge is, is proposed to be a four-lane bridge, but it'll have wide shoulders on the inside, wide shoulders on the outside, much like the typical section of the Ringling Causeway Bridge, which can quite easily, if that is chosen as the preferred alignment, could be restriped and made it into a six-lane bridge without having to cut the edges off or do anything crazy with it. If there's an option to put in an elevated, you know, concept, I know that was discussed some years ago, that could be constructed in such a way that is not conflicting with the at-grade new DeSoto Bridge. When you think about the bridge and you're going to put a new bridge in, you have to put a portion of the bridge alongside the existing bridge, then you take out the old bridge and build the rest of it. So the bridge can, has the ability to be offset or it could be split where you have a, a open space in the middle to allow for pilings 
for an overhead bridge to be constructed. There's lots of different possibilities, but I wouldn't want to try to predetermine what that might look like. We have a process through the PD&E that goes through the public comment period, and we do intend to be very wide-reaching all the way to Lakewood Ranch and the neighboring communities because obviously a project like that attracts a lot more regional traffic than just the replacement of the Hernando de Soto Bridge itself. So I hope that answers your question. No, you didn't even address the lack of communication or coordination with local officials at all. You discussed everything but. But I guess that, that does answer my question in the end, sir. Thank you. Well, if there's anything we missed, we'll certainly endeavor to do much better. There's no intent to uh, leave anybody out or not communicate with the locals. We'll definitely look into that immediately. Okay, thank you. So you could have started with that. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Ball. Ay, ay, ay. Um, Secretary Kibler, thank you for addressing it. And to be honest with you, I uh, didn't even realize and didn't even think about the fact that you're talking about two different things. Um, and I do understand the need to kind of come up with the plan that we're going to take for the road itself before we really talk about the bridge. And I, I, I can understand my um, fellow commissioner with his concern because we want to make sure that this time around that things are done together as a group because we do realize the need for the, the bridge being replaced. Um, so, you know, we realize that the lifespan is gone um, and we've got to get it done one way or the other. So I think we're all on the same page. We all want to work together uh, for the betterment of the bridge and the road. And it's just, you know, as I said, I, for one, uh, did not realize that you were really talking just about the road and not the bridge. So I thank you very much for your explanation. Thank you. And um, just to address it from my involvement over the last 10 years, you know, and this is more of a generational global thing for me because generationally that should have been something done 30 years ago with a, a, another bridge and there was opportunity, but for whatever reason, it got stopped by the local officials or it didn't get going down the right path because of some uh, probably a very small group locally that didn't want it. But now 30 years later, we're talking about it again because we have to do something. So I think it's important to all of us, especially Manatee County as a whole, that we make sure something is happening in a positive light. And, and I've been involved in a lot of the meetings where we did talk about, you know, the DeSoto Bridge replacement and then also the study of the corridors and all of that. But it, it more as a, a communication thing more than anything, I believe. And I think the way you explained what you just did was very good from the standpoint of the two projects. And also explaining that, you know, in government, sometimes we do things, we build something and then realize that we can't redo it because it's too costly to redo. And, you know, but you did explain that once the first part of it's done, even if the bridge gets replaced, there is opportunity with that structure to then turn it into something better that would give the opportunity for capacity. So I think that's an important message that we have to continue to get out. But I also think we have to make sure that this is done globally throughout the county because most of the people and the complaints we get in the city of Bradenton, our traffic is terrible. But most of the traffic isn't from the city of Bradenton downtown. It's coming north and south or east and west, and they're not stopping in downtown, but it's creating our issues. So again, more information, more contact, and I don't think there's been um, a purposeful situation, but I think we need to really try to get that out um, because we did have a chamber meeting where some of the information got out there and it didn't get out correctly with what you just said. Exactly. If you'd have said what you said at, today at that meeting, I don't think the angst would have been there. So, and I don't think it was anybody's fault. It was just, you know, an LK was supposed to be there, but being in Tallahassee is more important, I think, for all of us at this moment. So thank you, but, you know, it is very important, and we do have the uh, political wherewithal right now to keep it moving in our local municipalities and county. And so Mr. Thank Chair, you. if I could yes. dialogue with you real quick, that, that's at the root of my concern, mm -hmm. is that the, la the first time FDOT came into town, mm -hmm. uh, they were met with, with, like you said, a small group 
mm -hmm. but but very passionate resistance from a small group. And the the project is regional. It, it has impacts east, west, and north and south in the county. And that's why we felt it was so important that the next round replacement or whether it be um, whether the physical replacement of the bridge or the capacity improvements, either or, needs to be a regional discussion with with meetings in all parts of the county. And I feel like my frustration is that, you know, without communication with us, the FDOT, mm -hmm. after being warned, walked right back into Groundhog Day and they're having a meeting across the street from Riviera Dunes. And it's, it's going to be deja vu all over again tonight, as Yogi Berra would say. Mm -hmm. And that'll be that. We'll have one meeting. Everyone will come and scream and yell at them, tell them they don't want it. But we won't hear from Parrish. We won't hear from Lakewood Ranch. We won't hear from West Bradenton. We won't hear from the chamber. And and so I don't think that we are getting an accurate and any accurate feedback from our county. Not to mention Hillsborough. Right. And I think that if if you go through the, the process of what FDOT has to do, there is some legitimate processes that I understand from the first study has to be done for the replacement while going along with the other and you can't do one without the other and you can't get one too far ahead of the course because they have to be prepared for any challenges that come down the road so i agree with you on the standpoint of that we've got to make sure we make it globally but replacing the desoto bridge is going to happen but how do then we tie in the overall global part of the capacity and that's the important part sure but the point is we have to stay out in front of the messaging throughout the entire process right. and and we want to, you know we're mm -hmm. we're eager to f dot do that mm -hmm. but it feels like we've been excluded from the process round one right out of the gate it can easily be changed right. we're still their partners we want to help them right. no so. i agree mayor brown if i can make yes, one comment yes ma'am please take a serious look at that interchange because that is going to be a terrible conundrum so I, I know all of the players, the partners in this, um, that we have already experienced that. And uh, as we move forward, the 7th Street lights turned on, um, no matter the status of whatever else is going on in the study, um, there's going to be, it's going to need to have some modification of some sort. So um, that was why I wanted to bring it up here, because I know there's all these smart people that do traffic engineering. And... Uh, Maybe they can help get ahead of that, too, so it's not quite as bad an impact when you, all the other studies get completed. So thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Commissioner Van Ostenbridge? Yes, sir. I, I had another um, less intense sub uh, topic. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> um, so uh, the county commission in Manatee County, we, we have taken on an initiative to start sort of beautifying and streetscaping areas of the county. And it's gone really well and has been tremendous feedback from the residents of, as we've been doing it. Um, a few hurdles along the way. Um, we're able to move a good bit quicker than FDOT at times, and so uh, we find ourselves waiting on FDOT permits sometimes, and I'm, I'm hoping FDOT can help us to expedite those along the way. And then the other hurdle is the, the Palmasola Scenic Highway Committee that exists on Manatee Avenue from 75th Street West. Um, and that committee there were a series of five medians that we were working on between the causeway and 75th street and that was slowed down by three or four
Okay, welcome back, everyone. We're having a great day going through the budget. Finished our constitutional officers, and now we'll start going through some departments. Madam CFO Sheila McLean. Good afternoon, commissioners, um, county administrator, county attorney, citizens of Manatee County. We're back in this work session in the afternoon to come to continue with the discussion on department's budgets for the FY24 recommended budget. Today we will be going over um, the last final departments um, that in is inclusive of development services, information technology, property management, public safety, and public works. To recap on a little bit, um, we have I have mentioned last Wednesday is that the total budget for all the departments uh, is totals five hundred and thirty eight million dollars, inclusive of fourteen departments within the county. With that said, we're going to start with uh, development services budget. They have six six programs for a total of twenty five point four million dollars. With that, I leave you with Courtney DePaul, um, Deputy. County Administrator um, and Director of Development Services. You want me to run this? No, he's going to move it for you. Okay, perfect. Good afternoon, Commissioners, County Administrator, County Attorney. Courtney DePaul here, Deputy County Administrator and Director of Development Services. I'm here to present the decision unit summary for development services. We have a total of four desired decision units for fiscal years 24 and 25. So while they pull that up, Development Services has been working diligently to leverage technology as opposed to increasing staffing levels as demand has continued to rise. This is evidenced by this year's des desired decision units. Um, I did pull prior decision units from prior years since I'm, I'm fairly new, uh, joining in January of last year, and this is my first full budget. Um, and I wanted to, to just look at what was, was done over the past five years compared to what we're requesting today. And so um, the average over the past five years of desired decision units, um, the average request amount was 1.8 million. Uh, this year, my request is for 600,000, um, of which half is actually for special projects like the comp plan rewrite. So we'll get into that in a second. But I just wanted to start um, with sharing sort of um, that fiscal analysis. Um, the first desired decision unit is requesting $50,000 to hire a consultant to perform our community rating system, or CRS, verification in FY24. The community rating system, or CRS, was created to motivate communities to establish a floodplain management program that encourages floodplain management acti activities that exceed the minimum national flood insurance program requirements. This program provides communities with discounts to flood insurance rates, so that's why it's really important for the citizens. Um, and it currently in Manatee County, we provide a 25% discount, which is one of the best in our region. CRS recertification is performed annually by staff. We actually just got, um, we just got the email back that our recertification um, was accepted, which is really exciting for our staff, um, especially after Sandy um, retired last year. Uh, so the team, Jessica and her team, have done phenomenally well. But the CRS verification occurs every three years, and it's actually due in FY24. So we'd like to get a consultant to help with ensuring that a comprehensive look is, is taken on our floodplain management program to even see if we could get a higher rating, which would then result in a better discount to our citizens. So we're really hoping to, our goal is to get a 30% discount to the citizens. So that would secure that. Um, the second desired decision unit is requesting 50,000 in temporary employment services for our permitting section within the building division. So I'm not asking for any additional staff this year, but this is an integral part. So temporary employment is a great tool when permit demand unexpectedly increases, but then once demand stabilizes again, the temporary positions can easily be eliminated without having to go through any personnel issues or Im adverse impact. Um, as you may expect, permit demand is difficult to predict. I mean, we've seen that with the housing market. So it, it's one of the first indicators of a of either an increase or decrease or just you know a change in the housing market is when permit uh, permits slow or they um, accelerate. Um, 
In addition, permitting technicians are entry-level positions, and as such, there is a rather um, there is a rather high turnover rate. So just this last year, I looked from June to June, we had nine departures, which could be separations or termina- uh, or transfers, and 15 new hires, and we currently have five vacancies. So this is something that, while I've really worked to get hiring, hiring has been a, a priority of mine, um, we have still seen some of these higher vacancy rates in certain types of positions. And so this just would ensure um, with hiring temporary employees, we can bring them on much faster, evaluate their work performance. And if it's working out, they very oftentimes apply for permanent positions um, within our organization or even as a, per- as a permitting tech. So that's the second desired decision unit. The third desired decision unit is requesting 250000 in FY24 and 250000 in FY25 for a consultant to assist with the rewrite of the comprehensive plan and the land development code. On January 10th, 2023, the board made a motion to direct county staff to begin the procurement process to secure a consultant um, in formally rewriting the comprehensive plan and subsequently amending the land development code. This agreement should also include the ability for the city of Bradenton to piggyback uh, on shared services and the rate via the contract with the consultant. And the consulting fee is based, though, on a certain number of briefings, outreach, et cetera, and is dependent upon the board's guidance and direction. So our goal is to work through the comprehensive, ble- uh, comprehensive plan rewrite this fiscal year. Um, but again, that's dependent on really the board's comfort level, if they need more time or less time. But we planned for this year would be the comp plan rewrite in FY24, and then FY25 uh, would potentially be the land development code rewrite. Um, and then finally, the fourth and final desired decision unit is requesting 250000 um, for software support. So technology is such a critical part of the way that development services conducts business. And by leveraging new technology, we are able to meet that increased demand without increasing our manpower. And so that is all that I had for development services. Any questions for development services? Commissioner Baugh. I'm just teasing. All right, uh, Commissioner Satcher. Yes, sir. I just I, I appreciate the idea of, of getting some of those positions as temp positions. That's that's real clever, um, and makes a lot of sense with the nature of, of what you do and what those positions are, and um, helps you be nimble. And I appreciate you, you know, bringing that to us. I think I've heard in the past of temporary type positions and board never hearing about it. So I not this administration um, or even the previous one. But um, but anyway, I appreciate you bringing that to us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It doesn't fit all, um, but since they're entry-level positions, it's easy to get temp support in, and they're, they're quick to catch on. And we've actually seen a lot of success in our in our area with the temp services. So, Yeah, I, I agree with Commissioner Satcher, and I like his use of the adjectives quick and nimble, or clever and nimble, sorry, clever and nimble. All right, anyone else for Mrs. DePaul? Okay, thank you, ma'am. Next, we have information technology uh, with six programs for a total budget of $28.6 million. And with that, I leave you with um, <clears throat> Drew Richardson, Director of Information Technology. Good afternoon, Commissioners, County Administrator, County Attorney. Uh, Drew Richardson, uh, Director of Information Technology Services and I will present to you our desired units for fiscal year 24. So our first one is, uh, and there's kind of a a running theme here with um, efficiency gains and cybersecurity gains, right? So we're trying to enhance our cybersecurity posture. We certainly don't want to end up in the media like Oldsmar, some of these other cities that have been ransomware attacked, um, very negative. So we continue to move our cybersecurity posture forward. And so you'll see many of these items have an access to cybersecurity, and then others are more on the efficiency side, or, and some of them actually generate some cost avoidance in the out years, but require a little bit of upfront funding. So the very first one here is, is customer identity and management software. Um, identity is, you can think of it in its most simple terms as your usernames and passwords. That's how we identify someone is who they say they are, and then they can gain access to items. Um, you may be familiar with your, your banking account. You have a code they send you when you go to sign in, things of, those na- of that nature, which we have rolled out within the county. 
Uh, we're looking to expand that um, and continue more of our applications using the multi-factor authentication. Um, and then in, in the same in the identity space, there's another concept known as single sign-on or SSO, uh, where you just go click on a link to a given application and you don't have to sign in again. Your initial sign into your computer allows you into that application. So there's an efficiency gain there. Um, coupled up with the multi-factor authentication makes it more more secure and more efficient all in one. And then our next one is the cybersecurity response capability software. One of the things that we are seeing in the cybersecurity, particularly in the cyber insurance area, is the cyber um, insurance companies are requiring additional um, software services or solutions in order to even insure you or your rates are gonna go up or they may not insure you at all. And currently, while we have um, a pretty robust cybersecurity team, they're not capable of 24 by seven by 365 monitoring, right? We just don't have the staff for that. It would be cost prohibitive for us to hire around the clock staff to monitor that. So while we have alerts that may go off, if they go off at 3 a.m. on a Saturday, um, someone may not get that alert at that point in time. And so this next item is going to allow us to uh, respond. It would be a, a public partner, uh, public-private partnership uh, with a, an entity that would be able to pick up and respond to those types of alerts uh, during our off hours. Our next one uh, is a Adobe Enterprise Migration, and what this is speaking to specifically is our digital signature solution, uh, DocuSign. You may be familiar with. Uh, currently, the pricing structure uh, of our current vendor is, is kind of pricing themselves out of the marketplace. This is a project where uh, a 100,000 uh, and 24 and 100,025 would allow us to migrate off of it. Uh, the ROI on that is roughly 200,000 per year, so it would pay for itself in the out years within a couple of years. So that one actually generates cost avoidance or cost savings in the out years. Our next is a um, customer service center staff person. And just to give you a little idea of what our CSC is, it's a team of four people. Uh, we process about 22,000 phone calls per year, uh, 24,000 user tickets. And um, about 75% of our calls are uh, first call resolution. So those CSC folks are kind of the tier one. They intake the tickets. If it's a password reset or things like that, they go ahead and handle it. So 75% of those are handled. Um, so that's kind of the volume of work for that group of, of just four employees. Some of the statistics that would support the need for an additional CSC person, uh, we had 2,846 calls abandoned uh, within the last calendar year. Uh, our peak uh, call abandonment was 65 calls in one day. And if we ever have a, a massive system outage or response time, obviously that group gets fully overloaded. And you can imagine with just four folks, if you have one on vacation and then someone has an emergency, you're quickly down to two. And there's a real pinch point for them to serve um, all of our county. And a reminder, our CSC doesn't just serve BOCC. We respond to MSO, clerk, PAO, and other outages uh, where we provide support and information technology services. You guys just stop me if you, if you have any questions along the way. Uh, the next position is uh, a business relationship manager. Uh, we ascribe to um, a, a uh, what is referred to as ITIL or Information Technology Infrastructure Library. It is a common framework in the IT service industry. Uh, it was actually employed at the state of Florida where I came from running the state data center. Uh, our business relationship management team at the state of Florida for 37 customers was a team of five full-time employees. We have, including constitutionals here in ITS, approximately 20 customers. We do not have a single full-time BRM. What we have done in the county prior to now is tacked on this BRM role uh, to someone who has a full-time day job, highly technical folks, which makes it a real challenge because typically BRM folks have more in that customer service, building relationships with your departments, and it allows us to smoothly roll out pro projects um, and capitalize on opportunities as we move through IT projects, right? Certain things may not uh, come to the light if you don't have that great relationship and communication with your um, department. And so that is the intent with that group. And of course, as we're rolling out additional cybersecurity initiatives, having a strong BRM presence is gonna become ever more important. 
The next one is the One Solution Finance Enterprise. Um, this is basically just a, a software licensing upgrade. I think this one's 40000 if I remember correctly. I don't have the figure in front of me here. But um, the, one of the things that I wanted to mention with that, uh, if, if we don't upgrade our, our update our software, I don't want to say upgrade, uh, update our software, it becomes a cybersecurity risk over time. But with this piece of software as well, uh, MSO, Clerk, um, and obviously FMD are, are big users of this. So there are side benefits to our constitutionals to updating the software. Um, and then if we don't update it, it becomes a cybersecurity risk over time. And there's uh, intended to be some operational efficiencies in those entities that I just mentioned. And then our last one um, is uh, listed as a ShareWell software update. Um, ShareWell is our main uh, ticketing system within ITS. That's how we process and receive all of our tickets. Uh, the uh, product was bought out by another company known as Ivanti. And what Ivanti is doing is they have two threads of software, and they're killing off one to put all their efforts in the new one. Unfortunately, the version that we're using is the one that they're no longer providing support and updates to. So we need to investigate either the migration to their other product or a migration to an, a different vendor altogether. Um, and the, the, the dollars requested are for that replacement. And that is it from Information Technology Services. It's interesting, actually. Um, Commissioner Satcher and then Commissioner Baugh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm not sure if this is the time, if you're the person or not, but I'll ask you, and then we'll move forward. So I had spoken with um, with public safety um, and, and that group, and so they're moving forward, and basically I am uh, working hard to keep, I say working, I'm trying to set the policy that helps the people that are on the front lines um, to keep as many uh, of our resources, particularly ambulances, EMS, on the road as possible. One of the things they said that they could really use is a dedicated IT person because if an ambulance has a technology problem and it could be fine besides that, it sits there until we have one of our IT people to go take a look at it. Is that in this budget on your side? Would it be on their side when they come before us or... Um, it is not on our side. Um, we do have uh, an individual that caters to the public safety group more so than anyone else, but he is not full-time dedicated to them. Um, it, it, we could certainly take a look at ticket response times and things of that nature with regards to the support of their vehicles. So. Okay, yeah, I, I think, you know, depending on, on what we hear from them, but uh, I'll probably either pull this or that when, when they come forward and, and try to get... Uh, I just want to be sure we're giving them everything that they need to be as successful as possible, um, you know, and, and, and they're doing a great job, but I, I think it's our job to uh, help them on that front. So, um, so I appreciate that. Thank you. So I'm going to interject real quick because I've heard the same thing, and I, I agree with Commissioner Satcher on this. So my understanding is the current system is that if, if we have an issue with an, an ambulance, that the rig is returned to public works, and then your folks go out there and service it at that site. Um, so I guess my question would be, if we end up, if, if Jimmy asks for this position and we do approve it, does that then free up your person? Potentially. Potentially, so that would help both departments essentially if we were to do that. Okay, Mr. Washington, did you want to chime in? I see you're bundling Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, there. it is a public okay. safety ask and they'll be coming sure. up and speaking to that in just a minute. Okay, okay. Um, Commissioner Ball, you're next, ma'am. Yeah, um, Drew, nice to have you here with us. What Can you tell me your total budget for IT for this coming on this budget and also what it was last year or year before? It's 28.6 million. 28.6 million this year. I'm not sure what it was last year, do we? I just need to know how much your budget's gone up. I, we used to get that information. I mean, I... I would think was that it the was it on one of the previous slides on the screen, the the, the total, total increase, Hunter, by any chance? You probably scrolled way past it, but no, not there. Okay, Trust I know me, the total of our DUs is nine hundred twenty-two thousand. I'm sorry, Drew. Say that again. The total of our DUs that I just discussed was nine hundred twenty-two thousand. Right. Yeah, I knew that part. So, but you know, you've got several different. 
sections, if you will. And so I didn't know what the total budget was. And then how much, you know, what it was last year for IT as a whole. Do we know, Sheila? Uh, I got my division manager. Oh, Hi, if I may. Last year's total budget for IT was twenty-two million four hundred fifty-two thousand eight seventy-four. That's what I needed. Thank you very much. So, would you would you mind just anticipating skipping ahead uh, as we're doing this and having that those two numbers for each of these departments as we go forward? Thank just, you. Yeah, it's if you don't mind, Mr. Chair. It's just nice to know how much each department is going up in the new budget. Sure. Trying to keep a running number. Thank you. Drew, 28, that's pretty healthy. Um, what does the majority of that I'm go healthy. to? I mean, how, how many employees do you have? We, we have 80 total employees. Um, we have a couple of contracted employees in the project management space as well. A um, lot of hardware and software, uh, tech refresh, uh, replacement of PCs and computers are tech refresh. Oh, the hardware is all you too. Okay. And then, we, and then we also our software licensing is probably one of the biggest chunks of it. Okay. Like our, our Microsoft agreement alone is almost $1.3 million a year. Ouch. That's just Microsoft. That doesn't count anything else. Okay. That, that pretty much answers it. Thank you. Commissioner Ron. Oh, you're touching your microphone there. I'm just trying to read the body language. Well, Drew, I think you made it out of here unscathed then. No one else seems to have any questions. Thank you, sir. Commissioners, I um, I will have the report um, to you in your hands in a couple of minutes. Uh, we did, do have that report that compares it to 23. Just having my Perfect. assistant print it right now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Let's let's call this next guy up here. I've been waiting As for we, him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, moving on to property management, um, it has seven programs with a total budget for 24 of 24.5 million dollars. Didn't present you. And with you, uh, Charlie Bishop, Deputy County Administrator and Director of uh, Property Management. Thanks, you. Good afternoon again, Charlie Bishop, uh, Deputy County Administrator. Um, we've got a very lean budget here again, I believe, after uh, you see what we're asking for. The first desired unit is for the Lakewood Ranch Library that's going to be online in September. We're asking for three positions, a custodian, a building trade worker, and a, uh, a supervisor. Those three individuals are not just dedicated to the uh, library. They also be doing any other facilities for future growth at Premier and any other East County facilities. You can see that we have uh, two desired units in uh, construction services. Uh, one would be another project manager with the uh, growth of the capital improvement project. Uh, uh, we do need another project manager, and with the promotion of Tom Yarger to deputy, excuse me, to deputy director of property management, uh, we created a void in uh, that role. So we are asking for that position to be filled. We did ask for uh, a desired decision unit for backstops throughout the park systems. We do understand this is going to be quite co costly. Currently, we're out for bid. I believe we have a bid opening in mid-July uh, uh, for approximately three of them at Blackstone that will gauge how much these are going to run us. We did ask Sheila to put set-aside money for that for future replacement. $1 million per year. $1 million per year for five, for five years. These are very expensive structural fences that protect both the first uh, home plate and third baseline. Commissioner Ball. Uh, I was just curious, Charlie. I mean, really, this is probably more for Sheila than you. I, I've got everything that you're talking about so far. My, my question is, though, again, I'm not seeing anything under the unfunded section for us to the board to discuss that perhaps a department, you know, wants that hasn't been quote unquote already funded. Normally it's got sections under the unfunded section for us to look at and discuss. And yes. Charlie and doesn't, I thought you told me that there was going to be some under. Yes. And you will be coming. A lot of the unfunded comes from funding sources that really are um, coming into hardship, like it is the stormwater 
and all that. But Charlie has its Step own fund. parks and recreation um, funding source, which isn't being performing rather well. So th it is a true need. So that's why the recommendation was placed. Okay, so you, we don't have anything in property management then that no, has not been quote unquote already funded. Well, I I did I did Good sort of kind of like like reserve the backstop so that he can bring forward a more um, you know robust explanation of the 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 backstop programs. So he has to come back and ask and take it back from the reserves. A backstop for backstops. Backstop for backstops. Okay. We do anticipate coming back to the board for a request to uh, replace some backstops throughout the county. Again, these are structural in nature. They're around three to five hundred thousand dollars per. We have approximately thirty plus in, throughout the parks. Um, again, we have three of them out for bid right now for Blackstone. That's going to be able to gauge how much we need to come to the board for, or if the board decides that uh, they would like us to to look at other avenues such as netting or other possibilities. Okay. My next desired decision unit is for the engineering of a, a chiller and generator connection across the street is the judicial center, which uh, approximately went online in 2008. That chiller feeds the store courthouse. When we did that construction, we put a T in the middle between the two facilities. We're requesting that uh, you allow us to design so that we can bring our central energy plant, which not only feeds the administration building, the property appraiser, the records building is brought to the line for the new uh, complex across the street that NDC is building. It also feeds our uh, central library. We would like to be able to bring that line underneath Banty Avenue and connect for redundancy to the Judicial Center. So then what would you do with the existing chillers? <clears throat> the existing chillers would be there in place for backup. Currently, if that system fails, we're, at, we're dead in the water. Okay, so you're going to use the chillers on top of the Judicial Center as backup? Yep. Okay. We actually... Uh, the board gave us the ability for three chillers in our central energy plant. Currently, we only have two. Sure. So we have a spot for a third chiller to go in there. It would run better. And uh, again, we'd have redundancy. Okay, next. That's it. That's it. Any questions? Any questions for property management? Thank you. None. Okay. I would like to add a, a comment into this. A lot of the departments have been very, very, very uh, judicious in what they provided from their original requests. So did they shave some of it before they even presented their budget? Yes, because I, we have been discussing with all the directors the direction of um, doing less with more, enhancing technology and so forth. So they did shave off a lot of their before even submission. So if you don't see a lot of funded, unfunded, it's because they absolutely held back a lot of their um, uh, desired uh, and wish list. So they just kind of like pulled it back a lot. Well, in conjunction with our administrator, it, it was just a, you know, partnership here. Um, but moving along, uh, we have um, our next department is public safety with eight programs for a total budget of $23 million. And 23 budget was? $48 million, Wait, how did they go from 48 to 23 before we even get started, Sheila? Well, the $48 million probably already includes the health care programs, which we discussed the other day. The health care programs are outside of the actual department in itself. So, um, and oh, and they also had the ARP. Okay. So ARP and then an yes. organizational change as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there was a lot of changes with all these reorgs and all that movement. Um, there was a lot of things shaped out. And then healthcare was always kept outside of the department, although they administrated, so that we could see the actual performance of the, of the program in itself. And with that, I leave you with Jody Fisk, Director of Public Safety. Good afternoon. Um, so I'll start with animal services, I think should be the first one. Um, we are asking for three animal control officers. Those positions will also come with a van and equipment. So that's 
that first charge, and then the recurring salaries for those. Um, just, sorry? That's just going to lead to more animals coming in. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, uh, Emergency Communication Center is actually not asking for any positions this year, but I will jump right to EMS. Uh, the IT position is within, is one of our requests. Um, so there is a temp that they've been utilizing. That temp actually started during COVID, and obviously the need continues. So that position is being requested along with a project manager and the health services case manager along with the eight positions for EMS to staff the parish EMS station. Jody, can you just educate me real quick? A project manager for EMS. So that's actually with, it's going to be under public safety um, okay. the public safety umbrella. So it actually, right now we do have a temp who is working on that. There's five large IT projects that she's currently managing, but there are additional projects that are pending with ECC that will need the project manager's attention as well. Okay. So with that... Uh, emergency management is asking for an emergency management coordinator. This position will be really heavily focused on recovery. I think we all saw during Ian um, the recovery process can get fairly extensive and we need to make sure that we are assisting as the activation is going with a recovery support function within the EOC. And so that will be the primary focus for that position within EM. And code enforcement. Uh, we are requesting for uh, two positions. One is a captain to assist with the backlog of the cases that are currently standing, and each one of those positions will need a vehicle to to go with them. Question. Yes. So with code enforcement and, and this might be more of a Sheila question, but code enforcement and or um, what was her other Ask the oh, oh uh, animal um, officers. I apologize. I, sorry, the words aren't coming to me at the moment. Occupational hazard, but uh, is that something that we can dip into impact fees for, similar to the way we do with the sheriff's department and for EMS? In other words, when we add the position, the the equipment, oftentimes we can use impact fees to fund. For only the equipment, a one time of the you can use public safety EMS impact fees. Yes, okay. which are performing quite well. Oh, great news. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. And that was actually the last one of the decision units was code enforcement. Commissioner Ballard. So I, obviously we, we need people for disaster recovery, but for a position like that, when we're not going through an active emergency recovery situation, what would what does that person's day-to-day -day look like? So it actually takes a good number of years to fully close out a storm. I'm sure that um, Missy and her team can tell you. Um, for day-to-day, -day really, what we are looking to do is the state is moving towards having a very heavy recovery function within both blue skies and gray skies. Um, that is also to keep up to date with the many changes in FEMA. Uh, you look at the floodplain maps and the changes they do to that, their policies in regards to PA assistance and how to go about um, applying for and being eligible. So because there are so many changes that occur during blue skies, we need someone to track those changes and make sure that they are included in all of our emergency plans so that when the activation comes, we're not trying to play catch up on the back end and trying to build those functions up that we could have been doing um, during Blue Skies activities. Understood. Thank you. Anyone else for public safety? Commissioner Satcher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. For the, um, the decision unit three, four, five, and six, so that's the code enforcement officers with a vehicle, um, two and 24 and two and 25, what percentage of increase is that? Like, how many of those do we have right now? Uh, code enforcement officers with vehicle. How many of those positions exist currently? Do we know? Um, each code enforcement officer that we have now has a vehicle. Um, I can get that exact number. I'm not 100%. It's 24. We have 24 code enforcement. So we have 
somewhere around eight. Down at the bottom. Yep. 21, you want to go to 24. Okay. Yeah, because her total has 24 if she's approved. Okay. Okay. So right at a 10% increase in code enforcement officers. And then how many of those, the current 21, how many captains do we have? None. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any additional questions? I think you're safe. Yeah, you did well. Run. All right. All right. There should be some low hanging fruit yeah. on this next so department. We, we have with you uh, Public Works, which has seven programs for a total budget of $87.9 million. Take a million off of this, he wouldn't even notice. Uh, but can you make that figure one more time? 87.9 million. <laughs> Pulled out of District 5, obviously. And last year's budget for 23, their adopted budget for 23 was $80.9 million. I'll never build. Oh, that good. That made that bigger. Because <laughs> that was the first thing I was going to say. So I hope the idea was you didn't rush through everything just so you could get to public works. So have plenty of time to uh, uh, go through this. Uh, I will be looking a little down a fair amount because each one of these I got my notes in front of me on the detail sheet. Are you going to stay on? Which sheet are you going to use for chatting from here, Hunter? We're going to stay on this. This, okay. Thank you. Chad Butso, Public Works. So within our, what we call 2501 field operations, it's a, uh, mostly our maintenance area, but it also includes our administrative. That's what's uh, all pooled into this category. Uh, the first one there, number three, is a vehicle for the safety coordinator through the department. This individual has been begging and borrowing and uh, using my vehicle an awful lot. Uh, to go to all the areas and perform the uh, morning safety meetings and also to respond to incidents and assist in write-ups like that. It's just uh, we're at the point and busy enough. We feel with the miles that he puts on borrow and we're asking for a vehicle addition. And the other one, desired number four, is an oddball item. So you might have an, uh, an item that uh, Sheila may have to say. This is formally in a stormwater CIP project. This is the matching funds that we have for already approved cooperative funding uh, agreements with Swift Mud for drainage studies. One step was the clerk recently told us these because they're studies, you can't keep them in the CIP program, but uh, we already are committed because these are underway and signed agreements. We have to fund them. Uh, given the troubles that stormwater had, uh, they were placed here within this budget uh, to accomplish the cost. So, so you're basically, you're just shifting these from one section of the budget to another? Correct. It got moved from uh, Fund 460 over to Fund 101. Okay. Well, there's $4 million of your $7 million increase, Commissioner Baugh, is reorganization. Yeah. Anything on that uh, well, well, program, what, 2501? What about the 11646000 Did you Was that part of what you just explained? That's your overall uh, base unit of what is in there. Uh, the mat vast majority of that will include uh, all your roadway uh, maintenance staff, uh, a lot of equipment, heavy equipment that goes in there as well. Uh, approximately half of the uh, field maintenance division is in there. The other half is in the uh, one of the stormwater funds. Okay. Commissioner Satcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So looking at number four on the watershed management plan funding. Um, so if you were explaining this to a layperson, is the number one function of, you know, obviously the plan and say it if it gets – uh, implemented. So number one function to cut down on flooding of, you know, homes and land and roads, or is the number one function to cut down on pollution that ends up in our waterways, 
or is or does it do some of both or am I just way off base? It does something totally different. I'm going to stall for just a moment. The primary means is it's it tells you your weak points. I mean, it's showing you that validates rather than by uh, perception and establishes a model. So you can say this is definitely where you have uh, flooding issues, potentially some things that you can uh, plan around because it should recommend some projects within that it talks about whether it be flood reduction projects It also talks about water quality projects that come out of the results of the studies So basically you need the studies to incorporate into your overall uh, maintenance and capital plans going forward so from a you know 30,000 feet perspective though if we are you know working towards a plan to what I would assume is capture more water um, slow it down before it ends up in our waterways or keep it from doing that at all. Um, but because I remember early on, some of the talk was about how, you know, pollution and settle, settle, I forget the word they use, but anyway, things settle out of the water. Um, so you end up, if you're helping people with flooding, you're also helping with uh, pollution and runoff. Is that correct? Or, or is that... There, there's a much deeper conversation probably when we get to the 2507 the stormwaters program here we'll talk about that much more in depth uh, <clears throat> this is just studying the basins to identify the problem areas and to document and uh, establish uh, recommended projects for those basins this isn't actually performing the work other than doing the data gathering and the analysis on each individual basin I can run through the basins that are covered by this if you'd like to no, I was, yeah, I was taking what your answer as as assumed, or I meant to be saying, yes, I understand we're just studying it at this point, but I was just t saying that somewhere down the road, our goal when we're doing watershed management in general a absolutely. is Absolutely, that's a component. Correct? Usually the how long you hold the water uh, is a piece that increases your water quality. It allows for more settlement out in the uh, retention ponds. All right. All right, thank you, sir. All right, any additional questions? Nope. We're ready for the next slide. So we slide over 2502, our project management uh, component here program. This includes the project engineers and uh, inspectors uh, predominantly. This is inspectors that deal with capital improvement, and, uh, capital improvement inspection, development inspection, and uh, they're all in one group, so we do it very efficiently. They do the roadway inspections, the uh, inspections for the water and sewer pipes all at the same time uh, with one trip out to the job. Only have two, uh, two items under here. Also, our pavement management obviously falls under this category. Uh, we had an opportunity this year uh, through the uh, consolidation through technology companies, my work management software that Public Works uses, CityWorks, uh, and our project management software we use for uh, uh, controlling our CIP process, eBuilder, have been both acquired by a master company known as Trimble. Uh, and by doing that, there uh, some opportunities arose that there's a third software that is a really good pavement management software. And then by essentially just modernizing our uh, annual license agreement into an uh, uh, enterprise agreement, we get access to that third thing as well, and the ability to hopefully in the uh, future to integrate the two softwares between project management and the maintenance. So we'd actually be able to see work within our own native environments, but also be able to share uh, information back and forth between the three uh, processes. So that's what that first one is, that $170,000. It's a software license agreement on an annual basis uh, that really expands our ability. The pavement analysis Part of it is the primary driving force because it takes what we're able to do in uh, scheduling and uh, basing and off condition rating uh, to a much higher level than what we have right now. Questions on that slide? Okay. And a, uh, okay, slide. No. That was a, just a vehicle for the pavement manager. We now have grown that team, so the, the uh, team that's out doing the inspections, the pavement manager does as much time or more dealing with uh, customer concerns during the pavement project and assessing roads as he goes forward. Uh, and there, 
uh, for what is included in the next five years or the fourth year. I've shared with you the map that shows the five-year resurfacing program, and that's where he continues to work as far as what gets added to the year and validating that uh, the cost estimates are accurate, put together by his staff, and he just needs to be able to have wheels when he needs to get to the job. So, Chad, on that, we're, it's only it's a single vehicle, and and I'm going to steal your words. He just needs to have wheels. My truck wasn't sixty seven thousand dollars. That so, is a uh, the detail sheet will show a purchase price in the fifty thousand dollar placeholder range and seventeen five for operating between fuel and maintenance. Oh, that's the annual fuel and maintenance as well. That's the full cost. Okay. So the purchase cost is allocated at fifty thousand. If if it makes well, it a I mean, little better for you, I'm just saying. All right. Now that that explains. Thank you. So the fifty thousand one time cost seventeen in recurring costs. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Next slide. A new program twenty five oh three. All things traffic. Uh, and when I say that, that is uh, formerly transportation planning that's now in development services now. So it's mainly traffic operations and traffic engineering uh, with a little bit of infrastructure planning in, uh, involved in here. So this first one, DU number three, uh, roadway lighting. This is, ooh, where are you at? Oh, there you are. I'm going bottom up. So number three, number three. Uh, the county of the existing lights that we already do maintain, we have or have been in the process of converting any of those that aren't already LED to LED. Uh, it's been a little bit of a slow and arduous process <clears throat> to buy the new fixtures and replace them. This decision unit requests to purchase the remaining fixtures, and then across this fiscal year, staff would uh, work it into the work schedule and convert them all. Everything has to get converted eventually here because uh, the ability to get repair parts and or even new fixtures uh, is going away very quickly in the, in the near future. So this is a uh, purchase only of materials. Uh, we're not gonna hire anybody in-house staff will install them on the remaining 833 LED fixtures. I mean, 833 high pressure sodium fixtures still out that we maintain. Number four. <clears throat> This goes in hand in hand from last week's presentation that Clark and Bashal had to you with speed management on a thoroughfare. We said we had a budget request for there. This is the request for funding to be able to do some of those things within an operating budget. Say it's not on a road that's getting uh, uh, resurfaced or the resurfacing project needs a little extra bonus of money or uh, again, a roadway that isn't being resurfaced, we can still implement some of those items uh, on the thoroughfares. Number five, uh, believe it or not, anytime you have something in the ground, something in the ground gets broke. If everybody's seen the, uh, all the contractors and Bob with a sticker on the side of his truck doing directional drilling up and down the road, our fiber optic lines get re uh, broken an awful lot. Uh, this is requesting additional funding to uh, keep the operating budget whole. Uh, thus far this year, we have paid, uh, actually in FY22, we absorbed $245,000 worth of uh, damage costs, and it's very high because we contract out a lot of our repairs for repairing that fiber. So this is just trying to make sure the stuff that we had planned to use our operating funds for, we're able to, and ask for the funds that we anticipate for the contract fiber repairs. Currently, the damage uh, rate has not slowed. It's actually kind of increased. We hope it plateaus and goes away in the near future with all the uh, work that's being done right now. Number six, we have, believe it or not, there's permanent uh, uh, traffic count stations on various thoroughfares around the county. Uh, many times it'll, uh, sometimes they stand out if you're not a geek like me and see a post on the side that's got the controller in it. Many of them are old loop type detection uh, devices. Uh, technology is found and uh, passed it by. Uh, this decision unit requests for the uh, uh, capital and uh, support to install the replacements with modern technology. Uh, you get much better data collected rather than just the true vehicle. You'll be able to capture items like the vehicle, the speed, 
and uh, twenty four seven, and even live access to the data by uh, by it being the modern version. So that's what the way it's funded here is. What Sheila said is it's set aside in the reserve. We put together the purchase package and make a request to uh, at budget, and they'll uh, move it into our operating budget. Since this does take me a little bit of time to to know this is going, we have to put a bid package together. So number seven here, down the road, because it takes a long time to acquire vehicles, if we were allowed to purchase this vehicle, uh, adding a fiber optic splicing van uh, to our inventory and hopefully be able to, uh, in a year or two, essentially do the majority of the repairs ourselves instead of contracting out. So this doesn't, isn't an either or on that previous 250 I asked for. It's once it's delivered, staff trained, and we're able to uh, perform that, in a year and a half or two years, that other money hopefully will be greatly reduced or go away. Within the traffic area, we're requesting a GIS analyst. Uh, within there, we have determined uh, to establish a nice cyclical maintenance requirement. Uh, the, the quality of the data needs to be greatly in, uh, improved. So we have a, uh, each of the control cabinets have their controller, the malfunction monitor unit, uh, some batteries, the battery backups, do they have a generator, an awful lot of things that need to be maintained in each location. And the data set within GIS is a much more efficient way to do it than any other way that we've currently been doing. Also with trying to keep up with your sign inventory of uh, 45, 50,000 signs out there uh, with retro reflectivity checks and uh, the last time it's been maintained and our pavement uh, marking uh, inventory, uh, trying to make sure that paint is updated every one to two years and uh, thermoplastic on a as needed cycle, but hopefully getting closer to the five or six year. And I know we're a little short on that, but those are our goals of what we're wanting to do. Well, that's one of the main things the GIS analysts would keep those data sets up to date to make that maintenance program flow much better. Uh, this one has an odd title, uh, Decision Unit 9. It says Roadway Lighting Support. Technically, it's a uh, mistype uh, when we updated the final version. This would be a funding request for, for our Bicycle Pedestrian Coordinator Program. Uh, it's meant to be your outreach program. If anybody made it to our uh, Public Works open house, the Bike Ped Coordinator is responsible with coordinating outreach programs to going to churches and schools and other community events to start to teach the uh, ideas of rules of the road to the children at a much earlier age. Usually the uh, <coughs> costs of a program like that are the incentives to get some interest where you occasionally do some giveaways or prizes with uh, uh, small riding, uh, whether it be scooters or tricycles or bicycles, and certainly ha helmet fittings and uh, giveaways. That's what that program is. $50,000 request for uh, being able to go out and do those outreach and those uh, giveaway items. So I, I like that, but, but where is the school board on that? You know what I mean? I, I think it's a great idea, don't get me wrong. I just wonder where it falls in the realm of responsibilities, I guess is my question. And we do have a, a joint meeting coming up with the school board. Um, and maybe, you know, there's a couple different things that I've, I've noticed that have come up that I've thought, oh, I love that, but isn't that, doesn't that fall more into the realm of the school board? And maybe they just don't know that these things are, are floating around out there, and maybe these are things that we need to set up some sort of a, I'm, I'm sorry, Chad, I'm hijacking your presentation, but I'm trying to save you $50,000. Um, maybe this is something we need to discuss with the school board, like setting up, somehow setting up a liaison or, or you know, some kind of communication line between the two of us of ways in which we can support one another on items like this. One of the I see items nodding we, heads, but I don't know. So I guess <laughs> we'll just take that as a sure. Let's talk the about school, it. The school board. The comes. school properties are definitely one of the places that we would prefer, between parks and or school properties, the places to set up those traffic gardens. Okay. Uh, so it's in a place that is always safe to use. Uh, churches or something. A lot of times you'll end up doing that in their parking lot, unless it's mm -hmm. set up for a special event. It may not be the perfect and most safe place to do that. Okay. Uh, my question was more directed towards the board than, than you, but thank you. So uh, decision unit number 10, this is a asking for $50,000. It allows staff, believe it or not, each time say we want to add onesie, twosie, here's a street light here, here's a street light there. It's just asking for a little extra funding. It guarantees that we have the ability uh, without question and without hurting our existing operating budget 
uh, to install up to like 50 new lights a year. I realize we're going to have a much bigger lighting discussion going forward, but this was written long before we knew that was a sure thing or it was an active idea. Each light, typically, uh, if we assume the worst, it's in an uh, odd location. It may need a new pole and a transformer, so roughly $1,000 a piece for your upfront cost. So that's where we come up with the $50,000 request. Uh, number 11 is a lot like the permanent count station. This is continuing a technology upgrade. Uh, a lot of our thoroughfare intersections we've been trying to do, certainly as we do capital projects and our surfacing projects, but we haven't got to all of them. If you've noticed, over the years, we all had loops. The, uh, the item in the pavement that you could uh, used to see where you'd drive across and hope the signal would eventually turn and give you a green light. Uh, for the sensing, then we went to ca optical cameras. Uh, actually, we're past that now. Our standard is uh, microwave vehicle detection. That's usually a square uh, white item that uh, actually is just scanning. Much better, much better, much better. It'll work during the fog, too, because a lot of our optical cameras were completely useless when we had foggy mornings, if you've ever been stuck behind one of those. Uh, but again, it's just that request to uh, speed up the uh, technology conversion that's out in the field. <clears throat> this is uh, accomplishing 15 intersections to uh, purchase and get it installed. And over time, there's still about 25 more to go, 25 more intersections beyond that. Number 12 is continuing to ask for uh, additional funding to speed our install of additional items like special safety beacons, uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, and the install install costs that go along with that so we can do even more. We've noticed over uh, this year that the uh, desire for those mid-block crosswalks and uh, the ability to put that extra uh, flashing intensity out there to make the pedestrians feel safer has increased dramatically. Number 13 is, uh, let me summarize it real quick. We have a lot of mast arm intersections out there. The standard for Manatee County mast arms is galvanized, uh, so kind of a plain metal. Even though they're not painted, they do need treated over time. Roughly, this puts together a uh, system that allows us to treat those on roughly a, uh, six of them a year. and uh, on a 15-year cycle. So it's just, it's a modest cost to uh, allow us to paint that. As long as you stay ahead of any of that corrosion and rust on the galvanized, they have a uh, perpetual life until uh, kissed by a vehicle. So six intersections a year uh, on a 15-year uh, annual cycle. Number 14, still in traffic, is uh, next signal ahead guide signs. So on state roads, those become... Uh, a very standard way of doing things when you're approaching a signal, uh, forget the distance, whether it's an eighth mile or a quarter mile, but you'll see a big sign that says next, sig next signal and notifies you which road you're approaching. Uh, being a state standard, we've only have it on one or two of our roads, mainly because we copy and pasted state specifications when we built our own thoroughfares. Uh, but as busy and high speed and as many accidents as we've happened, we've proposed this as an enhancement to the system at a number of locations on our thoroughfares. Uh, so we uh, wanted to try that out on the county uh, roadway. Uh, there's 66 uh, signs and on particular locations that we thought for on 24 different roadways. And uh, so, 66 signs comes to eight hundred thousand dollars. These are you're not your average sign. So they're twin posted with a concrete foundation and then a large post on either side. These. Uh, Usually you're on your thoroughfares and they're fairly high speed roads. So they're going to be at least as wide or the table that you're sitting at and probably a little bit wider. So I, I love you, but I'm, I'm going to move to pull item number 14 and try to save us $800,000. Um, we'll see if anyone seconds me. So I have a second with Baugh. Can I dial Commissioner up? Ballard, by all means. Would it be possible to to do this in a more economical way? May, you know, potentially smaller signs that that serve the same purpose. Are you talking about the ones that kind of go over and above the the road? 
No, no, ma'am. Not on, not on the road. They'll be on the side, uh, depending on how tight your sidewalk is. Uh, occasionally, they can span the sidewalk because of the width that's on there. Uh, an offer I could come back with would be uh, analyzing. Uh, these were proposed, I'm sure, on multi-lane roads, but it, I don't know. I don't remember if it was included on what the speed limit was on these roads. So, if they were 40 miles an hour or heart higher, or 45 miles an hour or higher. Uh, the state roads make sense because you're always going uh, 45 or higher on those roads. I hear you. I, I just, I mean, if, if we, uh, it looks like we're going, I'm just giving an example. It looks like we're going to take on the, the sheriff's substation in Pride Park and build it out as a homeless shelter geared towards families. And I'm told it's like five, six $600,000 to build that out. This is $800,000 for, to let people know there's a signal ahead, which I get it's a state standard. I don't have an issue with you asking. Um, but they do it I on just, their roads. It's not a requirement. I, I know, but roads. you try to adhere to state standards, and I, I appreciate that. Um, but I just feel that there's higher priorities for us, my opinion. Okay, I think we can move on. And I believe the last one in this category is permanent speed feedback signs. Uh, we have uh, proposed that. It's been, it, it's been asked by some commissioners as part of a traffic calming uh, idea on thoroughfares. Uh, I have a map if anybody in the end wanted to see it. I mean, there's 15 different roads and 46 different uh, speed feedback signs that are proposed with this. So those are the ones that uh, uh, will flash at you and tell you how fast you're going. Uh, unfortunately, about 3 in the morning or 4 in the morning, they become challenges to the teenagers but uh, or somebody because there's always anomalies in the data. But that is uh, 46... All right. 46 permanent uh, speed feedback signs. I'll quick run through that. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Bearden. <clears throat> is that is that the is that everything or are you still going through your budget? <laughs> oh, we got a couple more programs. Okay, I'll just he's wait like, till the end. This I'll public works. He's he's like yeah, a yeah, biggest departments. Okay. okay. We got a couple more programs. Carry on, Chad. And uh, um, Bearden, you're on my, you're top of the list. And Bearden and then Ballard. Anyone else while we're doing this? Okay. This one's real uh, short and sweet. Uh, in our in-house design group, that's what we call infra uh, infrastructure engineering. We noticed this year because we, uh, anytime we have a capital project and we're assisting out, it's easy to do things because we got a, a budget established. But when we're trying to, uh, maybe look at something maybe one of you guys have uh, mentioned something we're looking at like fill in this sidewalk do this over here uh, can I fit a turn lane in there if I don't have a capital number in, within the operating budgets it's very hard to slip in to get some survey done to get some uh, maybe some aerial uh, lidar wetland assessments or even somebody to pay somebody to give me one of those photo simulations so this is just a small addition to the budget to be able to facilitate those things and we can hopefully move even a little faster by feeding that real data into infrastructure design and that was the only one in that program fleet services uh, you have to bless Matt uh, Matt tries to keep track of your money very closely. The majority of these things are taking care of his shops, taking care of his shops. And he tracks it down to, uh, like I think you would want to, some of these seem relatively small for the size of his program, but he looks at it as they're either a whole vehicle or a portion of a vehicle, so it's something to put on the budget and just make sure you know what's going through here. So uh, just to at 26th Avenue, it's a very uh, small building. We store a lot of things outside of the building. It's just asking for another storage container for some of the equipment that we use. Uh, we need another uh, because of the multiple uh, shifts and the number of vehicles that we maintain at the vehicles uh, at the shop. We need another uh, supervisor. I'm rolling through here. I'm on decision unit five down at uh, transit fleet because of the multiple shifts and the importance of having shift handover and being able to have vehicles that make pull out the next day. Previously, that facility was run just with a superintendent uh, during the uh, day shift, but night shift was just a lead worker. This is adding a supervisor to that night shift uh, down at transit. Uh, replacement uh, 
air compressor to uh, assist with the uh, items for the vertic uh, the lifts and hand tools. Number seven, let's put a little time into this. So uh, you've all probably been to one of our fuel uh, distribution places. This is the software and the hardware that operates that, that provides our security and also record keeping on that. It's essentially just a modernization of that software. One of the main increases that it gives us, it gives us the ability to have live data again. Uh, before, we always had access to what was going on at the fuel islands, but it was a ping. We actually had to be at a computer and say, tell me what's going on. So, uh, so uh, definitely an improvement going into storm season, always having live activity, uh, how many transactions are happening per hour, and uh, what the tank volumes are uh, at the moment's notice. You don't have to actually run a report to get it, at, uh, get it done. A little bit of something here. Uh, within each of the four fleet shops, we also have a fluid distribution th item for uh, like your oil, antifreeze, transmission fluid, and it's just like the uh, dispenser tool uh, at Jiffy Lube and other places. Uh, the ours is probably five, six years old. The software needs to be in a full upgrade, and it's going to a wireless system that talks back. <clears throat> where it becomes efficient for the techs is. Uh, on the wand, one implement, uh, either a scan or uh, typing in the work order number, all the volume and uh, detail items go straight into the work order and it uh, is recorded and saves time for the technicians. So this is a software and a hardware upgrade to that system at all four shops. Replacing the uh, floor uh, covering, essentially repainting, uh, providing uh, clean and uh, traction surface at the landfill. Uh, replacing a tire and wheel balancing machine at 26, replacing, uh, was that duplicate? The title was, but it, again, it's another equipment replacement, but this is at 66. We want to add, add a uh, new lift at the 26th uh, yard with the number of vehicles that are continue as we grow. That's where most of the light feed fleet is maintained, so we just needed one of those smaller lifts at 26 to assist our efficiencies. Uh, number 13 is the replacement of aging heavy lifts, both at 26th Avenue. Uh, number 14 is an additional lift at 26th Avenue, again, with the increased uh, vehicle demands being placed on that shop just in having an extra lift in one of the bays. Number 15 is the replacement of two lifts, again at 26th Avenue, and uh, replace, <coughs> excuse me, parts washing uh, equipment at 26th Avenue. We're up to uh, number 17. Uh, if you've been in 26 on your way to the fuel island, you'll see a small uh, covered area. Uh, you wonder what it is. It's a covered area over a, a small pond there. That's the uh, uh, recovery section for the car wash that's there. But if, amazingly, we've never covered the where the uh, hot water heater and uh, pressure generation is there. So it's just adding, asking funds for to cover that area. And probably the most one of the most important ones on here, for whatever reason, I don't know why 66 is uh, turned into uh, such a bird heaven haven. Uh, out at 66, but it's like the landfill used to be at one time with uh, having bird issues. So once they start discovering your facility and digging into your insulation up on the roof, it becomes a real issue. So we're requesting uh, the ability to seal that off and uh, cover that with netting. So that was uh, program 2505. So 2507 is a different story. Uh, we put this together not knowing exactly where we would be at this time of the year back in January. And we were talking about uh, a lot of things that are in motion. And some of them you've uh, heard about not, and some of them you haven't. So let's just run through them. I don't believe uh, any are recommended for funding right now. But let's just review what we talked about here. So easement acquisition. So this is meant to assist maintenance. So as we go along, we have uh, numerous areas of canals that 
are ours, but we may or may not get to very often, mainly because they have very difficult access issues. Sometimes either we need a parallel with the canal issue or we need multiple side yard accesses just so we can get to them. Uh, in the past, we've tried to just have people uh, grant us permission uh, or give us an easement, but uh, they're not terribly inclined. We think of a little bit of funding that uh, they may have more interest in helping us with that. But it would greatly improve the access for uh, uh, stormwater maintenance, especially when there's, uh, say, down trees. If we had numerous, more access points, uh, the, how far you got to pull a tree to get it actually out of the canal is dramatically better. Uh, canal and ditch maintenance contracted services. Char this is near and dear to Charlie's heart. So it's one of the things that we've uh, very successfully used the last two years uh, coming out of the storm with the addition of uh, spending funds on contracts. It allowed us to spend more time on the things we want to do in preventative maintenance. Uh, going forward, it, uh, without this funding, it'll just uh, slow down. So the number of open work orders will have an average lifetime that continues to grow if we're not able to inject this back in here. Uh, a lot of what we use this on is uh, exceptionally uh, heavy cleaning areas where it's very easy. We can give a defined scope to the uh, vendors. Uh, especially, I'm thinking this is one where we used an example up at Car Drain on the north side of 17th Street in Palmetto. We also did it over at Police Athletic League, and I believe we used a vendor out on the, uh, the ditch that's on the east side of uh, Premier uh, Complex out there. Okay. Commissioner Ed. Cruz has a question on that. So what are we going to do with these canals and ditches if we're pulling this out of here? Just do less of them? Is that what it is? Were you asking for an increase to an existing prod or existing plan or, or what is this? Because I, I'm the one who talked to you about that that PAL ditch and they were losing just a ton of money and a ton of use of their property. You went in there and you hired whoever it was. And like 48 hours later, they cleaned out that ditch, and it, it was a world of difference at a reasonable cost and in a fast time. So what's the, what's the plan if we unfund this? It's not funding that we've had traditionally uh, to, say the, to tell you the exact source of it. Charlie got us going, and by, uh, by golly, we went and organized work and had work that needed to get done, and funding was uh, found. We had such good success with this, we've requested it to continue. Okay, so this so, so so, the so, question is, yes, it would just wait longer before we would get to it. Or you're going to do what you've been doing, which is effectively spend $1.15 million <clears throat> on canal and ditch maintenance over the next 12 months, but we're not going to budget for it. We're just going to cobble together dollars on an as-needed basis, right? If the funding is there, sir, yes, sir. But I'm just saying, like, we did do canal and ditch maintenance this past year and the year before without having a budgeted line item for it. We just found the money when it was necessary to do so, right? I mean, it, this seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, to be a dollar-for-dollar dollar good use of funds to mitigate flooding and, and issues, I think. I agree, and I just freed you up eight hundred and seventeen thousand dollars from those road signs. Why don't you shift it over to cleaning out? Ditches? I'd rather you have because I've seen it work. I've seen it work, and I've seen it work fast, and I've seen it work efficiently on a dollar for dollar basis compared to some of the flooding we have. I mean, just, I know we're going to do this work, so I just hate having to dig around and find it because then next thing you know, we spend an extra three weeks during a, a major flooding event looking for dollars to go hire somebody. We know we're going to hire somebody. We're not going to not clean out the ditch. Madam CFO. Thank you. Show um, me the money. A couple of clarifying points. That $800,000 that was a non-recurring item that you just pulled and a different type of funding source now. Um, do we have canal ditch maintenance? Yes, we do have a program, and for the last year and a half, year two years, we've been funding additional into it. It's just asking for more. This is coming from a funding source that is really stretched very far. Um, it's not that they don't have, you know, it's just right now they went from seven million to nine million to now ten million dollars of funding in their regular base and continuation. So until we can assess where solid waste rates are today, this funding source cannot fund additional contracted services. So um, 
that's the reality. Do you mind helping things. us understand why the cleaning out of, of in maintenance of ditches can only be funded through solid waste? Through stormwater. Through stormwater. Well, if you found other funding sources, we could divert. Like I could suggest some transportation dollars as well um, to be used, but outside of that, any other funding source would be general fund. Just out of curiosity, the eight hundred dollars in road signs. What fu what fund did that come out of? Was that transportation? Transportation trust fund. Yes. There you go. Okay. I mean, I, I agree with Commissioner. I don't know where the rest of the board stands. I wish I would kind of hope somebody would speak I think, up. I think it's a great use of money, and I think it, it we it, we get way more benefit out of that one point one five than we do out of other mitigating methods we take for the same outcome. So I, I'd rather have it in the funded and find the money for it because I think we're going to we'll, we'll make more money on it than it will cost us in the long run. Yeah, and it, it, this literally impacts every single district in the county. I mean, it's it's a countywide issue, um, and it's something that we all hear about. So I, I'd I'd pull it if someone else seconds it. Just Thank to see you. if I'll we can find it. I'll second that, sir. Okay, sir. We'll make the note. Thank you. All right, Mr. Butso. <clears throat> so, um, one of the, the we're also uh, gearing up. This was our re uh, uh, reorganization for public works uh, with the creation of development services. So that was all the ideas of plan reviews went back to development services. So our focus on stormwater had been getting back to the uh, uh, what Tom's trying to been working on for the longest time. I mean, heading towards a countywide stormwater master plan. Heading towards a stormwater master plan countywide. So, and that begins with many many options, lots of individual basin studies, but also eventually tying it all together to countywide. That's what this decision unit was trying to get started, uh, the one that we're currently on, DU number five. Uh, it's intended to be a rather large consulting service uh, to get there eventually. Uh, even if you didn't have all the basin plans, it puts together the framework of how you would incorporate the rest of the basin plans, but it also tells you how to balance the four-legged stool as far as your operational maintenance, uh, your, your permit requirements, uh, your capital improvement, and, and uh, I forgot the fourth one. Uh, it's the fourth leg, as you know, on most chairs, so uh, it's there. But it incorporates how all three, how all that would work together. And, and he was saying that over the course of the next two years, we could get started on doing that. That was our intention on this uh, particular decision unit. All right. Next. So as we, number six, number six, uh, I hope we've done a good job on sending emails and letting you know the data that we have. We have a number of stream gauges out here that allow us to have a accurate and live information that shows where it's raining, how hard it's raining, and what the uh, actual resulting location is on an elevation. Uh, one of the biggest things that we had back in 2017 was we had limited information and didn't necessarily were able to react as fast as we are. In some cases, uh, we, we were getting phone calls from Center Lake and did not realize that uh, we had the issues here. With this network that we have of up to 30 plus uh, uh, locations, we're able to monitor this, alarms come back to that. So basically this decision unit is putting in, uh, asking for a maintenance amount to be able to take care of that system. <clears throat> it requires batteries and solar panels, uh, replacement parts at each location that do get damaged by either debris in the flood channel or even just vandalized from uh, kids going down the uh, going out and seeing the locations at each of the uh, canal locations where we have these devices. So basically it's just saying this has become an extremely key part of our maintenance operation and we need the uh, funds to take care of it. Now number seven and number eight, and in a way, number nine, you've, you've, uh, some of you have met with Tom. You've talked about uh, the concept of maybe expanding 
uh, how we can gain a whole lot more storage, stormwater storage in our built up areas. One of those items was the concept of being able to preemptively discharge stormwater from existing ponds ahead of forecasted events. So we thought maybe this program would be further down the road uh, than where we are right now during the budget season, but it's a process called the automated gates. Our primary area where we're looking at that is something like down in the Bullies Creek area, where when we have a predicted storm coming forward on an impound basin, if we know the storm's coming and we know how long it takes for the uh, basin to drain down, if the gates are open uh, ahead of that storm, we have now created double or triple the storage of what used to be in that particular basin. So this is uh, getting ahead of ourselves. We don't quite have the program uh, fully staffed, but we wanted to get it on the radar and, and deal with that. That was the staff that ultimately would take care of the field equipment because somebody has to go out and inspect and maintain uh, the items once they're installed out in the field and also be the computer uh, guru that is dealing with because it's two-way communication. Uh, not only do we need to be able to have the ability to monitor this stuff, we also have the ability to either manually give the indication of when to operate a gate or to have the programming in place that it takes care of itself automatically. Number nine was part of the technical information that goes with that program to make that predictiveness of uh, when to open a gate ahead of time and uh, so you're able to lower your water levels before the rain shows up. That is a consultant that we were specifically working with with Swift Mud and DEP to uh, put that software together. So depending on which basin we're in, it provides us that right predictive analysis. Uh, so those three kind of uh, work together. Um, I'm not ashamed that it's uh, not shown as unfunded at the moment. I'd like to say we continue to package and review this as we proceed with the, uh, uh, the Bull East Creek project and a pilot project we're trying to set up along one of our existing ponds along Talavas Road. With some proved success of that, we would like to bring, uh, reserve the right to kind of present the results and the success of that and potentially call that a, uh, a mid-year budget uh, analysis to see how, how well it can do that. An example of why we're even talking about it is back during the, uh, the studies of bullies and uh, pierced drains. I mean, I forget the exact number, but I believe we were looking for on the order of 400 or 500 acre feet of extra storage to really appreciatively uh, change the flooding in those areas. That's a lot of stormwater pond areas. So one of the easiest ways to do so is if you can gain an additional uh, a large neighborhood has a 10 acre foot pond. If you can gain two or three extra acre feet in each pond that already exists, there isn't the acquisition of additional land. So you're really looking for an easement to uh, con control the control structures and to uh, have the communications equipment. That's the theory and the uh, item behind that uh, idea. And so that's what those three decision units were really timing it. And to. Chad, can I ask from a, a layman's perspective? Yes, sir. Um, what about, and I, I understand these ponds are, they're, they're privately, if they're HOA, they're privately owned by the HOA, right? They're, yes, sir. They're not public assets. But for, is there a public benefit to going into, especially some of the older ponds, and essentially cleaning them out and dredging them out to increase capacity? And is that is the juice worth the squeeze, obviously, the other question. Would there be a benefit? Absolutely. There would be a storage and a water quality benefit to both. Um, depending on what your analysis is as far as trying to determine that juice worth the squeeze, yeah, what I, kind I don't of, necessarily feel I have a good good answer to that. Uh, we but could, absolutely I mean, it could be on the public uh, private partnership, point of view. you know, with a public benefit. I don't want to create a situation where now every HOA is, you know, <laughs> running to us saying, oh, yeah, dredge out our ponds. Um, but where it where it is a public benefit, probably Commissioner Ron's district, for the most part. Um, I mean, it's just an idea, Commissioner Cruz. I mean, it, it could be something even along the lines of what we're doing with the neighborhood beautification grants, where we're giving people ten thousand dollars towards fixing up their front 
entryway because it makes it look nice for everyone. If we could offer some sort of nominal grant saying, hey, we'll ch you, you do this to your ponds for the good of all of our water, we'll chip in some amount, you know, 10 grand or whatever it is, like the beautification, do the same thing, kind of help offset a little bit of it to encourage people to do the right thing. I think the figures adopt a pond. There you go. I think the figure is going to be significantly higher than 10 grand, but okay. <laughs> sure. It's 10,000 for the beautification thing. That's where I came up. Maybe in your spare time, Chad. That's sort of sarcasm. Yeah, when you finish though, those, it is, those seven hundred million dollars worth of roads. If you could dive, that's into within it. what Tom is reviewing as well. I mean, the eat, the low hanging fruit from a flood point of view, flood control point of view, is going after the big surface bodies of water, where right. you can lower those and actually gain a lot of extra storage. The other side of that is to make sure all the ponds that are supposed to be ponds are ponds. That's also something that Tom is reviewing, and that is the. It's easy to say that should be a pond. It's the funding piece of how to get to the point of... Uh, uh, yeah, so that's that's another valid question, is there are some places, I think it's called Country Village, I can't remember, but there I can think of a couple of HOA place, HOAs or even, uh, say, strip malls and, and commercial spots where there's no... It's not holding water, right? And so it's it's like a low area where you know, runoff goes to, but it doesn't actually hold any water. Is there potential there to turn that something like that into a proper stormwater pond as opposed to simply like a low collection area? Each one of those, I'd say, have to be reviewed by their permit. Some, are, uh, some were designed as dry ponds, so only in the, in the immediate aftermath of a, uh, a like rain event, pond yeah. out by my fleet uh, facility. That's a dry pond, so okay. only while it's actively raining and for the next day will you see water in there. Otherwise, it is meant to be uh, mowed grass pond. Some of the, uh, the ones that are... Uh, Muddy, those would definitely be the uh, questionable ones because they're probably above where we're at. Tom's at the microphone back there to answer that one a little better if you want to hear more. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, fellow commissioners, uh, county administrator, and county attorney. Thomas Kersenberger, Public Force Department. Push the button or uh, get closer. I did. I thought I did. Yeah, I did. All right. Um, what I'd like to elaborate on with the automated outfall structure system is we are essentially with two of the watersheds, both Bullies Creek and Pierce Drain. We're literally analyzing all the existing stormwater facilities in those two watersheds. Maybe I shouldn't say oh. but a good number of those stormwater, existing stormwater facilities in those two watersheds to determine what available storage can be created preemptively to a storm event, to a flood event. So, yes, there would be public-private partnership. There would, there would be utilization of whether it's private property or HOA community stormwater facilities to squeeze as much blood, blood as we can out of the turn up to create additional flood storage. And, yes, there is both the flood mitigation aspect and there is also a water quality aspect to this project that we are now rolling into real-time flood forecasting as well. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Any additional questions on that? Okay, Chad? Technically, we're done. The last program was transit 2508, but we did not have new desired decision units uh, in, in transit. Uh, at that time of year, last year, we're uh, holding on, and our number one requirements continue to be recruit, retain, and uh, morale and transit. Uh, the active idea that's down there is the uh, service development grant that we're anticipating from uh, the, uh, the state that was not a legislative request, just something we were working with them that ultimately will lead to the enhancement of uh, Route 99 to 20-minute uh, service all day long. Okay. Any additional questions? Oh, yes, we had uh, Commissioner Bearden. And, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Sheila, this may be a question for you. Um, you know, regarding our budget, uh, Thank you, Chair. now these are projections of what they believe that they need, correct? Correct. For their budget. So I would assume that some of these items that they believe that they need, um, maybe they don't necessarily hit that target. Uh, maybe because maybe they overestimated or whatever. What happens to those excess funds? Do we just put those in reserves? Correct. That's okay. exactly what happens. So how much from last year's budget did we have in excess? Did we roll over um, into reserves? 
So in our March 31st meeting, I came back and I told you the um, approximate execution rate of all the departments were between 85 to 98 percent of usage in each one of their total budgets. Some were less, some were small, but they were around the same, the same percentage in that range. So approximately they left in the budget like around $50 million in total. That's inclusive of the constitutional officers and, um, and the judicial programs and so forth. Also, that, that's encompassing all the funds. Right, so in those funds that didn't use it in this year, it rolls, especially those that are capital uh, projects, it rolls into the use of those new pro continuation of those projects that are moving forward. And whatever didn't get used on operating moves, goes into the bottom line, and it gets re-evaluated in for the 24th budget, beginning balance. Got it. Um, I'd like to see maybe a five-year, I guess, um, analysis in regards to what was utilized and what was not mm -hmm. um, each year on an average, just to give me a good idea of kind of uh, what we're hitting and what we're not hitting as far as numbers go. Is that okay? Have that to us, and okay. I'll, you'll have that this afternoon. Thank you. Yes. Commissioner Ballard. So... Chad, I'm not picking on you specifically about the truck, but uh, KVO got me got me thinking when he, you know, when we, when we started breaking down the the cost of of the truck, et cetera, et cetera. So fifty thousand dollars for a truck. I know that I could go and buy a base model truck for you know thirty five thousand dollars. So do, do we have any kind of policy in place as a county that when we are buying a car that's not for a specialized purpose, just, you know, somebody needs four wheels to get around, that they should be, that we should be purchasing the, the base model of that, of that vehicle? What are you going to buy this guy, Chad? I'm, I'm, and and it, I'm not saying like this truck specifically. I'm just saying as a whole, if we don't have that already... We probably should because I, why you know we shouldn't be buying like deluxe vehicles with taxpayer funds like if, if well, I I hear you I'm not I need to uh, present to you what Matt uses in his uh, process it begins with the user uh, essentially requesting what requesting and justifying what the need is uh, a lot of times in this case it was an SUV it's meant because it needed the internal uh, storage capacity to do so then the question at fleet they have to evaluate is uh, is a full-size SUV what's actually needed or would one of the modest uh, or crossover SUVs get uh, at this stage in the budget I don't know if that secondary review had taken place or if it was already endorsed at the full-sized SUV that's where it's at. But it predominantly starts with any time someone is proposing a vehicle addition, the user department specifies what they think they need, and it's reviewed by fleet. Uh, but fleet doesn't officially order the vehicle until it's approved in the funding. Okay, that's helpful. I was just wondering if fleet has a, has a policy of, you know, we're going to order the, the most base of the base unless there's some specialized purpose. Thank you, ma'am. Now Commissioner Baugh is going to make her pitch for electric vehicles. Ma'am? I think we need charging stations first that work when the power goes out. Oh. I, Chad, this is kind of an all-around question. It's not really just public work, so I'm sorry. I don't know if you'll be able to answer it. Maybe Shirley, Shirley Sheila can. In years past... Um, You'll recall this, Chad, when getting your things done in your budget was very difficult and you couldn't really get the money you needed to run public works. You remember those days? Um, back in that day, if you'll recall, yeah, I know you know what I'm talking about. Back in that day, um, as I recall, some of our directors and higher management people would get vehicles to drive to and from their home, et cetera, as a way to be able to be compensated you know, in another way. I mean, you recall that. So can you tell me, have we, uh, over the years since we've become so flush with cash, can you tell me how many vehicles we have today 
I mean, you're, you know, you have to maintain them all. You know, that's part of your department. That's why I'm asking you. Um, can you kind of give me an idea of how many uh, vehicles we have today uh, in in 2023-24 budget versus, say, in 19 and 20 or, you know, something along that line? Has there been a change, do you a know? Absolutely. Or? I mean, uh, Matt has that beginning of the fiscal year, end of the fiscal year data uh, for that. I didn't bring it immediately with me off the top of my head, the number that keeps sticking in my uh, uh, brain is somewhere like 1,365 to 1,425, but I need to verify with Matt on exactly where that number is. Keep in mind uh, that fleet number will track an awful lot of things. I mean, a lot of pieces of equipment and sometimes even trailers and things, but, uh, but it keeps track over our overall on the fleet growth. And generally there's a very slow upward tick yeah, well, and the reason I'm asking is because I know this has been a very expensive venture for us in that regard, you know, but, but at the time, according to our county administrator at the time, that was the avenue that we had to take. Although we were flush with cash, uh, we couldn't spend it. It was in all of our reserves. So I'm just curious today, you know, and you recall that, I'm just curious today as to how many cars that, or trucks, that we have that are being driven by management, you know, um, like our directors and other management positions in different departments versus, you know, several years ago where we are today on that. And I'm also curious, and I know, Chad, you're not going to know the answer to this one either, so I apologize, but travel, where are we? Uh, and I think I've got the figures ready now to send to um, um, the other commissioners on travel, where you know how much we're spending in each department on travel as well, and I think I have it per individual as well. Yeah, fleet part of the fleet policy. We have a vehicle assignment uh, procedure, and uh, if something's personally assigned to an individual, there's a record of that at Fleet Services. Sure. Okay, Sheila, maybe you can get that information for the commissioners. They, sure. you know, they're trying to I'll get to. their feet wet with our budget, and that's a huge part. So, I'll be glad to. Thank you. Yes. In the last board session on the on Wednesday, I gave you a breakdown of the total most ex, most um, um, costly, you know, items like contractual services, travel, um, supplies, um, software, and so forth. So I will get that information on the vehicles for you as well. Thank you. And, yes. and really, I mean, it doesn't matter to me, truly. But the reason I bring it up is because... Commissioner Cruz was, uh, and I was very supportive of his ideas on different things that we needed to to try and, and make sure that we fund. And so in doing so, we're going to need to look at many things on the budget to see if there's anything where we can cut back or wait until next year or whatever to make sure that we can fund and do some of the items that we feel, that this board feels is very important. Oh, definitely. That's the only reason I'm asking. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. We don't have anyone else on the board at this time. Are there any final comments before we dismiss Chad? Okay, thank you, sir. Madam CFO, you wanna close us out? At this point, we are done with our uh, work session for today. Um, we will regain, re-engage tomorrow morning uh, with the presentation of the HR um, Gallagher, and then we'll move on into capital improvement plan. Thank you very much. What, what's Wednesday? Because the agenda is not up yet. I'm just curious what we're doing Wednesday, other than utilities. I know that part. Yes, and in the afternoon, we'll be talking about, now that you know the budgets for all the departments, then you're gonna, we're going to discuss how does that play into each one of the funding um, sources that we have in the county, at least the most, the most significant ones that play a role in departments, budgets, and um, all the other programs that we have. She builds on the fund from each day until the grand finale uh -huh, on exactly. Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. That's the grand finale, yes. Speaking of building up the fund, let's let's open this up to public comment before we close out. Is there, is there anyone from the public who'd like to come forward to address the board on any of the items discussed in today's workshop? Okay, seeing no one coming forward, we'll close public comment. And Commissioner Satcher would like to make a statement, sir. Uh, Thank you, sir. So just talking about schedule, which I haven't looked at it closely, but we're scheduled to be back here tomorrow at 9. 
Do we think we have a full day tomorrow? Could we move Wednesday's afternoon into tomorrow afternoon if things go smoothly in the morning? I'm sorry, I didn't. Sure, I, I don't know how long or short the presentation for HR is going to be. It may take an hour, an hour and a half, and then we'll, we'll just deep right into the capital improvement plan. As I've already, um, you know, briefed all the commissioners on, on, on it, on the capital improvement plan. It might be going smoother than I anticipate. So, if it did go smooth in the morning. Is there a chance we could move what's currently scheduled for Wednesday afternoon to a Tuesday afternoon? Well, we'll start the CIP in the morning. And so I assume, Sheila, we'll be able to push it through as far as we can in the morning. There's no no, no hard cut for lunch, right? I'll do whatever you want me to. Okay. I, th I think we should – we'll do HR, and then we'll start pushing through the CIP as far as we can go. I'm sorry. What was the – I apologize. Oh, you want to move Wednesday to Tuesday? I mean, if not, if if we're working, I don't mind. I just don't want to end up with because it's on the agenda for Wednesday, and even though we're done at eleven thirty, right? Oh well, we'll see you tomorrow. That's a question when, for the boss. Really, there's not an actual reason. You can you can do it if if staff can can cover it in the same day. Then you could you could move even though we're that. even though we're advertised for yeah it's, it's a, a budget work session so you could yeah it's okay I, I think it'd be okay does anyone have an issue with no, going actually, all day tomorrow day. sort of regardless if if there's potential that we could wrap it up tomorrow and not have to do Wednesday Mr Washington can you be prepared for that we'll take a look at it Mr okay. Chair I'll just confirm with the county okay. attorney just make sure what he stays stated to be fair excellent it, any other comments any other new business to discuss. All right, we're adjourned. Thank you.